Families First, Volume 7, The Change, written by Lance K. Ewing, video book produced by Book TV. Please take a second to share this story with a friend. Who knows what magic you might uncover in the process? Chapter 1, Loveland, Colorado. Mac and Sarah were to be married by week's end. The ceremony would be the first for most, but my second since the day. Post-war, or whatever some would call it, seemed like a dream. I wondered if this is what soldiers felt, fighting in a far-off land, a reprieve following a victory in battle, only to ponder when the next would come. Some enemies may stand in front and others ambush from behind, but then we mustn't forget about those already here on the inside. I had heard this before, or maybe seen it in a movie. So, was it the plan all along or a convenient afterthought, once safely inside the hen house? Does it matter? I said to Joy, answering my own question out loud. Sarah looked radiant at the service, her flowing white dress disguising her secret. She wouldn't make public until the little one could no longer be hidden. Mac was as proud as I had ever seen a man, standing with his best man, Corey, and awaiting his bride-to-be. The wedding, attended by more than a hundred people, turned into an entire day of celebration. Only Corey cut out early, with a gut feeling he needed to head back to the other side. Both the late spring and summer flew by with little word from the colonel, Mike, or anyone else outside of the valley. The coalition chapters were established and essentially put on hold as the government wheels slowly churned. It's a mess down there, said Corey, referring to the group down the road, in early September, addressing John, Bill, and the council. They're not like us up here. How do you mean exactly? asked John with a look from Bill. Neither one had been down by the lake or across the road in a while. I mean, come on continued Corey. Up here, we work together as a team, however big or small. We have common goals and dreams and aren't afraid of hard work to see it happen. Down there, at the other end of the world, it's different. Not a little, but it's a whole other world. They, the ones who I'm responsible for, only want what's easy, the pie right in front of them. Ask them about their dreams or desires, and you are likely to find none. Many are here for the safety, the routine, and everything else they had at the FEMA camps, but it's more than that, deeper somehow. They long for order, structure, and balance, and will gladly give up their rights to basic freedoms, one at a time, which has separated this great country from all others for more than 240 years. It's not about freedom anymore, but being taken care of and protected, like a child. Everyone is supposed to have some type of job, whether cooking, cleaning, working the fields or garden, security, and everything else you have up here, but it's not getting done. What's the difference, do you think? asked John. I don't follow, replied Corey. I mean, they all contributed in some way while in the FEMA camps, John continued. Why the change now? Force, replied Corey. They had to do it or they were punished or banished. That was the leverage, especially as they separated the men from the women and children. I'm told it was seldom spoken of, not out loud at least, but everyone knew they had a better chance of getting back their family down the road if they towed the FEMA line, so to speak, if that makes any sense. It does, replied Bill, with John agreeing. The problem is when the FEMA stipend runs out, things will go downhill like a snowball, getting larger as it picks up steam. Then we have a repeat of when this thing first started, but this time, this lush valley we have protected with our blood will be ground zero, Mac chimed in. I'm thinking we should have Lance get hold of his friend David in the Northern Colorado chapter of the coalition and see how they are faring. If it's different, maybe we can learn something. And if not, we're not the only ones going back to the Colonel for help, he added. I think that's a great idea, Max, said John. Let's get it done today if possible. Sure thing. I'm on it, he replied. And Corey, I'll stop by this afternoon and see if I can help, Mac continued. Mac found me up on the top of Green Mountain with the rest of the able-bodied men and women, not tied essentially to other daily tasks. Our job was to clear the saddle on the mountain 100 feet wide and spanning the quarter-mile gap. Running tractors, which could do the steep climb, dragged out the trees that we cut by hand. Two men, former loggers in another life, felled each one and I spent most of my day behind a shovel. My favorite place in the whole world was reduced to a fire road, and that's how it would be. If the fire jumped the saddle, even the colonel wouldn't be able to save us. Lance, let's take a quick look from the cliffs, Max suggested. 
I knew the other side of the mountain almost as well as the front, and Mac knew it. What are we looking for, I asked, as just the two of us headed up to the rocky side of the cliff. I want to see how the fire is progressing, and I need you to tell me if there are any fields or valleys we can't see. A valley or an open field can either slow fire or slingshot it, cutting our time in half fighting the thing. Okay, I said as we both looked through binoculars into the thick smoke across two valleys over. My eyes burned, and I placed my bandana over my mouth and nose. Flames were visible far off, but the smoke was thicker. Look, Mac, I pointed, zeroing in with my binoculars. I don't see anything, he replied. Wait for it. Look for the movements, I continued. Okay, now I see them, he said, shaking his head. If they keep at this pace, we will see them clear up on the ridge over there in about 60 minutes, I pointed out. It's them, isn't it? Said Mac as a statement. I'm guessing it is Ralph's group, plus some other folks living back in the mountains. One thing's for sure, they are heading this way. Water planes roared over our heads, circling around before dropping their slurry. How long until they are up here? Mac asked me. A couple of hours, unless they stop for the night somewhere, but I'm guessing they won't. Mac radioed down to Bill with the news. Hold tight. I'll get back to you soon, Bill replied, heading to round up John and what he could find of the council with short notice. Thirty minutes later, we got the call. Intercept them before the saddle and lead them to the camp around the side and not through the ranch or West Main property. We will inform Corey of his new guests. Tell them they will be fed and protected. We will figure the rest out over the next few days, announced John. I guess I'm waiting for them, said Mac. Are you in? Sure, I replied, only hearing part of the story a few days back about the feuding pistols between Mac and the guy called Ralph. I heard he got shot by your guys, I said. Ralph, I mean. Yeah, that's right, in the stomach, but he survived, and as far as I know, he's still alive and probably healed up by now. Who knows, though? Just so you know, the rest of them are not much better. They have some kind of cult-like rituals when the kids are outside playing. It's kind of a long story. Anyway, Corey is going to have his hands full with this bunch, that's for sure. I asked Mac to relay his long story, since we weren't leaving this post anytime soon. At the conclusion, I felt bad for the kids and what Drake witnessed through the window of the rituals. Did Ralph turn them that quick, or were they always bad? I thought but kept to myself. Our job is only to see that they get down the mountain and into the camp safely, Mac continued thankfully distracting my thoughts of how bad this bunch may really be. Patty won't be happy about it, that's for sure. Do you mean Patty, Chef Rico's girlfriend, I asked, confused? Yep, she is, or used to be, I guess, married to Ralph, and they have a son named Joshua. Yeah, I know him. The kid, I mean. He's friends with mine. How about you and Sarah? Any kiddos in your future? I blurted out before thinking it was a personal issue. Six months out, my new friend? But that's between you and me? No way. Congrats on that. When it comes to secrets, I'm like that vault the guy opened on national TV. You ever see that? Nope. But I don't. Well, I have never watched much television. Us too, in general. It was crazy, though, and boring at the same time. A news guy opened some well-known mobster's vault on live TV. Anyway, it was a bear to open, and once they got in, there were no secrets to find. That's me, just so you know in the future. I already do. That's why I told you. I know more about you than you think. Well, that settles it, he added, looking through his binos again. That guy in the lead is Ralph. I'm sure of it. He thinks I stole his wife, and he's had it out for me ever since. I'm not sure why God keeps men like that around. It's not for them, I replied. It's for us. How do you figure? Well, I see it like this. You had many run-ins with him from the beginning. Three, maybe more. More, unfortunately, Mac answered. Exactly. Any one of those could have landed him dead if it was about him. But if it's about you, then he will keep coming back, like he's about to do now, driven into your protection by a natural disaster. Do you follow? Yeah, I think so, he replied, pausing and looking to the sky. Actually, no, I don't follow at all. What do you mean? I guess my point is that it's not about Ralph or you. The big guy upstairs has a bigger plan that you and I won't and shouldn't understand. Maybe Ralph is supposed to lead this wayward group of people to turn from darkness back to light in this valley. Maybe it's something else, even bigger. Who knows? But I can assure you that something is happening, and it's not by chance. Well, I believe that as many times as he has cheated death, he must be meant for something bigger. I just can't imagine what. That's the best part. 
You don't have to, and neither do I. Let's just get them down the mountain safely and... Wait a minute. Why are half of them lying down in the middle of the road? I asked no one in particular. I see it too, said Mac. They have another couple hours to make it up here for sure. Chapter 2. Green Mountain, Loveland, Colorado. Let me go, I suggested. What? Go down there? It's yes, let me take the four-wheeler with water down to them, I added. You don't know if that's the problem. Maybe it's some kind of ruse, Max suggested. I got caught not far from them as a teenager, hiking with a group of people, kids and adults, I began. We got lost and ran out of water. It happens, and a man on a motorcycle met us near that very spot with enough water to get home. Ralph knows you, but not me. I don't think he will try anything crazy if I'm bringing them water. We brought up enough here to last our fire crew more than a week. We should be able to spare some. Max sighed, pacing back and forth, talking to himself. He finally spoke. Yes, that's the right move. We can't let women and children die of dehydration up here. So take the bike and as much water as you can carry to them. The fire is getting closer by the hour, and I can't have them on my conscience if it catches up to them. I'll send a couple of tractors behind you. Now go, go. We each navigated the steep climb down to the saddle in our own way. Mine was more of a skip, mindful of my shoulder, and Max like a Montana cowboy chasing a pack of wolves from his livestock. Once down, I ran for the four-wheeler, conscious of my bad but healing shoulder, as Mac yelled instructions to his men to strap down as much water as possible on the machine. Thankfully, I could accelerate and use the brakes while turning the handlebars, not effortlessly, but in a crude manner that still got the job done. Again, my shoulder ached, but racing towards people caught between a massive blaze and a shot at a new life propelled me forward. Hold on, I'm coming, I yelled as I got close, hoping Ralph or someone else wouldn't do something crazy. I heard no response. Instead, my head filled with the sounds of the tractors far off in the distance behind me when I rounded the last corner. I'm not sure to this day what I was expecting. Maybe a once hostile group of people, or at least an unsavory bunch, but that would have been a good day. Instead, within minutes, I was counting the dead as near as I could tell. Women, children, and men were all in various stages of physical life. The crying and moaning filled my head, and I wondered how I had not heard it before. The noise of the bike's engine drowned out the suffering and left me blindsided by the truth. Having only a rough idea of what Ralph looked like, I couldn't be sure which one he was, but I knew him by reputation. It was him in the very front, drinking the last sips of a clear plastic bottle as others writhed or lay still on the rocky fire road. Do you have my water? The man who must be Ralph spoke from atop the makeshift plow. You still have some here? I replied, gesturing to his chin. It's the others who I'm hoping to save today, I added, rushing past him to the ones I could see still moving. I was sickened at the sight of King Ralph sitting comfortably on the front seat of an old plow with two men and a woman collapsed on the ground in front, leather straps still around their chests. They pulled you all the way over here? I questioned, seeing it firsthand but not believing what I saw. They pulled you, like animals pulling a plow. Not so the soil could be prepared for a harvest that everyone could eventually benefit from, but only because you didn't feel like walking. My blood was boiling even before he answered. It's how things work here, he replied casually. How many are gone? I called to Ralph, trying to calm my growing hatred for the man as I handed water out to the others. Nobody's left my side since my wife, that is. No, I mean, how many are dead? Oh, I don't know. I haven't really checked them. You know how it is, he continued with his hands out in a whatever pose, sipping the last of his water. Some have and some have not. Yes, I guess I do know you had, and now you have not, I told him, as I checked the woman hooked to the plow for signs of life, finding none. It wasn't hard to convince me he was living up to the stories I had heard about him. There's where you're wrong, he replied from behind me, as I heard the unmistakable rack of a pistol slide. You can leave the rest of the water here and any food. I'll distribute it as I see fit, he barked. I held an open 16-ounce plastic water bottle out towards him, slowly stepping up onto the plow, near eye level. Lower the pistol and this bottle is yours, I said. I think I'll just take it, he replied, not moving an inch. You shoot me, Ralph, and there are a dozen guys on the hill who will have your head before nightfall. How do you know my name, he asked, lowering the pistol now towards my knees. Your reputation precedes you, my friend, I said, 
slowly reaching out the bottle towards him. At that moment, I saw his guests or protectors, whatever they were to be called, eyeing the bottle like men lost in the desert. You didn't even give your top guys water? I asked, having to know the answer. Get out of there! I heard Joy's voice in my head. What are you trying to prove? Come home, Daddy. I could hear in the wind from my boys. Just come home! It was too late, maybe, or just on time, but I squeezed the bottle hard, squirting water into his face with my left hand and grabbing for the pistol with my right. Everything happened in a split second and in slow motion at the same time, like a car wreck about to happen. I looked for his guys to brandish their own firearms, but they did not. Ralph choked on the well-placed or luckily squeezed stream of water, and I grabbed for the gun. Bam, bam, bam! The pistol cracked. I couldn't be sure where the bullets were headed, but we both had hold of the gun with my only grip on the now hot barrel. Screams from behind me filled the still mountain air. My left hand came down hard on his wrist, knocking the gun from his hand and onto the dusty ground. We both fell from the top of the death plow and onto the hard ground. I grabbed for the gun, just feet from us, tossing it off the road and down a steep ravine, half expecting it to go off again, like in one of those low-budget movies. Instead, the pistol clinked on the way down, bouncing off rocks and branches. My eye was on Ralph when I was hit from behind. I'm just trying to help, I called out, jumping up as soon as I could. They were on Ralph in a second, a husband and wife, I presumed, swinging their arms and kicking with their legs, saying, You killed our son, over and over. His once loyal guard sat by, arms folded in front of them. I turned to see a few people looking over a still body, probably a child and maybe their little boy. My God, I said aloud, walking closer. It was a boy not much younger than mine. He didn't move. My heart pounded, ached, and hurt for this child, and the yells were now behind me to the other side. This time, Ralph was begging for mercy as the two rained wild blows down on him. One part of me, the hardened part since I left my home in McKinney, would have let the outcome be what it would. The man I had become, the other, heard a higher voice saying, Leave him to me. Leave him to me. Stop! I shouted to no avail. The blows were more coordinated now and it appeared Ralph was close to succumbing to his injuries. Stop! I shouted again, grabbing the man around the chest and forcefully pulling him back. This won't bring your boy back, I told him. This won't bring him back. He fought me for only a second more before retiring to his son, as did his mother, both crying loudly and begging for his return. I felt sick, like I had never before. All of my boys had been harmed on the journey north, but they were still here. This boy was not, and my hand was on the gun that took his previous life. I didn't pull the trigger but held the barrel, and I would never forget that as long as I lived. Caught up in the moment, I didn't hear the tractors sneaking up behind me. Let's get these people on the trailer, yelled Mac from the lead one. It's going to be a tight turn on this road, but let's get it done and load the ones on who can't walk out on their own, he added before checking each one for signs of life. The larger trailer could hold 10, maybe 15 people if some were sitting, and the smaller one carried the few dead placed as respectfully as possible and secured with bailing twine. Once loaded, including a nearly passed out and moaning Ralph, it was determined the rest could walk out on their own. I had two on my bike, asking Mac if they all should go to the West Hospital. All but this one, he said, pointing to Ralph. He wore out his welcome with my wife and the other doctors there. Get him off the trailer, boys. He's not headed down there. Let's have you take him to the camp, Lance, and we'll get the rest looked at. Great, I said under my breath, getting help loading him on the front of my four-wheeler and swapping out for two others I didn't mind carrying. Take me to the hospital, he demanded in a forceful whisper. No can do, Ralph, but I'm sure someone at the camp can get you fixed up. I'm not asking, he spat. No, I don't suppose you are, I replied. Still, it doesn't change anything. And considering you pulled a pistol on me, I feel like I'm extra nice here, don't you think? He had no reply, and it didn't surprise me at all. I started the machine and headed slowly back down the mountain. Chapter 3. Cory Camp, Loveland, Colorado. Aw, hell, said Cory as I pulled up. Is he dead? Nope, not yet, I replied. I think he's only on his third or fourth life. Mac wants you to keep him and you'll be seeing the others, maybe 20 over the next day or two, as they come up from the West Hospital, I'm guessing. All right, we'll make room. Just drop him off over there, he added, pointing to a white tent with a red cross on it. After a quick check-in, I headed back up the mountain. 
stopping briefly to say hi to Joy first, then passing the last of the sick being transported off the mountain. No, back to work, I said aloud, believing the smoke had gotten even thicker in the last few hours. Shift change, Matt called later in the afternoon, leading nearly 20 men and women up the last hill to the saddle. I was happy to be on break and nervous about the fire at the same time, but I guessed we all were. Dirty, exhausted, and anxious, I loaded onto the trailer headed home when the first drop fell. Was that? I asked out loud, looking up to the sky and seeing a mix of dark clouds and haze. A second drop was confirmed, followed by another and chatter amongst my fellow fire battlers. Finally, drops turned to a sprinkle, raising goosebumps on my arms in a chill of a mountain rainstorm. I guess I miss smelling the storm, I told Mac, who was laughing and dancing around, not like a man who had loaded the dead on a trailer only hours ago, but as a man who was building a small family amid a larger one, with hope of a future brighter than the past. Come on, Lance, let's go, everyone, he called out. It doesn't get much better than this. The rain now poured down heavier than I could ever remember it doing here when I was a kid. Dirt ran off my face and arms, and I hooted and hollered with the others. If I had some shampoo and soap, I could get a nice shower, I joked to Mac. But this is not bad, not bad at all. There's a fine line between a rain good enough to douse a forest fire and one that stops at getting us soaked. I guess we all figured it out about the same time, as the celebration quieted down and the questions came at Mac like fireballs. Okay, one at a time, please, said Mac, although he knew what the first one would be, and everyone after. Is it enough? He started, and most lowered their hands. Is it enough? He shouted, for everyone to hear over the heavy rain. I don't know, and until we get confirmation, none of us will. We're going to take the first shift down before the road washes out. You may get a light workday on the second shift, but stay out for an hour or two and I'll radio up. If the rain continues, you will likely have the night off, but you will be walking back to the ranch. Can't we just get a ride? Asked one man to my left. If it rains enough to give you the afternoon off, then our tractors won't make it down easily, and I can't risk losing one in the mud. Understand? Yes, he replied to his question with more than a few others nodding their heads. Just stick together and the wolves won't get you. Wait, what? Asked a man near me. Nobody said anything about wolves before. It's all right, I told him. He's just joking, probably just to make sure we're all paying attention. I don't think so, he replied. Well, if he said to watch out for bears or mountain lions, even coyotes, maybe it would be a concern, but there are no wolves around here. And Mac is from Montana, so he knows wolves, I ended, without inviting another question. Good luck, everyone, I hollered as I got onto the trailer with some help from Mac. Keep it coming, Lord, I shouted. Please keep it coming. I wish I had a weather app, I told Joy once back home. I'm not going to get much sleep, wondering how long it's going to come down. Most storms in this area are short, maybe 30 minutes. But every once in a while, I yawned deeply, not finishing the thought. But I did fall asleep, and fast. Clearing a fire road was exhausting, and I drifted off to sleep with the thought that some men and women did that every day for a job, before the day. Bouncing out of bed at first light, I ran out the front door and straight back into the room, jumping on the bed. What in the world are you doing? Asked an annoyed Joy, bouncing like popcorn in an air popper. Celebrating? I am celebrating. From what I can tell, it rained all night, and there are deep puddles everywhere. I have to find Mac. Bye, I said, tripping over my jeans and landing face first on the carpet. Ha! I heard from behind me. The three rugrats, I guessed. Daddy fell. Daddy fell. And I'm up, I called out, doing my best to recover gracefully. Where are you going, Daddy? To find out if the fire is out, I replied. And no, I can't take you guys, sorry. Ah, okay, Daddy, bye. Never having been much of a jogger, I did so this morning and wasn't the only one. A few wondered if they would have the day off work, but those who had seen the fire firsthand only had one concern. Is it out and can it start back up? Look around, everyone, said Mac to the growing group. What do you see? <laughs> Some talked amongst themselves but didn't want to be put on the spot. Yes, I see the clearest sky since we've arrived, said Lonnie, standing next to me. Exactly, but that doesn't mean we're out of the woods on this thing. I've seen fires up here get snowed on and come back blazing days or even more than a week later. The embers have a way of tucking themselves under rocks and logs, hoping to see another day. Those wishing for a day off from the fire today won't get it. We will trailer as many of us as we can up the mountain and walk from there.
How far? asked a man to my left. As long as it takes, I started to say before Mac replied. Hard to say. It can get muddy on the roads up there after a good rain, and Lord knows we got one of those overnight. Chefs Rico and Patty have been up most of the night making two meals for each of us, and our four-wheelers will deliver water every hour. So go home and see if you have a backpack or day pack. Grab one of the kids' bags they used for school, if you have to, and let your family know you will be home late tonight. Any questions? There were only a few questions about lunch and bathroom concerns from those not having worked on the mountain yet. Okay, meet back here in 30 minutes, called Mac, and bring any able-bodied adult with you. We need all hands on deck today and any shovels we can find. His dog, Bo, woofed as if to say, Get going, humans. We don't have all day. Joy and I joined the team with Vlad and his girlfriend offering to watch our boys. Joy's ankle was like new and my shoulder didn't feel half bad. Mac was right, and we made it about halfway up the mountain's front side before walking the four additional miles to the front side of the fire. Each of you has two meals you will need to carry. Eat them as you wish, but that's all there is for today. Water will be provided as we go. This is boring, said one man ahead of us, watching others put out small hiding embers with dirt. What do you mean, boring? I asked, annoyed, with Joy nudging me. Fires are exciting, he replied. They move around and you never know what's going to happen. No, controlled campfires are exciting, I replied, now getting into the mix of the conversation and moving closer to him to be heard clearly. They provide heat, safety from predators, cook food and boil water. This here... I pointed to the smoldering destruction of the Rocky Mountains as far as I could see with the naked eye. This is devastation threatening our chance at a new life and our kids' future. People lost their homes and probably some lives as well. There is nothing exciting about an out-of-control fire, I declared, louder than Joy wanted. Max shook his head in agreement with the hint of a smile. Catching up to me and putting a hand on my shoulder, he said, Don't make the poor man cry now, Lance in a half whisper before calling out. There, over here, you there, check out under that rock overhang. We did as instructed, and with just one man in charge, it seemed to get done efficiently. Kind of different not having to be responsible for a project, don't you think? Asked Lonnie. Yeah, it's good to be part of a team, but different for sure, I replied. I'm just glad it's Mac in charge and not that other Yahoo back there, pointing over my shoulder. We made it, buddy. Huh? We made it, I repeated. We made it here. We promised Vlad he could live out his days in the Rockies. And so far, that's true for all of us. Well, most of us, I finished, with a flash of Jake and Sheila's funerals. They made it too, replied Lonnie, as if I had finished my sentence. Huh, you mean Jake and Sheila? Yeah, they made it too, all the way here to freedom. They left too soon, but their families still get to be a part of this community and live a life of safety, at least up to this point. Can you imagine our lives right now if we had stayed in McKinney? No, I can't even imagine that scenario, I admitted, adding. And you would have probably eaten six or seven donuts by this time of da. I couldn't even finish before doubling over in laughter. The habitual smartass, he replied. The one guy who can take a heartfelt moment and turn it to crap, he continued with a straight face until the very end when he joined me. You two are like 12-year-old boys said Joy, shaking her head, but almost smiling, I thought. He started it, we replied in unison, each pointing to the other. I had wondered several times over the years, or much more, if I'm honest, how or why I could take a profound moment and turn it over in my hands until it popped out as something humorous, or lighthearted at least. I remembered a class from college, not Biology 30 Human Reproduction and Sexual Behavior, or Dirty 30 as we all called it, but another one, psychology maybe, or possibly interpersonal communication. The idea was that even in a stressful environment, like an argument with a significant other or family member, a funeral, or a serious hospital health discussion, one could spontaneously burst out in laughter or tell an off-topic joke. Apparently, it was a coping mechanism to keep a person from being bombarded all at once with bad outcomes. I was as guilty of that as anyone, and probably more so than most. Mac called John and Bill on the radio later in the afternoon, declaring the forest fire mostly contained, as most of us present cheered in the background. He added, We will keep an eye on it over the next week, but I think it's good. Chapter 4 Corey Camp, Loveland, Colorado Corey called Mac down to the new camp, asking for a meeting about Ralph and his group. 
I'm not sure they are going to blend in here, he started. In fact, it's more like a prison now. How so? asked Mac. They are dividing into groups, and it looks like they are picking leaders. Not in the physical sense, like a yard fight, although we have those, but more like that Baker guy and now Ralph. You know, guys that can talk and tell desperate people what they need to hear. Then eventually most start thinking they can't make it without their leader. I get it, but how does that affect what you're doing? asked Mac, genuinely curious. Well, that's just it, replied Corey. As I said, they are forming groups, like a union in the old days. And just like unions, the heads are coming to me with negotiations, demands, really, for their group. Or what? asked Mac. Or they refuse to work or contribute in any way. Plus, tensions are growing between them, and there is infighting over new member recruits. If it were just some of the men, I would let them get good and hungry first, but it's not so clear with women and children in the mix. I see, replied Mac, rubbing his stubbled chin. We will probably need to talk to John, Bill, and even Samuel about it, but I may have an idea. Give me an hour, he added, waving goodbye. He met Sarah at the hospital as she experienced most pregnant women's cravings, but the days of restaurant-style ice or Mexican takeout were over. Still, he was able to trade a few things and score an entire case of those little oatmeal cakes with the frosting inside. It's not pickles and ice cream, he joked, but almost as good. She took a break and listened to his plan for the others. But before meeting and subsequently falling head over heels in love with her, only his dog, Bo, could be counted on to listen to his ideas, however far out some may think. What if they did divide into groups? I mean, they already are. One is responsible for any aspect of daily living, like growing food, another hygiene, maybe one teaching the kids of all groups, like school. Sarah acknowledged that that could work or blow up when one group stops contributing to the whole. Makes sense, he replied. But what if, and I'm just throwing out ideas here, what if each leader had to be voted in for each group? It could work unless someone ends up in the latrine group and their spouse is on teaching, she agreed. It's getting complicated and a bit above my pay grade, replied Mac. The situation is workable. We've been doing it for years in both of our groups. You ended up in security and me in the hospital but someone still has to clean the communal toilets. And it gets done, she commented. My brain hurts. I think I'll stick to security. Thanks for the talk. Corey was already thinking along the same lines, and by the time Ralph and his followers arrived, he had a plan. Maybe not a perfect one, but at least something better than the chaos that he could see shaping up if he didn't act now. I learned that Saddle Ranch had much better radio equipment than we had to get here. So we got hold of my friend David in less than 30 minutes. Hello, old friend. How's everything in your part of town? We're trying, he replied with a sigh. I got Mel, Jason, and James Van Fleet here as well, and we're just trying to keep the lid on the boiling pot, if you know what I mean. I do, brother. It's the same here, and probably in every chapter across the country, I said. We were hoping you had the answer. Did they ever find that corrupt judge? What's his name? Lowry, David replied. And nope, he's probably back east by now. I'm not looking for him. I can tell you that for sure. The same goes for the last sheriff, Kate. So back to the issue. We've turned a corner here in the northern chapter and are finally making some progress. Really? How so? I asked, both gathering info for Mac, seated next to me and genuinely curious myself. Well, it's like this. At the FEMA camps, they had no choice but to work if they ever wanted a chance to have their families united. Once they did, they got comfortable. Nothing more to work for, I guess. So we tried telling them what to do and you can guess how that went. That's where we're at here chimed in Mac, stating his name first. Mind if I jump in? asked James. Not at all, sure thing, sounds good, we all chorused. The turning point for us, James continued, was getting the greenhouses up and running. They got everyone excited to see what we could do as a group. From there, we just rotate out the not-so-fun jobs like hand-washing laundry, latrine duty, and general hygiene. Hold on a minute, something is going on outside the building. Mac and I could hear yelling coming from outside, as Ken opened the front door of the sheriff's office where he served as head of the city council. You are not going to believe this, said David, looking out the window. What is it, I asked. Judge Lowry, I need to get back with you later. Chapter 5, Weston, Colorado David followed Ken, walking outside and holding the door for Sheriff Van Fleet. Jason and Mel hung back, standing just inside the door, screams of help 
now drowned out the yelling of a small group of men holding the man up by his shirt collar in the back of the pickup truck. His face and clothes were bloodstained, but anyone who knew him recognized the judge right away. What's going on here, gentlemen? asked David, pointing his shotgun towards the ground. We got that bastard, said one of the judge's captors, holding him up higher by the back of his collar. And the lady sheriff, too, added another, pointing to the inside cab. David and James couldn't see her, but believed they were telling the truth. All right, thank you for bringing them in, said David. We will take it from here. That's not going to work, said the apparent lead man, who neither David nor James had seen before. David whispered something to James that Ken couldn't overhear. Let's get them unloaded, commanded David, as if he hadn't heard any opposition. We aim to hang them both, just like they did to a bunch of folks last year, said the lead man. That's not your call, said David sternly. Now let's get them unloaded before things go in a different direction. The smallest of the four men jumped out of the truck bed in compliance, looking back over his shoulder at the other three. You guys coming, he asked, with none responding. We have our plans, announced what appeared to be the lead man. Unless, of course, you want him, he asked, looking squarely at David. We do, replied David, not losing the man's gaze. Well, all right. We may be able to strike a deal, maybe not. You see, we're concerned citizens of this here fair town. That comes first always. However, we have been known to dabble in the bounty arts, if you get my drift. James shook his head back and forth, not wanting to waste another minute with this guy. So we're all on the same page here, continued James. You're trying to tell us you are so concerned about this town that you took it upon yourselves to locate and capture two of its former government officials. However, you could be persuaded to sell them back to us because you fancy yourselves some 1800S-type bounty hunters? I think you dumbed it down a bit, but basically that's the fact, Jack. The judge shook his head side to side, mumbling and spitting out blood. James could tell that Lowry was probably more bothered by the lack of intelligent conversation on the side of his captors than he was about being captured in the first place. David moved closer, shaking his head another way. Open your mouth, Lowry, he commanded, getting close enough to see. He complied, showing a mouth of teeth, some there and others not. You boys did this, asked James. Nah, he fell, trying to run like the coward he is, replied the man. Hey, boy, get away from the truck, he yelled at Ken, looking in the rear passenger window. I need to talk to her, replied Ken, not looking up. A second man, without a word, fired two pistol shots, striking Ken with the second, dropping him to the ground, writhing. Down, judge! yelled David, firing his shotgun a second later. The former town judge dropped in a heap, but not fast enough on the truck bed, with his captor looking down at his chest as he fell back and off the truck's bed. The other three all hit indirectly. With David's initial blast scrambled to return fire, with David and James beating them to it. A shotgun round from each took them down, with the only gurgling screams coming from Lowry and calls for help from Ken. David quickly ran around the vehicle, looking for signs of life, finding none. It's clear, he called to James. The judge is a maybe at best. Hold on, Lowry. We'll get the doctor up here, he said calmly, yelling for someone to call the doctor. The back truck door opened with a kick, and a hand-tied Kate stepped out, surveying the scene and bending down to check on her former boyfriend. James, catch me up, she asked as if she were still in charge and not overly concerned with Ken's lower leg injury. Still in this chair, but not bad besides all that. James replied, I figured you two would be several states away by now. That was the plan, she agreed, but it's hostile out there, more than we expected. My boy, my friend Ken here needs some attention, she added, as he stood, hopping on one leg. Got me in the calf, he said as he winced. Hurts like a mother, but I'll be okay. It beats a failed attempt at jumping the courthouse, I guess. The irony was not lost on him or Judge Lowry. The former judge tried to speak coughing up a mouthful of blood. Hang on just a bit, David said to the judge. I've sent for the doc. Lowry's face said it all, still calm with his eyes open. I'm sorry, David said over him. I couldn't wait to fire. He's gone, David called over the truck to the others. All right, Sheriff. What's the plan, asked David. I don't know, replied David in a near whisper. Let's have a chat, I guess. We can get Ken looked at and get these bodies over to the cemetery. The chat he was referring to was not the typical interrogation of a former sheriff that either killed or had a part in the hangings of Weston citizens. Kate was still bound at the wrists, and Ken continued hopping on his good leg 
using her shoulder as support. It's been a while, Kate, said James in a neutral tone. I'll bet you love this, she snapped back. Been dreaming of this day for months, right? No, you're wrong on both assumptions. I'd written you off, just like Sheriff Johnson. Out of sight and, well, you know how the saying goes, you both, he added, looking back and forth between her and the bed of the truck where Judge Lowry made his last stand. We're not a good fit for Weston, and neither was Sheriff Johnson. Where you ended up was none of my business or concern, as long as it wasn't back here. But here you are, added David, back in our town, and that's a problem. There's nothing out there, Kate mumbled, only chaos outside these walls. We are now part of a United States coalition, stated James, with chapters across the country. Our families have sacrificed to see it succeed, and it works better than anything I've seen before it since the day. So you're inviting us back? Well, me? Asked Kate with a snort, amused at her own quip and always wanting to get to the point. No, not exactly, replied James, not addressing her outburst. You're only here because some self-appointed bounty hunters found you two, and if it was our day off, you would both be hanging from the gallows you know well. But of course, our military partners may have other plans for you, but I don't know that yet, continued James, and really it's my call as sheriff. Their new old friend spent the night in a cell after Doc Walters tended to Ken. What are you going to do with her? Asked a nervous Ken. It's out of our hands, replied David. We will have to see what they want to do. The military, asked Ken. Yep. Can I talk to her? From outside her cell, it's fine, I guess, replied James, asking Jason to take him back and leave them for a few minutes. Thank you, said Ken, following Jason to the back of the jailhouse. Hey, he whispered with his face close to the bars. Hey, back, Kate replied with a smile. You had it, the both of you. Had what, she asked. Freedom is what everyone wants. I assume he is, I mean, was your current boyfriend, right? Ken prodded. What? Kate replied with her mouth agape, either genuinely surprised by the question or playing her best hand. You've been together, it looks like for a while. That's a hard no, she replied, shaking her head. You, Ken, jumped a motorcycle over a friggin' building. And Sheriff Johnson, well, he was just a badass. That the judge, he was as far opposite you two as he could be. A sniveling, hammer-banging, he-she-liker that couldn't hold a gun steady with four hands. We left together. Didn't have a choice, really. But I didn't make it a week sharing a house with him. When those yahoos outside picked him up, he ratted out my location without a second thought. My mistake was letting him know where I was. Why didn't you take off, asked Ken. Go to towns away from here or even a state or two? You have no idea what it's like out there, outside this town. I thought it was all like here, every town or city doing their best to move forward. It's not. There are good people, I guess, but guys like these who got me are everywhere, going home and taking whatever they want. These are your people. They are from right here. These are your people, she screamed, getting an, is everything all right back there? From David. Yes, sir. It's all good. We're okay, he replied, asking her to keep it down. Sorry, Kate replied. I'm just pissed off. How about that little girlfriend of yours? You knock her up yet? Come on, replied Ken, growing flush in the cheeks. No, she's not, of course. She left not long after you did. Went back to Pueblo. Hmm, sorry, not sorry, she said with a giggle. Time to go, Ken, called out Jason. Sorry, sheriff's orders. That's me, Ken replied. Good night, Kate. Thanks for stopping by she replied casually, as if she was saying goodnight to an old friend and shutting the front door to her home. Chapter 6, Weston, Colorado James had a call the following day, not with the head guy as the colonel was responsible for more significant matters, but with his assigned contact for the Northern Colorado chapter. The response was clear and not much of a surprise. You handle it and let us know if things get out of hand was essentially the response. James wasn't all too surprised, and it did fit in with their desire not to be governed over every town matter, he told David. I agree, David replied, shaking his head side to side with a, what do we do now, smile. Well, we can't keep her locked up in here forever, and it sounds like they don't want her. So I guess we talk to her and see what we can figure out. I want her, shouted Ken, walking through the front door, apparently hearing just enough of the conversation. What I mean is, I'll take her. We're not auctioning off a pet here, said James. I know that. I just meant I would like to be responsible for her. If she wanted to, of course. 
Here's the problem, started David before closing the office door with the other men inside. I've come to know you, Ken, and I trust you to make the right decisions about this town, but I don't think it's that simple. Are you expecting her to give up her ambitions and be the dutiful housewife? She doesn't seem like that type of woman. No, you're right. She's not that at all. What I'm asking for is a second chance for her and me, he stated, looking squarely at James. A second chance, and only that. This time the smile was on James's face. You know more about me than I thought, I guess. I've been past your place and saw the sign, Second Chances Ranch. It's hard to miss, if I'm honest. Yes, it does say just that, and I believe everyone does deserve just that. But it's not as simple as saying it out loud. The person wanting it has to understand what it is, and the rules not set by me or any other human but by God himself gave me a second chance when I needed it the most. Me too, chimed in Jason, me too. Why is it so important, you may ask? Because it's all we get in this life, one second chance to start brand new, regardless of our past. I took mine and ran with it, quite literally, vowing never to go back to my old ways. When one does that, they can't lose. The only question remaining is, are you looking for her, or is she seeking an opportunity on her own? I understand, can I talk to her for a bit? Ken asked. Sure, said James, tossing her cell keys to him. David and I are going out for breakfast. Bring her this, he added, handing Ken a plate with eggs, toast, and jam, still warm. Do you think she will be there when we get back, asked James. We'll see, replied David. Either way, it tells us exactly what kind of man Ken is. An hour later, they returned to overhear Ken still talking with Kate in the back. I guess we have our answer, remarked David. Keys clanked from down the hall, and the unmistakable click of the cell door being locked echoed through the station. Can we talk? asked Ken. Sure, what are you thinking? asked James. Woo! he sighed. I'm not sure where to... I mean, it's just that... They had never seen him this nervous. Let's hear it, said David confidently, but assuring at the same time. Okay, he sighed once more, puffing out his cheeks and closing the office door once more. We want to be together as a couple maybe even get married, and we want to live in town, and she would like a job, maybe town treasurer or the city council. Ken breathed deeply, having to spit it out like a small boy trying to convince his parents to get him a BB gun. She wants a second chance, or you do? asked James. We both do, the two of us together. Give us a few minutes, said David. Oh, sure thing. I'll wait outside, I guess, he replied, heading out the door, followed by Jason. Not you, Jason, said David. You're deputy mayor, and this is your concern as well. Oh, sure, sorry, I'll stay, he replied. What do you think, James started. I think there's no way she's fit for a government or any position on this earth regarding town matters, and especially town treasurer. She's got ambition more than most, but it's been misdirected in the past. Plus, we know exactly what she's capable of doing. I agree on all points, said David. We've got three choices as I see it. One, we keep her locked up here indefinitely. I think we both agree that is not a good long-term plan. Two, we let her go back to wherever the guys out front found her, knowing she was close by but not having any info on her. Or three, we can attempt to give her a second chance to stay close and positively channel her ambition. She gets some power and uses it for good. It sounds like we're talking superheroes here, said James with a grin. We are basically taking someone with a lot of power once and using it badly to transform them to do good. The biggest question is, does she crave ambition or something else? We know what she is capable of, but if she wanted to try something like that again, she could have already at any time since she was living so close to town. For that reason alone, I don't expect her to try a power play. Plus, her biggest problem around here will be the townsfolk. They have a long memory. They talked about 15 minutes more before requesting a meeting with both Ken and Kate. Go fetch her, Ken, and meet up back here, said James. Wait, what do you mean? Cuff her and bring her up here? No, replied David. Just unlock her cell door and walk her up here for a chat. Uh, okay, I can do... I'll be right back, he said with nervous excitement, practically running towards the back, jangling the keys. If she bolts out the front door, we have our answer, I guess said David quietly. The two walked slowly up front, whispering to each other. No restraints, she said, looking around and taking inventory of everything around her. Not anymore, said David. You're free to walk out that door and back to wherever you have been hiding out recently, he added, pointing to the front door propped open with a cinder block. 
That's not what I was expecting, she replied, looking back and forth between them and Ken. Or, she finally asked. Or, replied James, you two can stay here in town at Ken's place, I would imagine. Or your old one, I guess. And we can channel your ambitious nature into something positive for this town. Aren't you concerned I may do something not so nice to one of you? After all, I have a past, as you pointed out once or twice. I'm not. You've been gone a while, but not far, I suspect. It doesn't take much to sneak back in town disguised and get close to one or both of us. For that reason alone, we are willing to give you a second chance, one final chance to help this town. No, Ken, it won't be as town treasurer or city council, but something more hands-on, we're thinking. What are you good at, Kate? asked James. I haven't agreed to anything, she said. Yeah, but you're still here talking to us, replied James. So what skills do you have? I don't know what you're looking for. I do, blurted out Ken. I've been thinking about it lately, or at least the past day or so. You know how I'm good at motorcycles and fixing things, right? Yes, I would agree with that, replied James, tapping his chair. Well, I was thinking that we've got some vehicles running, but at some point soon we'll run completely out of gasoline. It's not like we're making more, and the military needs all they can get, I'm sure. Okay, I'm following, said David. She, Kate, that is, said Ken excitedly, has been around horses all her life. She's trained them for riding, bred them, and even knows some veteran, I mean veterinarian stuff. So, unless they get the power back up soon, we will need horses, and lots of them, just like in the old, old days. It's a good point, Ken, said David. Give us a few minutes to discuss. Ken and Kate walked freely out the front door, as if she had never killed the former sheriff or been locked up until only minutes ago. Kate had a quickly fleeting but somehow powerful inclination to take off at a full run down Main Street, not stopping until she was far out of town. What do you think, Ken? she asked. I think they probably will go for it, seeing that there isn't much alternative. The long term of it will be up to you, and I'm game to help any way I can. Do you want to do it? Yeah, I guess it's not a bad alternative. I do love horses. And besides, I wasn't doing much before a few days ago anyway. You will never be sheriff again. You know that, right? She smiled. Let's go back inside and see what the verdict is. Well, I think we could maybe get the colonel to pitch in and get a town stable going, said James, with David nodding in agreement. It's yours to choose. What do you say, Kate? Does it pay? Room and board, declared James and maybe some small salary down the road as long as the program is running smoothly. She paused a moment, biting her upper lip before declaring, I'm in. All right. I think we can use the rodeo arena for now, and there's some grazing pasture just behind it. May even get a few local donations from farmers, continued James. I'll start with two from my place, and I'll talk to the other ranchers in the area over the next few days. Congratulations, Ken. Thank you, he replied. I'm sure we will be very happy, he added, putting an arm around his new old girl. James nodded. That too, I guess, but I was talking about new stables. I need you to find a few men to help and get it into tip-top shape for our new arrivals. Oh yeah, sure thing, because I'm good with my hands, right? Precisely, and it was your idea. Ken and Kate walked out the front door, as if she was just there for a friendly hello. His idea, huh? asked David. Yep, and we need him keeping an eye on her, replied James. He's got a good soul and a guilty conscience, and I'm sure we will pick up on it if something ominous is brewing down the road. Keep him close, is what they say. Chapter 7, Weston, Colorado David got hold of Lance and Mac nearly a week later, hoping to finish the conversation about the camp. It was clear to him and James that they were farther along than Corey's group and would give advice along the way as best they could. James and Janice maintained their ranch eight miles outside of town with little Billy growing like a weed. With his wife Lauren and their girls, Jason moved back to their trailer with the town's newfound peace. They waited until the family from the lake, who had been housed there, decided to move to another town closer to old friends. While the trailer wasn't quite the second chance ranch's style of comfort, they felt they had overstayed their welcome, even as James and Janice urged them to stay. James found a few ranch hands to take over his and Ken's chores, and the still was reserved for friends of the family. Chance stayed at the ranch, with the Davis girls visiting several times per week. David and most of the Rattan Pass militia moved into town in recent months. 
Mark and Callie were inseparable, as anyone might expect with young love. Mark took to town living quicker than David had hoped, but Tina and their girls liked it too. Tina opened a cafe, only the second restaurant after the Weston Grill and Tavern, called the Weston Texan, specializing in Tex-Mex and barbecue cuisine. Mel's wife, Tammy, an official co-founder of the Weston Texan, made sure the coffee bar was stocked and up to par with her old New York-style haunts. Their daughter, Katie, was the first official barista and caught the eye of every young teenage boy in town. Katie's brother, Joshua, excelled at school, almost as if he had grown up here his whole life. Mel was named a deputy sheriff and didn't mind being the number three guy, after James and the former head deputy. As long as he could hang out with his friends and tell jokes, he was happy. His days of living a recluse life on Raton Pass were a distant memory, and he would still recount losing his house to fire as the most positive, life-changing event he had experienced, minus the tragedy with Dean, of course. Beatrice missed the old homestead, but never once brought it up to her son or anyone else. Instead, she spent most of her days in the kitchen and with her granddaughters whenever she could pull them away from Tina. Every day I stand north of the floor is a good day, she would say, and being the official head chef for hundreds of hungry mouths was a job she took on with passion and grace. But if she was honest about it, she was called by God himself to do it and would take her last breath over the stove. As a family, any talk of her husband and David's father was pre-EMP, and somehow it seemed easier that way. Ken's ex-girlfriend moved out of town all the way to Pueblo, convinced he never lost love for Kate. She was right, and he didn't try to stop her. As Sheriff James, with Mel and David's help, replaced more than half of the deputies with honest town folk eager to be trained. As a town, they still had an occasional outsider trying to cause trouble, but these usually were resolved quickly, with the realization that Weston was now an official chapter of the U.S. coalition, and backed, even if more by theory, by the United States military. Signs posted at the boundaries of town on all prominent roads read the same. The Chapter 8 Headed South The early spring and summer were all about the training camps for Mike, Sergio, and a slew of others hand-picked for their particular skills. But instead of starting with young kids whose recent thoughts were filled with social media posts, high school happenings, and dating, they were filled with men and women like Mike. Always get into fights? We want you. Have a few screws loose? Yep, you too. Former law enforcement with a propensity towards violence? Right this way. Outliers, misfits, and tough guys are all welcome. The training was new, and the object was not to break the recruit down, only to build them back up with new ideas and philosophies, but to harness those imperfections, as others might call them. Channel the formerly frowned upon behaviors into fighting machines that would accept nothing less than an entire liberation and restructuring of this once great country. The president himself commanded it, and the colonel was tasked with getting it done. Mike and Sergio fit in as though they themselves had dreamed up the training over a few beers in a local pub. Wouldn't it be cool if, turned into class 101, and, I can't believe they are letting us, turned into the class after lunch. Training camps were set up in 10 states, with the top few from each camp moving on to final missions. I'm expecting big things from you two, the colonel told Mike and Sergio from the start. Yes, sir, replied Sergio. How long is the training? Until we're ready or the national situation demands interference. Good luck, gentlemen. See you on the other end. Mike and Sergio received their first mission from Rona weeks after being recruited, and ironically, Mike found himself headed back towards and over Dallas. Didn't you live somewhere down there, asked Sergio, as they approached the once sprawling metropolis up in the distance? Yeah, we lived, Kelly and me, just north of Dallas when it started. Mike half expected to see fires burning out of control like when he left, but that mayhem was over now and replaced by blood, sweat, and grit. Those lucky or skilled enough to survive the first year had a good chance to make it through the next one. Sure, there's occasional violence and skirmishes for power, said Jessup from behind him, yelling over the loud Chinook blades. We have a good group now on our property, and I intend to build up the ranch and our community as a whole. You ever get shot at traveling like this? Jessup asked Mike. Here and there, but these guys take care of it, he added, pointing to the Apaches flanking on both sides. Plus, we usually steer clear of the big cities, except like today when I'm getting picked up or dropped off. 
Isn't it easier to drive out in the country and meet the chopper? Son, it's not easier or safer. Not yet, at least. But it's getting better every day. You boys are headed for big things, I hear. We're behind you all the way. I'm supposed to be retired, but I didn't ranch all these years to get run over by a million Chinese. Not that ranchers ever truly retire, but you get my drift. What I'm telling you, son, is that we're all counting on you and your buddy, he said, pointing to Sergio, and a few others you haven't met yet, to make sure we get the chance to rebuild this great nation. Maybe even better than before. Who knows? In a few years, maybe the kid can give you a hand. What kid? asked Mike. Why, you remember the boy, Sam, we found headed to your guy's gun shop way back at the beginning? I remember Sam, the crack shot with a BB gun, right? Yes, that's the one. He's all grown up now, a hardened fighter in a boy's body. It's how they all are now, said Mike. Are you afraid of dying for your country, Mike? No, sir. That's what I thought. That's surely what I thought. Give him hell, soldier, and get me an update from time to time. Yes, sir, I can do that, replied Mike who next to the colonel and Father Carrasso and a couple of others had never had more respect for a man. This stop is mine, said Jessup minutes later as the chopper descended rapidly. Mike and Sergio spoke loudly over the roaring engines, eventually settling into a battle-like trance. Mike had seen many faces of the young men in pictures, just before storming the beach at Normandy. This was different. These two men were not 18 years old, straight out of high school, where the worst that happened thus far was a fistfight behind the baseball field after school. These two men had seen war and death up close and oftentimes at their hands. They were ready to fight and had nothing to lose. What are you fighting for, Mike? Asked Sergio. Javi and my friends, he responded without a pause, to go back to your old life. No, so they can continue with theirs. It's simple, really. If little Javi lives to be an old man free from oppressive rule, then I've done my job. Nothing less is acceptable. I don't have anyone like that counting on me, admitted Sergio, but I do have Rona and the Colonel who are expecting me to come through, and that's enough for me. We will be landing soon, he added, and will be briefed in the morning. Then what? asked Mike. Then it's game on, fourth quarter, 23 yards to score, second down with 40 seconds on the clock and two timeouts. We're down by five. No field goal is going to do it. Your boy and every other one lucky enough to still be alive is counting on us like two Santa Clauses locked and loaded, trying to bring presents into a war-torn country. This is Christmas, baby, and everyone after. Let's not screw it up. They touched down an hour, or was it two, later? Mike wasn't sure and didn't ask. Where were they? He didn't ask that either. It didn't matter. He had orders or suggested directions. He liked to joke, but only to Sergio. Either way, he trusted those in charge to use his unique set of talents in a useful way. He and Sergio were asked to take a 30-question psychological profile exam a few days back. Sure, why not? He replied. I've already got the job. Are they worried about what we might do? He whispered to Sergio. No, they are concerned with what we won't do, he replied. Mike wasn't concerned with passing or failing and didn't even try to give an answer that may put him in a better light. He imagined Sergio did the same but never asked. They slept in some kind of barracks on cots with a dozen others, in a large concrete building. No one talked or interacted at all from his view, just slept and got up when the bell rang. He and Sergio brought up the rear of the line and took their turn through the chow line. Still, nobody spoke, all eating as quietly as 15 or more men and women could. 15 minutes later, another bell sounded and a guard called single file and led them into a meeting room with a conference table that easily sat 40 people. Each man and woman was directed to a particular seat with the paper number they had been given upon arrival, taped to the chairs. What's this? Mike whispered to Sergio, who sat to this left. Like a name tag at a sales convention, he replied. Hi, my name is Doofus. I'm the top-selling sales guy for dog crap pickup, he concluded, getting a grin out of Mike. Tick, tick, tick came from the overhead fan with no other noises to be heard. Mike couldn't get it out of his head like a metronome inside solitary confinement. Tick, tick, tick. If he were anywhere else, he would have scoured for an off switch or stood on the table to stop it. But looking around the room, he wasn't the only one bothered by it. Two seats down from his right sat a large man, tatted in most of the available spaces where his body had skin, Mike assumed, and sporting a large black beard. 
What are you looking at, boy? He asked, catching Mike looking over. Mike shook his head without responding. Hey, I'm talking to you, the large man added, standing in front of his chair. Nothing, man, replied Mike, looking in Sergio's direction. It took everything Mike had to not meet the man halfway and loosen his jaw a bit. The last fight he was in had been a while ago, and he would love nothing better right now, but it was Sergio's voice that held him back. Not here, brother. Not here, unless he gives you no choice. Mike's hearing was acute and had been since grade school. Probably when the bullies targeted him and his brother Arthur, he would tell those who asked. Today, as in the past, it did not fail him, giving him a split second to stand and face the advancing man. They squared up, each man nose to nose like MMA opponents before a fight. The bearded man was fuming, trying not too hard to control his emotions, Mike thought. Mike, remembering Sergio's words, stood calm, with an I'm bored with this look on his face when Sergio stepped in. Back up, Brutus, in reference to the Popeye nemesis from books in a movie or two, possibly. My name is not Brutus, and this ain't your beef. Hmm, about that, said Sergio, standing nearly as close as they were to each other. What is your name? Ain't none of your business, but it's Kelly. Well, Kelly. Wait, you had a girlfriend named Kelly, didn't you, Mike? Yes, I did. Spelled with a Y, same as yours. Or do you end with an I and a heart? The man fumed, turning red, and the others at the table scooted their chairs back, with a few carrying them across the room. So, what's it going to be, Kelly? asked Mike. The last time I was this close to a Kelly, we were dancing. Are we going to dance, big guy? If so, you lead. And if not, I would like to sit down again. Kelly looked around to others in the room, maybe for approval to continue this charade or a reason, any reason, to give up on it. Another minute passed with a few coughs before another yelled out, This is BS! Soldiers came to a familiar voice from behind Mike. Most scrambled to stand and some were saluting the colonel. Mike, I see you and Kelly have met. Should I send for the gloves? We have a few pair across the building. Huh? asked Kelly. We settled our differences in the boxing ring in the camps, everyone from the guests to the guards. The man standing in front of you fought my reigning champion Rodriguez and knocked him out cold. I've sparred with him myself and he's no joke. So I'll ask again, Kelly. Should I send for the gloves? Uh, no, sir. We were just talking. Isn't that right, Mike? What he said, Mike replied with a slight grin. Okay then, Kelly. Head back to your seat, ordered the colonel. Now. And will someone turn that fan off? He yelled to the guards. That thing is annoying as hell. Mike had a flashback of a movie about an elf. He remembered what the main guy hollered, seeing his old boss again and said in front of everyone, It's Santa. I know him. He resisted the passing urge to say, Hey, how's it going? Or something to that effect. You all are the best of the best I've been told, hand-selected for more than 10 training camps, each starting with a slew of pre-qualified fighters, continued the colonel. Some military, some law enforcement, and others just badasses, he added with a stone face. Each of you has a number you were given last night when most of you arrived. There are no names or ranks from this day forward. You are all on the same team and chosen for the unique abilities needed to get our great country back up and prosperous. I will briefly go around the table and point out at least one strength the soldier carries with them at all times. Soldier 4876, he started, with the person two down from Sergio on the left. This man is an expert in demolition, explosives, and general teardown, he read off the card. Next, we have soldier number 6547, again reading from the card. She is a chameleon of sorts and has been known to find her way through security details and get up close to high-level targets. On to soldier number 3967, he continued, looking at Sergio and lowering his paper. This soldier has worked in high ranks and as a spy, getting into the inner circle of dangerous men. Beside him is soldier number 5496, a boxer like myself. He's not a man to cross, but finds himself always on the right side of street justice. Mike and Sergio listened for their new friend Kelly's special talent. Soldier number 5491, the colonel said when he got around to the seat. It's a seasoned sniper with 128 confirmed kills and four tours under his belt. Let's steer clear of that dude, whispered Sergio to Mike, getting an of course he is reply and a nod in confirmation. The colonel worked his way around the table of the best men and women this country had to offer, not breaking until the end. This is an all-or-none mission, soldiers. 
No second chances or second place finishes. We take back our rightful place in this world or die trying. We are a team. That nonsense when I got in here is done. Are we clear, gentlemen? Yes, sir, both Kelly and Mike replied. Okay, many of you will have to do things beyond your comfort zone and basic morality. If you are God-fearing, use that faith to guide you. If not, I would suggest you find some. Mark my words, you will need it. That is all. Your missions will be passed out momentarily. Some of you are paired up and may discuss your plans. Those who are not, you will keep yours private. Godspeed, and may God bless the United States of America. Are you God-fearing, Mike? asked Sergio as they waited for their instructions. I don't really fear anything, but he uses me, I'm sure of that. How about you? I'm still alive, so there must be a reason. Mike Sergio called the colonel, waving his arm to follow into another room. Have a seat, gentlemen, said the colonel. Scotch neat or on the rocks, he asked. I'm okay, thanks, said Mike. On the rocks it is, the colonel replied, because I still can't believe I can get them. Thank you, sir, replied Mike as he was handed a glass. After tomorrow, you boys won't have any time for drinking, so indulge me for a bit. Mike and Sergio replied with head nods in agreement. I'm sure you remember, looking at Mike, back in the FEMA camp, when I told you what I could about Rana and Baker. Mike nodded again, sipping his drink. Now, as before, I can't discuss classified documents and information. However, I will get you both up to speed on everything else. Mike grinned, quickly hiding it behind his hand. What's that? asked the colonel. Just, I imagine you have about as many good friends as I do. So I get the wanting to hang out with people who get you. Now the colonel laughed. Yeah, Mike, that's about the right story. The ships from China, carrying the thousands of people aiming to fill our great country, are held up at random points along the journey. Some ships have turned back, and others sit in ports awaiting instructions. Best case, they all turn back. But even then, the reprieve will be short before they or others try again. The main problem is that we have too many ports. What do we do about that? Asked Mike, having an idea already. Well, it goes against everything we stand for, but we have no choice but to disable all but protected ports. The ships of provisions from our allies must get through, but no others. Once the invaders dock, it's like trying to stop a hill full of mad ants trying to get the kid that wrecked their mound. We don't want to sink them. Just turn them around before they get too close and send a message that no more should be sent our way. And if they don't turn back, asked Mike, then it's war, just like always, them or us. Two of the men you had sitting back in the conference room with you are those kinds. I won't tell you who, but they aren't hard to spot. They have dead gray eyes. They can carefully pet a puppy one minute and snap a man's neck seconds later, only to return to the petting. I call them the ghosts. And there are two dozen more just like them. No, Mike, not like you. I've done the research and know more about you than probably anyone. I know about Joey, of course, and Father Carrasso. I also know about the janitor in his church, your brother Arthur, the men who killed your sister, and what happened to Kelly, your former girlfriend before Sheila, that is. Speaking of Kelly in the briefing room earlier, stay clear. I know you could take him man to man, but more likely he'll put a bullet in your head from a mile away. He doesn't know you. And outside the job, he's a hothead and a bit of an a-hole. Always getting angry with someone. You two have no beef, just a random crossing. Let's keep it at that. Sure. Okay. But Kelly, the other one, what do you know about her? She wandered off from your camp, as you know. Wandered for days and ended up back close to home. Plano, to be accurate. The only person I know from there, besides Vlad, is Jessup, said Mike. Yep, she ended up there. I guess someone talked up his ranch before you all headed out. How is, I mean, is she alive? Yes, Mike, and happy. Started a new family as well. Nah. Mike shook his head in disbelief with emotions he never felt coming to the surface. Why are you telling me all this, sir? You asked about Kelly and because I know you and everything about you. You and Sergio are not the guys I'm talking about that would take out every ship headed here, killing thousands of innocent families and still have an appetite for lunch. You are not them. You're also not me. You're both something in between. And I intend to use that to our advantage. Your job, the both of you, is to stay in between the ghosts and our military. Let's take our San Diego port, for example. The colonel continued, spreading out a large white paper on the conference table with key points labeled. 
Our allies, England, Australia, Israel, for example, could be mixed in with ships from China, North Korea, Iran, and others, all heading here, he pointed out with a stick. Thankfully, we have most of our ships and subs back in our waters, but we can't go blasting every ship out of the water. One mistake with an Allied ship, and we're on our own. It's a tightrope walk for sure, and one we need to win at all costs. Now, then there is the other matter we discussed a while back. Our government, including the president, vice, tenants of both the House and Congress and all of their families, need safe passage offshore until we can sort this mess out. Just as always, we can't have everyone on a single ship and risk losing them all to rogue factions. I couldn't tell you before where they were or where they were headed, but I can now. Ghosts will run in front of and directly behind them. The military will be positioned either end of the ghosts, and you two, along with maybe 20 more men and women of your caliber, will be right in the mix. Sergio, you will be responsible for President Obama. And Mike, you have the vice president. That's it? Just one guy? Asked Mike. Not just a guy, that guy. The rest of your crew, known as the Takers, will take them from one shore back home when the time is right. Ever been to Cuba, gentlemen? Sergio half raised his hand. Mike did not. I thought they didn't like us, said Mike. They don't, but it doesn't matter. We happen to have one of the most secure areas anywhere on Earth in Cuba. Guantanamo Bay. Gitmo, as some call it. Before you ask, all of the bad guys were released soon after it happened. Not my call, and I'm sure we will pay for that down the road. It is, however, a rock-solid base to house our government officials without going too far offshore. So we are headed to Florida, I'm assuming, asked Mike. Miami, just a stone's throw from communist Cuba. Evacuation starts in five days. Get packed. We leave in one hour. This is it, buddy said Sergio to Mike as they headed back to their dorm room. It's what we've been waiting for and we're finally this close. Can you feel it? The energy, I mean? Yeah, I guess. Maybe. I don't know. It's good, though, to be around people like you and me where there's no pretending to fit in, just a bunch of degenerates doing a job. You have no idea, my friend. You're thinking it's only everyone in the briefing room back there and the others the colonel told us about? Yeah, that's right, replied Mike. Well, you're half right. It is all those soldiers, but it's also those we are preparing to evacuate. Maybe not all of them, but a fair amount on both sides of the aisle. You mean the President, VP, Congress, and the House? Like I said, a lot of them, but not all of them. I'll leave it to you to figure out which ones belong in each camp. All I'm saying is that they all hold power. Not like yours and mine, but power nonetheless. And if you're not careful, you can be manipulated into heading in the wrong direction. I can handle myself replied Mike confidently. I know you can, but always remember that we take orders from the Colonel Rana and nobody else. Yeah, that makes sense, replied Mike, adding. I'm sure every day is a pissing match with all those politicians penned up like cattle, waiting to head out to pasture or the meatpacking plant and not sure which one. Exactly. Beyond the surface and facade, they are just people. Fathers, mothers, grandparents, you know, regular people doing a job most of us wouldn't want. Mark my words. More than a few of them will try and tell us how it's going to go or what we are perceived as doing wrong. That's when we remember our mission is to get them safely across, no less and no more. We follow orders given and nothing else. Not even the commander in chief, asked Mike. Not even him, replied Sergio. Got it? Yes. So when do we meet everyone? Asked Mike, curious to see if some in particular looked like he had seen them on TV. A day, maybe two said the colonel, catching the tail end of their conversation as he rode into the room. What are those things called? Asked Mike, pointing to the colonel's machine. It's a seg something, a people mover or something like that. Did you know, sir, said Sergio, that the inventor built an off-road one of those and accidentally drove it off a cliff to his death? I hadn't heard that, he replied. That's about as ironic as it gets, though, like an elephant trainer getting trampled by his student. Now that you mention it, I may have our mechanic put some knobby tires on this one. Good luck, gentlemen. We have one more briefing, and after that, I'll be in touch. Your mission briefing is at 0200 hours. Godspeed, soldiers. And Mike still wasn't comfortable with the title soldier, never having served beyond the police force. But things were different now, and he guessed it didn't matter near as much as before the day. Besides, he spent nearly twice the formally required boot camp hours in training, lacking only a graduation ceremony. Mike saw a few faces he recognized at the briefing, and even more he hadn't seen before. 
He locked eyes with Kelly for a brief second and both looked away as if they were complete strangers. Every one of you is here for a reason, hand chosen, you might say, and you all have unique talents. We're asking you all to give your country everything you've got, and then some more, started the colonel. Nobody here is afraid to die. I know that. But I can assure you, most of the civilians you will be safely transporting believe they may and are scared to death about it. You will not. Let me repeat to be clear. You will not take orders, suggestions, requests of any kind from any of them. Not even the commander-in-chief, sir? Asked one man in the back. That's right, soldier. Not even him. He would be the last one to request something anyway. He knows how this works, and the less they interfere, the more likely they are to see another day. Any other questions? Yes, sir, replied another. Why did it take this long to consider evacuating them all? China is why. They weren't trying to come here, and now they are, with thousands of soldiers on each ship, but not fighting soldiers that we could engage at landing. These are domestic civilian soldiers, farmers, and their families. Why would families risk getting killed as they land? The man continued. They know we won't. That's not our way. So we have to detain and feed all of them, deport them at our expense, and spread our navy even thinner, or let them in to settle our farmland. Why would the families want to come here anyway? Asked another. Simple. They are outcasts, just like our founding fathers, continued the colonel. Ours were pissed off at England, and China's are the ones who didn't abide by the child limit, whether accidentally or not. In the end, it doesn't matter much either way. They are coming. It may get messy, and our government needs a safe haven until we get it sorted out. Soldiers' numbers? He read off six or eight combinations, Mike guessed, but he was sure he and Sergio were called. Those roll called stay put. As for the rest of you, get some rest and wait for further instructions. Once the larger group left, the colonel began again. Each of you here has been vetted. We know where you are from, went to school, your dog's name, and the first girl or boy you kissed, he added. The information I'm about to share with you does not leave this room. We have a lot of people to transfer, around 1,200 in all, including government officials deemed vital and their immediate families. Yes, there are more slots that didn't make that cut before anyone asks. These 1,200 will be transported via approximately 30 ships, yachts, helicopters, and even some fishing boats. Some vessels will be loaded, with others carrying no passengers beyond a basic crew, as decoys, and the final plans will not be revealed until they happen. We can't have an enemy sub or outlying ship take out the President or half of Congress mid-route. The evacuation will take place over several days, at all hours. Others you sat with in this room won't know the who or when, but you will. Your work will be done once they are all safe at our base in Guantanamo. You will return here and help with securing our ports. Chapter 9. Saddle Ranch, Loveland, Colorado We got hold of David again, getting the cliff notes on the former sheriff and judge. I get what James said, Max started. They can get a project together where progress is not just measured but seen with the naked eye. Basically, so transparent a five-year-old can see and understand the value of the work. What are you suggesting? asked Corey. Basically, a mini ranch at your end of the valley, Mac replied. We could build greenhouses like we have up here, maybe some animals to care for, and a sense of purpose to move forward. What about those who choose not to participate? asked Corey. There are always a few who buck the system, I added jumping in, but most will get involved because it's easier than not. Groups have a way of motivating individuals, and everyone wants to be a part of something bigger. It's human nature. Okay, that could work, Corey agreed. Who builds the greenhouses? They do, I replied. Every nail, every screw. Only then will they feel ownership and the pride to work it into a sustainable life. At some point, everyone is on their own again. Like settling the Old West. And most of us never had the skills to do any of it. John, Bill, Samuel, and the council all thought it was not only a good idea, but the only one that could work. Corey planned out the next two days, observing the growing group without interfering, much as an incoming boss may get the lay of the land with their new employees before stepping in and engaging in the inevitable changes to come. Mac, Corey called on the radio. You guys all done with that fire? Looks pretty clear up there from my view. I think so. I'm not 100% on it, but about 90. 
What can I help with? It would help Cameron and me out if you could come and spend a couple of days down here and bring Lance, Joy, Vlad, and Lonnie. The origins of the Texas clan, I guess? That's right. The ones who started the group that worked so well together against the odds to make it 800 miles to here. My boy and I only had to come 20 miles in from Loveland, but even that was challenging. Plus, I want both a male and female perspective, so we are giving our new group the best chance of a new start. Before you answer, we both know Ralph is here, and I'm sure you don't want to see him. Nah, it's okay, replied Mac. He had a fair chance of killing me in the duel, and later insulted my wife. So if he gives me any trouble, let's just say I've been over-accommodating up to this point and won't be anymore. Fair enough, Corey agreed. I'll talk to Lance and Joy, continued Mac. Are you asking for two solid days and nights or just a couple of shifts? The whole thing, if you can swing it. I will check with them and get back to you. Mac found me outside with the boys, kicking around the soccer ball. It's weird, you know, I said as he rode up on his four-wheeler cutting the engine. What's weird? This right here, playing soccer with the boys and having the confidence to do it without getting attacked by any one of the many people I'm sure are still out there causing problems for people just trying to survive. Honestly, I wasn't sure this type of freedom would ever happen again. You know I'm the last one to support big government, but I support the colonel and whoever else is getting things done, and this time, on our behalf. It's not that the government is big. In fact, it's probably much smaller now, but it's doing its job. The entity is functioning as it's supposed to, helping where needed and holding back where it's not, Mac replied. I think I know what you're going to ask me. I may or may not have gotten a tip from my dad about the plan down the valley, I stated. Yep, that's it. But Corey is asking that you, Joy, Vlad, Lonnie, and I spend two days down there just observing. Days and nights, I should clarify. Joy is talking to Vlad's girlfriend right now about watching the kids, I responded. I caught Lonnie out of my peripheral vision walking up and cranked up the volume, so I was sure he would hear. And I figured I would let you ask Lonnie, but I'm sure his wife won't mind him being away for a couple of nights. He's a crazy loud snorer, so she may even request he stay there longer. Smart ass, I heard from behind me. Oh, hey, Lonnie, I didn't see you there, I replied with a smile. Yeah, you did, he responded, flicking my ear before putting an arm around my shoulder. Hey, now, I replied jokingly. It's tough love, son, he replied. He was only two years older than me, but still called me son on occasion. Let's say I haven't heard anything about this thing down the valley, said Lonnie. Mac explained it, asking for his expertise in law enforcement and getting an enthusiastic, of course, response from Lonnie, who was happy to use his skills and be appreciated for it. You guys got a few minutes, asked Lonnie. Mac looked at his watch before answering. Oddly, I didn't have to answer. Sure, what's up? He reached down and asked Jax to pass him the ball. Me and Mac against you, Hudson, Jax, and Hendricks. First to ten wins. It's not exactly fair, I said, but you can borrow one of the kids if you want to make it even. Lonnie's boy and girl came out of their apartment to see what was happening, as did Javi. Ha! We will see about that, he said, tossing the ball to Hudson. Now we have a team. Now, so the nine of us played soccer for the next 30 minutes, cheating, laughing, hollering, and drawing a crowd. It was surreal and a moment I would never forget. I caught Lonnie and Mac's eyes at the end and realized they felt it too. Rematch in a few years when yours is running around, I whispered to Mac. You're on, he replied, smiling proudly. My boys and I lost by two, but that game stirred something in the community and gave Mac an idea for the camp. Joy got approval from Vlad's girlfriend to watch our boys, and Lonnie had already cleared it with his wife. Corey was excited and grateful for the help. I've got three tents with cot beds set up just outside the camp. All they know is that you're here to observe and see if we can find ways to improve their experience while living here, however long that may be. Mac brought two duffel bags, one with clothes and the other sports equipment. Of course, I've got a soccer ball, he said, showing us all the contents. Next, we have a football, baseball with two left-hand gloves and, well, I guess that's it. I like where you're headed with this, said Corey. I remember Mike telling us about the camps the colonel ran where disputes were settled in the ring. We don't exactly have that here, not at all. With no gloves and no ring, bare knuckle is out of the question, especially with women and children watching. But football tackle, of course, might be what I've been looking for. A way to get out some aggression, settle any scores on the field, and compete with a team. What do you all think? It's your show, said Mac. 
but it could be interesting. May even show some hidden personalities. Corey put a note in the mess hall asking for volunteers to play adults-only football the following afternoon. A sign-up sheet with 30 slots open was filled up in less than an hour. 21 were obvious men's names, four females for sure, and five could go either way. Joy and I split off from Mac, Vlad, and Lonnie, wandering around the tent maze of the camp getting looks from many. I didn't think we stuck out since none were in uniforms, but somehow they knew. Whispering turned into chatter, sneers, and finally accusations. They're uppers, they would say, pointing at us, glaring. What are they talking about? asked Joy. I don't know, but we need to find out quick, I said, as more gathered around on all sides. Go home, uppers, one said, and then another. More joined in, and it became a chant. Stay behind me, I told Joy, searching for a way out. I counted 80 or maybe 100 men, women, and their children shouting, with several men getting close enough to spit in my face. With each violation, my blood boiled. Who were these people I was trying to help? They didn't know us, hadn't met us. Why were we the enemy? A little blonde-haired boy, not much older than ours, came up from behind, spitting on me before throwing a cup of water in my face. That's enough! I yelled as loud as I could, beating myself up for not coming here armed. I was the one who assured Joy it was not necessary and might send the wrong message. A water bottle, full, I guessed, hit me in the head from the side. Hey! I yelled. Stop that! Before another zinged past my nose. Stop it, you animals! Yelled Joy as she was hit above her right eye, with a zipper from some sort of handbag, likely. The blood immediately poured from the deep gash. Two burly men stepped directly in front of me, shoving me backward into Joy. We're not here to cause any problems, I said, thinking at this point it probably sounded just as stupid to them as me. I am, said the lead guy, swinging for the fences. I leaned back, not meaning to push Joy, but stepping on her foot, causing us both to fall back into the waiting crowd. I covered her as best I could, putting my chest and arms over her as blows rained down from every direction. After the first few, I didn't feel any pain, and everything happening seemed quiet and distant. Looking around at blurred faces, I saw one standing no more than five feet away just outside the circle, his arms crossed and a wicked smile on his face that I would never forget. Are you going to help us? I thought to ask. He only smiled that crooked grin of the man whose very life I had saved up on the mountain. Crack, crack, rang out, scattering all but a few. I looked up to see Corey and Mac both pointing rifles into the air. Joy, are you okay? I asked, trying to get up and off of her. I think so, she replied, bleeding from her nose and a gash above her right eye. The last man standing, the one with his arms crossed, held out a water bottle, now only two feet away, and squeezed it into my face. You son of a... I trailed, struggling to stand as the pain in my ribs just under my right armpit shot through my chest like a hot knife. I struggled to get to my feet, determined to make him pay. Hey, hey, Lance, said Max, standing between Ralph and me. I saved his life. And this is what we get. Let me at him, I screamed. Not today, he said, turning to Ralph and adding, and if you squirt me with water, I'll kill you where you stand. Get away from her, I yelled at two women closing in on Joy. It's okay, said Corey. They are with me, my medical staff. They won't hurt her. Okay, but Lonnie, I said, seeing him nearby, go with her and don't let anything happen to her. You have my word, he said, pointing his pistol towards the ground and helping her to walk. I love you, Joy, and I'm sorry, I added as they took her down the canvas hallway. How am I the only one not armed, I asked, feeling responsible for everything that just happened to Joy. These people are animals. You're all animals, I yelled at the few still standing around. You're next, said Corey. For medical, I mean. I hobbled off with Mac's help while Corey stood guard. Twenty minutes later, the laundry list came back as I was loaded into the back of Mac's pickup truck, along with Joy. She has a laceration above her right eye that will need stitches, a mild contusion to the back of her head, and a broken knuckle on her right hand, presumably from striking another person, said the medic. I couldn't help but smile hearing that, realizing quickly that it hurt my split lip where I was hit. You, Lance, have a probable rib fracture, maybe two, not threatening any organs or other tissues near as we can tell, and a split lip I'm sure you can feel, said the head nurse there. In addition, you have a left probable non-displaced orbital fracture of the bone around your eye. Okay, I replied. Non-displaced is good. You also have a broken knuckle on your left hand, most likely from a heavy boot stomp. Not a punch, huh? I asked, knowing the answer. 
No, sir, it doesn't appear that way. You will both likely be x-rayed from head to toe, and Dr. Melton and her colleagues are awaiting your arrival. And I really wanted to see the football game tomorrow, I joked. Is he serious? asked a nurse. Oh, yes. As long as he is this side of heaven, he's a smart ass, no matter what's happened, said Lonnie, adding, love you, brother. Yeah, back at you and Corey. Don't cancel that game tomorrow. I want to be there. You sure about that? Yep, I saw a name I recognized on the sign-up sheet, and I want to see him play. Actually, I saw two names, I added, looking at Mac, putting his hands up in a what-me gesture. You signed up to play tomorrow? Corey asked Mac. Yep, right below him, but on the second sheet, the opposite team. Him who, I asked. Him, Corey, is the only him I would sign up to play tackle football against. Oh, well, okay, I guess. Does Sarah know about this, Corey asked? Yes, it was her idea when I radioed her about the game and his name on it. She's a lifesaver, but not one to be crossed. He won't play. No way, said Corey. I think he will, said Mac. He seems to have recovered from his last incident, and he has something to prove to those he wants to follow him. Ooh, then I wouldn't miss it for the world, I said. I'll sit this one out, said Joy. But I want every detail, she added. Chapter 10 EU, West Hospital, Loveland, Colorado. Lance, you're back, said Dr. Melton. Well, you know, just trying to keep you from getting bored. Hi, Samuel, I said, surprised to see him here. Hi, Joy. Hi, Sarah, she replied. Wait, I didn't know you two knew each other, really, I said. Cat's out of the bag. Joy has been my confidant for a few months. I needed some advice on relationships, and she is a listener and sounding board. You knew about this? I asked Mac, getting the same what-me gesture I had seen only minutes before. She gives my Sarah good advice. What can I say? I guess that's right, I replied, adding, take her first, please. We were both released in about two hours, with Corey's nurses dead on with the medical evaluations, now confirmed by X-ray. Thank you, Dr. Melton, I said as we were leaving. Wait, did you change your last name? Please call me Sarah. We're friends now, the four of us. I insisted she not change her name for medical reasons, interjected Mac. Everyone around here knows her by that name. Anyway, sorry to give you more work today, I said. No worries, I love it, and I probably wouldn't have met my true love if I wasn't here, Sarah commented. You mean me, right? Asked Mac in a somewhat awkward moment. Yes, love, I mean you. The game was set for 2 p.m. the following day, and Mac dropped Joy and me at our apartment, this time both riding in the cab. Beats riding back in the bed, I said, and thanks for everything, Mac. We owe you our lives, Joy added. Nah, I only wish I could have been there sooner. Well, one thing's for sure. You and Sarah's new little one is going to get the best parents he or she can get, replied Joy. Wait, you knew about that? I asked. Of course, I'm besties with Sarah. You two need to talk more, suggested Mac. Yeah, I guess so. But I told you I'm a friggin' vault. I'll be in in a minute, honey, I told Joy as we parked in front of our apartment. Sure, I'll grab the boys from Vlad's and meet you at home. What's up? Mac asked me once she was out of earshot. Football, that's what's up. Oh, that. Well, ask me something. I did. I mean, what's up with you playing football against Ralph? I asked. I like football. Played tight end in high school back in Montana. Even traveled a bit just to be on the winning team. We were the Bozeman Billy Goats, he replied. The what? I asked, starting to laugh before my split lip told me not to. I know we always got hazed for it, but Billy Goats are tough ornery, and don't take any crap. Yeah, I know, I replied. I used to milk them, the females, of course. But the males were exactly that. It just sounds funny as all like the Loveland lovers, I continued, realizing it didn't quite make sense. So you like football. I get it. But this sounds more like a rivalry or even payback. Am I right? Something like that. Do you remember when you told me he must be around still for a reason neither of us would understand? Yes, I remember, I acknowledged. Well, now you are on the receiving end of his, I'll call it directions or orders if we think he has that kind of power still. Do you think he caused it, I asked, getting flushed before hearing the answer I already knew. Of course, nobody else knew you. They didn't know you from Adam, but get a group like that already agitated and ripe for manipulation. 
Then throw in a wannabe leader who has a grudge against you, and this is what you end up with. It started with a few insults, then a chant, I'm guessing, and then somebody threw something. Yeah, exactly. You saw that? No, Lance, I didn't see any of it. Neither did Corey or Lonnie. My point is that those things always start like that. It just takes fuel to keep burning. It doesn't happen randomly or by accident, but takes at least one person with an end goal in mind to get others riled up, pissed off, and then violent. By the time it's over, most of them don't even know what happened. You may not believe me, but a fair number of those, even the ones you said spit on you, threw something at you and your wife, or even punched or kicked you, a fair number of those are feeling guilty right now, wishing they had never been involved and ashamed of their behavior, especially in front of their kids. I'll have to take your word for it right now. I'm still pissed off about the whole thing. Did I tell you a little blonde-headed boy about my kid's age was the first to spit in my face? No, I hadn't heard that, but it's still the same. A scared young boy acting out in front of others he seeks approval from. I get it, I guess, I replied. But if I see that little turd, he's going over my knee, old-school spanking style. We both smiled at that. Ouch, that gonna hurt. I gotta stop hanging out with you, said Mac, grinning. Seriously, though, he continued, Sarah and I are happy you and your family are here. Your whole group, in fact, from Texas. There's not one of you lagging or not fitting in here, and it shows. Not just to Sarah and me, but to your dad, of course, as well as John, the council, and Samuel. I appreciate that. I really do. Joy as well. We're just trying to fit in, and it's been great so far. Well, until today. Anyway, tell me about the game. Okay. I love football. Ralph and I have unfinished business. He has to play to gain the respect he seeks from his old and maybe new followers. And I'm going to play any position that tackles his. By the end, we will have an understanding, and I will have taken a few pounds of flesh without just shooting him straight out. It's pretty much a win-win scenario. Yeah, I get it now, and I wouldn't miss it for anything. Should I bring my kids? I don't think so, he said. It could get graphic if he doesn't quit halfway through. Just me it is, I replied. Thank you for everything, Mac. I'm grateful for your friendship, and I'm not even upset that you caught the biggest fish out of the canal. Yeah, okay, me too. And as soon as the nightmares of being stuck underground, drowning, subside, we can have a fish off. Sounds like a plan, I said. See you tomorrow. The boys had seen Mom and Dad beat up a little, but never at the same time, and certainly not since we had arrived at Saddle Ranch. I didn't think about it ahead of time, but Joy did. She told me that there is a difference between getting beat up out on the road and not at home. I didn't see it, but the boys did, and it scared them. Everything it took to get here, the fire, the rattlesnake, getting lost in the desert, as bad as it was, didn't compare to an incident at home. They knew the great battle was coming. Everyone did. But after, there was a certain confidence that scary stuff was behind them. And maybe, just maybe, they could try being kids again playing soccer in the front yard, only concerned with the final score. Boys, let's talk, I announced, walking into the apartment. It's done, said Joy. All good. That quick, I asked. Yeah, when you know what to say. Hmm, you guys are good, I asked them. Yes, Daddy. I heard they broke your eye bone, said Jax. We didn't even know there was a bone in there. It's the orbital bone, and it surrounds the eye. Guess it happened when I fell. Mommy said you got punched in the eye, chimed in Hendrix. Yeah, I guess, but you should see the other guy. His fist is probably really sore right now, I replied. It's okay, Daddy, you're safe with us, said Hudson, hugging me. Ouch, the other side, please, I replied, adding, I guess I am. I was up early. Rib fractures mean you can't sleep on your side, either side. It's on the back only, and I wasn't used to it. The entire night was a game on my back, good but not familiar. Over to the right. Ouch. Nope. Left side. Same outcome. Back to the original position. I awoke with the sun, tired from tossing but not turning, an excitement I hadn't felt in a while. Part of me felt guilty because I wanted to see a man flat on his back after a big hit. But another part of me could justify it. Seeing the misery he caused those who followed him and having at least a suspected idea that he was the ringleader in my wife's attack. That's the part of me that made sure I was out front when Mac was supposed to pick me up at 1 p.m. sharp. You armed? asked Mac, straight-faced as I had ever seen him. No, I responded. Why? Because yesterday was a crap day for you and your wife. Some people after something like that get ideas, bad ideas. 
like coming back to the scene of the event and blasting away to get some kind of revenge. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I know. Saw it firsthand back at my home in McKinney when a guy challenged Jake to a fight. Unfortunately, an innocent girl was killed before it ended, and we couldn't stop it. I'm not armed and not seeking revenge. I know you said some might feel remorseful for what they did. I am not convinced, but it's water under the bridge either way. Joy and I are both alive and recovering, and that's good enough for me. Now, let's talk football. Okay, what do you want to see? I want him to quit in front of everyone. I want you to be the opposite of whatever position he plays and remind him of what he's done. Sorry, Lord. I'm a sinner, slightly vindictive, and a believer, I added, looking up. Me too, said Mac, pounding twice on the inside roof of the truck cab. Me too. We didn't have bleachers. Of course, this was the first sporting event ever held here, but a grassy slope on one side of the makeshift field gave each spectator an unobstructed view. Corey had extra security on all sides of the field, vowing to not have an incident like yesterday ever again on his watch. I sat in the front row, on grass, wondering if there would be more spitting, maybe a bottle or cheap shot punch in my already damaged midsection. Maybe more names like uppers popped into my mind, reminding me I had forgotten to ask Corey what that meant. I was a little nervous when a few people started pointing in my direction, and then a few more after that. I felt to my side for the weapon that wasn't there. Corey stood up as nearly 50 people slowly advanced towards us. That's far enough, he said, his guards now on all sides of the newly formed crowd of men, women, and children. One man, the one in the lead, raised his hands hostage style and asked if he could approach. Okay, just you, but no more, yelled back Corey now over the megaphone. I wasn't sure what to expect, but one man wasn't going to be a problem, I assumed, unless he's armed. I thought in the back of my mind. My name is Timothy, said a tall, blonde-headed man in his mid-thirties, I guessed, looking squarely at me. I was one of the men that accosted you and your wife yesterday, he added, turning my face red with anger. What we did was wrong, he continued. We all want to apologize, well, most of us, for our actions. We got carried away in the moment and made bad decisions, ones we would have never made before. Well, you know, before the lights went dark. However, that is not an excuse, he added, putting his hands behind his back. Take your revenge, he said, for all of us. Take it on me. I looked at Corey, not sure what was happening. I didn't remember this man specifically, but all the others were now sorry it happened. Okay, I said, using my left hand to stand. Striking you is going to hurt like hell because you guys busted my ribs. But fair is fair, right? Yes, sir. That's right he said, hands behind his back. I pulled back my left arm, balled into a fist, not my dominant hand, but opposite my cracked ribs side. He didn't flinch, didn't move or react at all, just waited for it. The crowd was deathly quiet, and even Corey didn't have anything to say. My hand unclenched and I placed it on his shoulder. It's okay, Timothy. We're okay, I added. Thank you for coming clean. It took a lot, I'm sure. One more thing, he said, motioning back to the group. The blonde-haired boy I would never forget, the face of the one who spit in my face, came sheepishly forward. You're the one, I said, trying not to sound scary, but also wanting this kid to start acting right. Yes, sir. I'm sorry for spitting on you. I've never done that before, honest. You can spit back on me right now if it helps any. Okay. Apology accepted, and no, I'm not going to spit on you. It's kind of gross, don't you think? The boy nodded his head in agreement before I continued. You're a brave young man to come up here. And you are not much older than my three boys. They would have gotten an earful at the very least if they did something like that. I did, sir. They both did, said an older gentleman, maybe 65 or 70 and hardened like a wrinkly piece of steel. Both my grandson Christian and my son Tim got what's needed to straighten up. Stretch is the name. And son, I'm truly sorry about what happened to you and your lady friend. Yes, my wife, I clarified. Yep, truly sorry I am. And as for the rest of them, well, most I guess are too. Thank you, Stretch. I'll pass that on to my lady friend. All right then, he said, turning to face the group. As he pointed, the rest of them all got on their knees. Not one, two, or even a few, but every man, woman, and child. I don't want anybody getting on their knees for me, I said matter-of-factly. They aren't, the old man replied. They are doing it for themselves. Repentance for bad behavior, let's call it. They don't seek your approval, just your forgiveness. You have it, 
all of you, I announced, feeling a weight lifted from my shoulders and wishing joy were here. It was strange, I thought, how close I felt to each of them after only minutes of conversation and actions. You did this, I whispered, looking to the sky. You brought me to a point so raw and physical so that I could have a new appreciation, a connection born out of blood, for your children here, moving forward. Then it was clear. The uppers meant exactly that. Those up the road, higher society, another side, the good side of the tracks. I get it now, but did you have to bust my ribs? Never mind. Corey stood on the makeshift field with his bullhorn and announced the teams to play. Each team would have 15 minutes to pick a captain and decide player positions. After one hour of continuous play, the winning team, including whatever substitutions, would get a pizza party for each player and their immediate family, courtesy of Chef Rico and Chef Patty from Saddle Ranch. Chapter 11. Corey Camp, Loveland, Colorado. Mac was chosen captain of his team. He made sure of it, giving him the power to assign positions. It was no surprise that Ralph had been chosen to lead his team. 50 bucks says Ralph designates himself quarterback, I said to Lonnie, who was back for the game as well. No way, man. First, it's the highest profile position, so of course he's going to pick it. Plus, your $50 ain't worth squat anymore. All right, $50 hairs, I replied laughing. Remembering we did that as kids, never concerned with paying up another boy with actual dollars. What position are you going to play, Mac? Asked one of his teammates after the basics had been given. I'll know soon, he replied. <laughs> Wait a minute, he said, looking across the field at Ralph warming up, throwing crude passes. Okay, that's me. I'm defensive end, he said with a smile. There we go, I told Lonnie, looking across the field at the first lineup. As they asked to be called, Team Ralph won the toss which was just fine with Mac and his team, the Grizzlies. After the huddle, they spread out on the line. No pads, no helmets, full contact tackle football. Not the boxing the colonel had set across the country, but the next best thing, American football. Set hut, 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 said Ralph, bobbling the ball out of the gate from his center. Of course, Mac wanted to win for his team, but that was secondary to hitting Ralph every play. Ralph went back less than gracefully running side to side, looking for an open man. Mac, timing the play perfectly, slipped past his man, only turning slightly, gaining a straight-on shot at the quarterback from the left side. Ralph didn't see it coming until the last second when Mac hit him square on the hips, driving him backward five feet and onto his back. That's one, said Mac, jumping up with some adrenaline pumping now. Bomb, yelled Lonnie. That's gotta hurt, he added, getting the attention of many in the crowd. I was hoping not to draw any more attention to us for the rest of the game. What do you say, Lonnie? Can't promise nothing, son. It's just how we do things around these parts, he said in a hideous mix of more than a few dialects and accents. What are you, a valley girl, cowboy, Spanish-speaking, redneck from Pittsburgh? Lonnie spit out his drink without warning, spraying a few innocent people sitting in front of us. Oh, shh. I mean, I'm sorry, folks. That was not my fault. This guy... He paused maybe remembering that most in attendance took ownership of what they had done not more than 20 minutes ago. What I mean is, it was my fault, and I am sorry, he announced, looking back to the game, as if it never happened. Ralph, slow to get up, was already getting looks from his team and whispers from others in attendance. Second down and a loss of six yards, Ralph took the snap, tripped, or so it may seem, and fell on the ball. Third down with a loss of about two yards, looks like third and eight, let's call it. Lonnie stated, loud enough for most to hear. Third down and eight, the announcer repeated, the one Corey had handpicked only a day ago and lent his megaphone. See what I'm saying? Said Lonnie. Third and eight, just like I said, pretending to nudge me in the ribs. I should have been their announcer today. You should have, I agreed. Then you would have the same number of people looking at you, I joked, waving my arm towards the 200 or so people paying attention to Lonnie. You're like that one drunk guy, always at the game, and everyone watches to see if he's going to trip, get arrested, punched in the mouth, or spill his beer. You, my friend, are that guy. I'll take that as a compliment, Lonnie replied, before completing his sentence with smartass, as he did more often with me recently. Hey, that ball placement is off, said Lonnie, standing and pointing, but thankfully a little quieter. It's just a guess, replied Corey. We don't even have a real field and nothing like chains, he added in his defense. 
Sorry, I get it, replied Lonnie, adding, It's just a game anyway. Don't let him fool you, Corey, I said aloud. Lonnie is the mild-mannered cop running around like a hamster on a wheel, just spinning along, not a care in the world, drinking his free coffee and stuffing his mouth with whatever the hot dog vendor is giving away that day. Until, until, I said again, already feeling my ribs about to catch on fire from laughing. Until he gets home and turns on the game, then he's an armchair warrior with a PhD in sports. Not just football, I'm talking all the basics, base and basket, but also cricket, soccer, bobsledding, curling, pole vaulting. I can't forget that one. And least but not last, that shuffleboard game in nursing homes. After all that, it doesn't even matter who's winning. He gets angry like that incredible Hulk guy and finally turns into a bull in a dishware shop. Dishware shop, asked Lonnie. Dishware shop, he repeated, putting his hands in the air and drawing eyes again. See, everyone knows the saying goes like the bull running yada, yada in a china shop. I know this, I argued. I'm trying not to say the C word, that's all. Can we get back to the game now? You two bicker like old farts, said Corey. We know, we both replied casually. Set, hut, 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 Ralph called again, this time getting rid of the ball as fast as he could down the field in no one's general direction. Mac, already in motion, hit him square in the chest, driving him into the ground with a thud. Oh, the audience rumbled. Now that was a hit. Late, but a hit for sure, said a man right behind me. Never call the same play twice. And the count, that wasn't even different, Mac said to his downed man before offering to help Ralph up but he refused. We have a flag on the play, the announcer called over the megaphone. Several men coaches, I thought, discussed something with the referees. Number, well, I mean, let me see, he said, fumbling down the list of names. We have a penalty on Mac of the Grizzlies for roughing the passer, 15 yards, and it's a first down. This guy wasn't as good as I was used to hearing on TV, I thought, but he probably had no proper experience. And in his defense, I understood what he was calling and doing. Not a half bad job. Plus, nobody had numbers on their shirts. Hey. You could do better than that, Lonnie, I asked, immediately wondering why I broke the silence. He responded immediately with a paragraph or two of the many reasons he was more qualified for the job. Hmm, yeah, it makes sense. I don't know, could be, not sure, maybe on Mars. Highly unlikely with the humidity today, I said at random times throughout the monologue, finally getting a forget it from Lonnie. First down, Sarah screamed from behind me, getting both my and Mac's attention. I shook my head back and forth, smiling as I could see Joy sitting next to her on the grass, maybe 20 feet behind us. I guess they missed that last hit, I said to Lonnie, getting a, yep, for sure reply, signaling to Corey that yes, he and I were fine, just joking around. I thought you weren't coming, I said to Joy after moving back a few rows. Today could have been dangerous. We heard what happened when you got here, and Sarah offered to pick me up on the way. Aiden and Kat are watching the boys, so don't worry. No worries. I'm just surprised to see you here is all. Enjoy the game, ladies. Oh, we will, they both replied. Ralph squandered the next three plays, mostly avoiding another hit. The Grizzlies returned the punt for a 40-yard gain and scored a touchdown with a pass to the right from the Team Ralph 20-yard line. The score was 6-0 as officials designated that only touchdowns would earn points. Therefore, field goals and extra points were not worth trying to officiate with no uprights. Ralph took the ball and got rid of it as fast as he could, figuring it would save a tackle at least. Mack balanced his game with equal plays to penalties for late hits on the quarterback. If it came down to it, he would win for his team so they could get the prize. But as long as they were ahead, his nemesis was fair game. Mack hit Ralph every chance he got and hard. The man got up more slowly each time, but he never stayed down. It's strange, Mac would tell me later, when you get a kind of respect for a total crap bag of a guy just because he refuses to quit with his ex-wife Patty, making half the pizzas for the winning team. I would possibly be saving him from a Ralph special, poison pizza, on behalf of his ex, who had her son kidnapped by him last year. Hit after hit after hit. I was surprised myself that the man kept getting up. No helmet, no pads, not even turf, but hard, cracked Colorado dirt. He got up time after time, until he didn't. Chapter 12, Corey Camp, Loveland, Colorado. After five minutes of evaluation, the medical team carried him off the field on a classic stretcher, 
minus the golf cart looking machine. Mac had a pit in his stomach. Had he taught this man a lesson or just made him a living martyr to be followed into eternity? Only time would tell, and I was thinking the same thing. That bastard was tough as nails, and it's the last thing I wanted to see. The commotion was so quick I almost missed it on the far end of the field. A dash, some shouting, and the light reflecting off the ten-inch blade thrust deeply into Ralph's chest while on the gurney. Not the stomach shots to a man with nine lives or punishing blows of a couple who lost their son, and not even the hit after hit on the field could slow Ralph down. But this was life-changing for him and those who knew him. The man responsible wasn't hard to find. He didn't try to hide, instead standing proudly at the scene, pulling the long bowie knife out in a precise reverse of the insertion, as if he had done it a dozen times before. Stretch borrowed the megaphone from the announcer, who was happy to oblige after what he had just witnessed. Sorry, folks, said Stretch, as if he were announcing a short delay in a NASCAR race due to weather. Sorry, folks, he repeated. Some men just need killing is all. Enjoy the rest of your game. Oh, crap! Are you kidding me? I said, turning to where Corey had been only two seconds before. He just took off down there, said Lonnie, pointing to Corey running across the field towards the assailant whose hands were by his side. That was crazy, Lonnie said. Do you really think he's dead? Yeah, in a regular world for sure. I mean, no doubt. But now, after everything he survived, I need to see it in person. Not like that Osama crap. Oh, we dumped him in the ocean so nobody can ever find him again. We did it to keep him from being a martyr. Not like that. I want to look him in the eyes and decide for myself. I am not a vengeful man, but if any man needed killing, he's the one. Forgive me, Lord. I didn't do it, but I'm not sad either. Same, brother, replied Lonnie. With Mac and Sarah, Joy and I made our way back to the medical tent after the game. The contest was called immediately after the incident, with the score of the Grizzlies 36-6 to over Team Ralph. I had to see firsthand, and I knew Mac did as well. Joy and Sarah didn't skip a beat, and both had their reasons to bear witness. Upon inspection, there was no doubt this man, who I had told Mac not long ago was meant for something else, was no more. Stretch had done it, and there was no investigation needed into the motive. Corey alone would now have the final say as to the attacker's punishment and the group's next steps. It was nearly a week before we heard from Corey again. Our work is not complete, he said. I still need an evaluation of the camp as a whole. And since Ralph has left, it seems most, if not all, are open to a new way of doing things for the collective benefit of all involved. Joy and I wanted to come back and finish what we started. Lonnie tagged along and we agreed to stick together. You carrying? I asked him. Yep, same as always. You? Oh yeah, I said, laughing and holding my ribs. I'm not about to let that happen again. Corey assured us that things had changed, but I had my doubts and didn't opt to carry my rifle, but kept a pistol clearly visible to all, and an ankle piece as backup. Joy had a snub nose .38 in her handbag, and it was clear to us all she wouldn't be a victim a second time. What's this? I asked Corey as he handed us each a name tag and a Sharpie pen. Something new I'm trying. Everyone has them, even me, he added, writing one out and sticking it on his shirt. El Jefe! I like it, I said. You know what that means, Lonnie? Yeah, man, I'm Hispanic, genuine Mexicano. Remember, I actually speak Spanish and don't just put an O on the end of every word. Taco, burrito, muchacho, gato, pero. Exactly my point, I replied. It works most of the time, don't you think? Mambo, delicioso, bueno, necesito. I could go on all day. No, senor, I don't think so, senorita, he added, tipping his baseball cap to joy before continuing with, por favor, Panalones, zapatos, enchiladas, cervezas, tequila, and about 80,000 more. El baño, I added quickly, like pushing the buzzer on a TV trivia show. Hard to forget that one. Lonnie shook his head. I think you got them all, Graringo. I said that, didn't I? Are we done here, guys? Asked Joy. I mean, I'd like to go home at some point today, so let's get this done. And Corey, we're not staying over tonight or any other. Yeah, me too, chimed in Lonnie. Hey, Mac, said Corey as he pulled up on his four-wheeler. Sorry I'm late, guys. I had a thing with the council about the incident last week. Which part, asked Joy. The sticky part, he added. Where to bury the dead. N -n -n there are chapters all over the country now, I interjected. Don't they have a plan for this? I mean, people die, it's a thing. Yes, they do, said Mac. But we here are unique. What do you mean, asked Joy. 
I mean, every other chapter, every one of them, is located in a town with a graveyard or a cemetery for everyone, said Mac. And I just learned there's a distinction between the two. Apparently, a graveyard is on church grounds, and a cemetery is not. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. The problem is that some in the ranch community don't want someone like Ralph buried in the cemetery that has been historically for residents. Right now, he's buried behind this camp, temporarily, I guess, but we need to make it permanent. One thing is clear. He's not going up the road, and, and, he said again, Joshua, Ralph's son, wants to pay his respects. I know it sounds crazy since Ralph treated him and his mother so badly and even kidnapped Joshua, but he's asking, and I want to do it for him. I get it, replied Corey. Give us a couple of days and then bring him and his mother down, and we will do some kind of small service. I can assure you she won't be coming, but she wants me to bring him, so that's what I'll do. Name tag, said Corey, handing one to Mac. I don't do tags, he replied, crumpling it in his hand. Come on, Mac, said Corey. Everybody's doing it. Sounds like fun, right? Seriously, though, can you please wear one just for today? El Jefe, huh? Said Mac, looking at Corey's with a smile. Okay, just write me out a new one. El Jefe's Jefe. Here you go, boss, said Corey, handing him the tag with Mac Truck, written in big letters. Everyone here says you hit like a Mac Truck the other day at the game. All right, I can live with that, he replied, sticking it to his western shirt's front pocket. Mac, forever in boots and a western shirt, is part of what drew Sarah to him initially. I've arranged for security to be present as we tour the facility, but something tells me we don't really need them, Corey said, pointing to the pistol on my hip. Agreed, I responded, and this is just the one you can see. For the record, Lance and Joy, I am truly sorry about what happened to you here. It's not your fault, Corey, Joy said. Yes, ma'am, it is. Every bit of it. I run this place, and the buck has to stop with me. But unfortunately, I underestimated those I am tasked with leading, which could have killed you. And for that, I'm truly sorry. Thank you for that, Corey, I said, putting an arm around him and Joy and almost hiding my painful groan. Where do we start, I added. Right this way, he replied, with both of us ready to move on. It had only been a few days, but it felt different being here. The air was heavy like before, and the faces of the women, men, and children could have been those in any U.S. town in the country before the day. The stress was always there. Finances, commuting, soul-sucking corporate jobs replaced by fear of the unknown, captivity, and the secrets that hid in the darkness. Most who recognized Joy and me lowered their heads and looked away. But a few approached cautiously, begging our forgiveness for what happened. Not a lifetime ago, two years, or even a few months, but mere days before. It was becoming clear that they all felt it, or most at least, but many were too shy or ashamed to approach us. When the chanting did start, it was different this time. I couldn't pick it up at first and was immediately on the defensive, resting my hand on the butt of my pistol. As it grew, Joy and I looked at each other, smiling. Mac truck, Mac truck, Mac truck, they said over and over, hands in the air void of bottles and anything else they may have thrown before. I'm pretty sure you are the most famous football player post-apocalypse in the entire country, I called out to Mac. My autograph hand is still a bit sore from all the tackles, he boasted. But I'll manage, he added with a pen-holding gesture. You see now, asked Corey, they are coming around. It just took getting rid of a guy like Ralph. There are a few more I'm keeping an eye on, but after what happened, even these guys are toning things down. I walk slower than usual due to my continued rib pains, but carried a notebook writing down observations, and any ideas I had for the community. We paused at the very site Joy and I were attacked, as if it were a lifetime ago, as a soldier near his end days returning to the beaches of Normandy, returning to a place they could have just as easily never come home from. A dark red stain just underfoot reminded me how raw the attack was. The blood was mine, or that of my best friend and spouse, and I subtly kicked dirt over the last reminder of the bad memory. A recurring theme popped up everywhere I looked, and I took advantage of the opportunity to speak with those who approached joy in me. The path forward had been paved in blood, but would continue with hard work and discipline, not the kind that is forced upon a person, but the other kind, from the inside out. Two hours after we ate lunch with the residents, Corey called it. Okay, that's it, unless you need to come back tomorrow. Not me, I said, with joy agreeing with I'm good. Lonnie replied, yeah, me too, chiming in with Mac. Yeah. 
Give me until tomorrow, Corey, and let me work through a few of my notes. Then I can give you my opinion, at least, I offered. Sounds fair. Let's all get together tomorrow at the ranch for lunch, if that works, suggested Corey. I'll bring my boy Cameron along as well so he can hear it firsthand. I forgot to ask about Stretch, I told Joy later in the afternoon. I didn't see him, did you? No, but there was one trailer with a couple of guards hanging out in front. Maybe he's in there. Who knows? How are you, Mommy and Daddy? The boys asked. I had forgotten they could be scared of us going back to the same place we got our OEs, as they called them. Our parenting style was a bit different from most. I assumed that, since we had a policy of always answering their questions honestly, barring only a few they were too young to hear about, this was no exception. We got hurt and returned to the scene to try and make things right. Did you kick them in the knee? Asked Hudson. Put them in a headlock like the Hulk does? Asked Jax. I don't think the Hulk has done that in quite a while, son. But no, they apologized and we accepted it. So now we're trying to help them live better. Does that make sense, guys? Kind of, replied Hendricks with a confused look. Okay, it's like this. When somebody does something bad to you, it doesn't always mean you should do something bad back. Do you understand? They all nodded their heads in agreement. Daddy? Yes, Hudson. What if they had hurt you and Mommy again this time? Then I would have kicked them right in the knee and put the Hulk headlock on them, I said, pretending to put him in one. He giggled, and that was it. A life lesson in a few minutes, right or wrong. We met the following day at lunch in a semi-private room downstairs in the pavilion. John, Bill, Samuel, and a few of the council were present, as each of us from yesterday presented our observations to Corey. Everyone agreed I should start, since I was the only one with a notebook yesterday and they would fill in any gaps or present alternative ideas if needed. We have about 45 minutes, said John, once we had already gone through the buffet line. Let's call this a working lunch, he added, taking a bite of his salad as I stood in front of the group. Okay, I started. Thanks for being here on short notice, everyone. I guess I'll just present my observations and maybe a few suggestions moving forward. I'm sure most or all of you heard about the incident with Joy and me the other day. Most nodded. Anyway, that's water under the bridge, as they say. I'm hoping it was an isolated incident by scared people whipped into a frenzy by a man we all know is or was an instigator the entire time he has resided in this valley. It created a mob mentality that is not unlike peaceful protests turning into full-on riots before the day. Mostly good people doing things they would never do alone. He's gone now, as we all know. I keep forgetting to ask what happened to Stretch, I added, looking at Corey. I won't interrupt, but we can discuss it after, he replied. Okay, so the four of us, Joy and myself, Mac and Lonnie, spent a day observing with Corey. The first thing I noticed is that most people seem bored, to be blunt. They are wandering around camp without a purpose. In the former camp, they were separated from their families and had to work at whatever jobs they were told to, regardless of skill or desires. Here at Saddle Ranch in the West, we did interviews from the very beginning and picked new residents based on skills and how those fit into what we were lacking, such as medical, security, farming, construction, what have you. Talking to a few residents there yesterday, I learned some interesting things. I took notes on it. Just a second, I said, flipping back two pages and feeling nervous, like a child introducing themselves on the first day at a new school. Susan, for example, or Susie, as she likes to be called, was a paralegal in her old life. Maybe she could help out the retired judge, or maybe not, I don't know. But her hobby for the past 20 years has been sewing. She loves mending old clothes and bringing them back to life. We have a lot of kids running around the entire valley, and I'm thinking patches on jeans will be making a comeback. Did you know that about Susie? I asked Corey. Not trying to put you on the spot, though. No, this is good. I don't even know someone by that name, let alone her skill set that will surely be needed now. Another man is Rick, I continued. Ironically responsible for the split on my lip, he confessed. He's a gruff guy, a former contractor that built single-family homes in Denver. He punches like a gladiator, I added, moving my jaw side to side. But I think he's a good guy that made a mistake. The point is... Susie and Rick are just wandering around with nothing to do. Meanwhile, their talents could prove invaluable to the group. Right now, the sense of pride that comes with accomplishment is gone. Not lost, but temporarily unutilized. Does that make sense? All in attendance shook their heads in agreement, with John adding, It makes perfect sense and precisely what we did here right from the start. Please continue. 
So my recommendation would be to interview every man, woman, and child and see what skills and desires we are working with. Then have key people train others in areas such as construction, farming, raising livestock, laundry, and even digging latrines. It all has to get done. And pardon my French, but nobody wants to do the shit. Well, nobody wants to work latrines every day. So every adult takes an hour or two shift once a week on jobs nobody wants to do. And the rest of the time, they excel at what they are good at. I also didn't meet but heard there were at least two teachers there somewhere. The kids need structure, just as we do up here. I know it sounds like all roses and sunshine, but I hear there are still a few troublemakers, and they will need to be dealt with before they spoil the apple cart, as Ralph did. Lastly, I believe if they are working together and building a community they can be proud of, we won't have an us-and-them mentality. Maybe down the road, we could be just one valley full of hard-working, honest people who want a better life for their families. Joy and I came up with these ideas together. Do you have anything to add? Yes, Joy commented. I think you addressed almost everything. Just one more idea for them. Sports. Maybe not the full-tackle football Mac popularized, but flag football, soccer, softball, croquet, whatever. Just something they can do together that is competitive and fun, and they can build relationships in the process. And lastly, structure. A work week with weekends off, church on Sunday, just like before. We have some TVs up here that work. Let's give them one. The colonel already supplied them with generators, so a family-friendly movie night every Friday, at least until we run out of titles. Okay, that's it for us. I like that, said Bill, with both John and Samuel nodding in agreement. I like all of it, added John. Second that, or third that, I guess, said Samuel, smiling. Lonnie and Mac continued for the next 20 minutes with ideas for picking prominent camp leaders, not unlike the council here. John, Samuel, and Bill chimed in and added the final touches to a well-rounded plan. Thanks, everyone. I think this will help, said Corey. And Cameron here will help get it implemented. But we could use some help at the start if anyone is volunteering. We'd be happy to help. Right, Lance? Said Joy. Sure, unless you have something else I need to do right now, Mac. I can spare you both for a little while. We are okay on security here now, and once Corey has his security detail up and running, they can rotate in and out with our northern and southern perimeter camps, giving our and Samuel's members a well-deserved break. I can send Drake down there for a bit as well, if I can get him separated from his new girlfriend. Actually, maybe I'll send both of them down. He is good at observation, especially when it comes to security. Whitney managed to get here alone, all the way from Loveland on foot, and then stay undetected when Ralph took over her family's home up on the mountain. Is she still up with her grandparents? asked John. No, sir, replied Mac. She moved into Drake's place a few weeks back. According to her grandfather, I hear marriage bells are ringing loud. She has been helping out in the kitchen and housekeeping, but we can pull her away for a week if that helps. Sure, we would appreciate that, replied Corey. Let me run it by them first, but I'm sure they would be happy to help. Plus, she loves playing games with kids, so she may be useful in getting some programs together for them, said Mac. As for Stretch, said Corey, the man who killed Ralph, for anyone that may not know, I'm not sure yet what the answer is. He is confined to a trailer for now, with round-the-clock security. I've spoken with him more than once in the past couple of days, and I'm more convinced each time that he could assimilate back into the group and not cause any more problems. The issue, of course, is that even though some of us could have killed Ralph, we didn't. That's where I'm stuck on this. Okay, it's your call, said John, but we will see if we can come up with any options. Thank you, sir, replied Corey. Chapter 13, Dolan, Saddle Ranch, Loveland, Colorado. Joy and I met up with Drake and Whitney the following day. They were more than happy to lend a hand. We split up, with Corey putting a security detail with each group and not taking no for an answer. Drake and I got partnered for security protocol review. He told me the story of he and Mac's start after the lights went out, making me think of Stretch and if he could come back around also. Drake spoke of his dad, mom, and brother, and felt like an outcast and alone after they were gone. He's lost so much, I thought, yet didn't fault Mac for any part. Instead, he was grateful to be a part of a community even if still living off the property. We want a family, Whitney and me, he said. I ain't as smart as her. That's easy to figure, but still, she wants to be with me, and that makes me the happiest man I know. Plus, I've been liking her since I was just a kid. 
Funny how some bad stuff sometimes brings good stuff behind it. Know what I mean? Yeah, Drake, I do. We had some bad stuff happen to get here from Texas, and good stuff followed right behind it. The hard part is seeing it before it's right in front of you. Do you have an idea of what we're supposed to be doing? Asked Drake. Yes. Assess security, find the holes, and plug them. There's not as much traffic at our borders as last year, but there's still some nearly every day. I gained some expertise on the road here from Texas, as all in my group did, so I'm somewhat familiar with the threat directly in front of us. But you are the thief in the night. I ain't no thief, Lance. Ask anyone. No, I didn't mean that, Drake. It was a bad choice of words. I'm just saying you're good at moving undetected. Not a thief, but like a ninja in the night. Moving around at will with nobody seeing you. Oh yeah, I get it. Sorry about that. I done thought you were saying something else. So, you want me to sneak around and see what I can find, undetected? If you want. I'm not your boss. But I bet Corey would find it helpful to see any cracks in the perimeter security. Especially on this south side. Sure thing, I can do that. It's what I'm good at. Plus, I like it. That's what I heard, I replied. Joy and Whitney got plans ready for the kids, age 3, 16, tracking down three former teachers, two active before the day and one retired, but eager to get back to work. The new tent school would start in three days after John donated half a library of books from the ranch. I want to be involved, Joy told me that night. Involved in what, I asked. Down the road at the camp. I want to be involved with the children. I want us involved in the community. Whoa, hold on a minute. Let's talk about this. Giving some suggestions and pointing out some improvements is a far cry from what I think you're saying. We barely got out of there alive a week ago, and now you want to move down there. I didn't say that, at least not at first. I talked to a few of the women that were with Ralph on the mountain. Did they tell you about the satanic rituals when the kids were out of the house? I asked. Yes, they did. The women told me they were pressured, threatened, and drugged. Ralph and his goons would make them drink some special tea an hour before and force them to dress up in costumes. They played along because those who didn't were punished or banished into the woods. They had nowhere to go, and we both know they were not invited into this valley with that stigma hanging over their heads. I understand what you're thinking, but I'm not sure I believe them, I replied. Okay, I was prepared for that, and I felt the same way before today, Joy continued. But think about it. What are the odds that soon after the power goes out, Ralph just so happens to put together a random group of women and children who all happen to be Satan-worshipping deviants? Okay, but Drake saw them, I argued. Yes, he did, Joy pressed. He saw them doing what they had to in order to protect their children. They were doing what they had to because they were forced, threatened, and scared for their lives. Would you blame a woman who was being trafficked? Of course not, I said without a thought. Exactly my point, she replied. Besides, what are you doing here? I mean, Mac is great and a good leader, just like you were, coming here across half of the United States in the most hostile environment on our soil since the Civil War. But, I replied, but you're not needed in that role anymore, so you help out here and there, and so do I. But I'm not making the difference I want to, and I don't think you are either. Uh, I sighed, realizing she was probably right, adding, I'll be back in a little bit as I headed towards the door. Are you mad, honey? She asked. No, I'm not mad at all. I just need to think through a few things is all. Love you, I called, walking out the door. I wanted to talk to everyone, including Aiden, Kat, Shane, Chris, and the others we came here with, but that would have to wait. Grabbing Lonnie, we knocked on Vlad's door, asking if he could come out for a quick drink for old time's sake. I brought the scotch, I said, holding up the bottle before cringing with the pain in my side. Hurts that much, huh? Asked Lonnie. Nah, only when I move my arms, I replied, trying not to laugh. However, I'm pretty sure I remember Dr. Melton telling me a scotch or three wouldn't hurt. I think it was recommended even. Yeah, right, said Vlad. Now, if she had prescribed vodka, I would believe you. Anyway, I wanted to discuss something with you guys first, before talking to anyone else, I continued, pouring us each a drink. Nostrovia, said Vlad, raising his glass. Nostrovia, I asked. <laughs> It's an English word for those who can't pronounce the Russian word for cheers. Na, N-A. Then a new word starting with a Z, Zedorovia. Yeah, that seems much tougher, Lonnie agreed. Nostrovia, he said in a horrible Russian accent that had Vlad laughing out loud. I tried it without the accent, and we clinked the glasses before our big talk. I started with Lonnie because the rest wouldn't matter if Joy was wrong. 
He knew the story of the rituals as well as me, and I had never thought to ask his expert opinion on it. After all, a big part of his former job was deciding if people were telling the truth, stretching or fabricating some of the truth, or outright lying. I've thought about the rituals on the mountain, I began. Even talked to Mike about it before he left and we agreed the story didn't sit right. The odds of all those people, especially the women with children in the home, voluntarily taking part in satanic rituals when most were strangers before the lights went out, well, just say I would rather bet on the Cowboys to win the next Super Bowl. It would have happened, the football, I mean. A few more years and Jerry would have had it. Maybe even back-to-back -back wins, like 1977 and 1978. He was dialing it in. And you know this man, replied Lonnie. Yeah, I agree. And we were getting closer for sure. I related what Joy had told me from her conversations earlier today, and Lonnie agreed it was more than plausible, and even likely what happened. Okay, that brings me straight to the next part for both of you, and maybe the others we came with. I'm not saying we were outsiders, but we did abruptly join a group that was already functioning just fine. Now each of us, leaders in our own right, are floating somewhere in the middle of things. Something has been missing since we got here. I felt it but couldn't nail it down. And Joy nailed it on the head today. I guess it comes down to purpose. What are we going to do here moving forward? What are we building towards? I know we promised you an easy life in the mountains, Vlad, but are you happy? Are you fulfilled? Ah, yes. Fulfillment and happiness are two separate animals, my friend, replied Vlad, holding out his glass for a refill. Yes, I'm happy as I have ever been since losing my Maria. I found love again, and I never thought I would. Nor did I expect to love a boy more than myself, and I have that too. But fulfillment, that's a different wolf. I had it back in Plano with my gun store. I built it, we did, from the ground up, day after day, growing, sweating, and praying for success. When we had it right where we wanted, I felt pride, ownership, and accomplishment, no matter how it ended up. So yes, Lance, I see your point. And no, I am no longer satisfied with my purpose beyond Anna and our son, Javi and being here with all of you, of course. Sure, I get it, I replied. How about you, Lonnie, I asked, topping off his and my glass. The same, I guess. To be honest, I was a little jealous of Mike heading out into the unknown to change the world, but I also wouldn't trade my family for anything on Earth. So yes, I'm up for something new, if that's what you're suggesting. Okay, I haven't told Joy I was going to come talk to you guys. Or the Scotch, right? Asked Vlad. Yeah, that too, I laughed. But considering the topic, I don't think she will mind all that much. To be clear, gentlemen, with Corey's permission and the blessing of those in charge here, of course, we are talking about building up the others into a solid self-functioning group. This group will provide value to our new country, as opposed to a bunch of people just numbly passing the time in a FEMA camp, counting the days until the end. There are still a few troublemakers that will need to be dealt with, but I believe that most of them, even the ones Joy and I scuffled with, are good people. I would propose we live here and work there for a while and see how it goes. At the end, who knows? This whole valley may become one and function like a well-oiled machine for the betterment of all here. You were right, I said to Joy softly. Who did you talk to? Who said I talked to anyone? I replied. Well, you never drink alone. And not all of your friends like Scotch, so I'm guessing Vlad, Lonnie, Aiden, Shane, and maybe Mac. Good guess, I said, laughing, and with a sheepish grin pulled the bottle from behind my back. Just Lonnie and Vlad so far, but Lonnie says you're spot on about the ritual thing, so I guess they are all right in my book. Let's talk to Aiden, Kat, Shane, Chris, and Anna, and see if they want to get involved. Then whoever is in, we can make plans to pitch the idea to my dad, John, Samuel, and the council. But only after talking to Corey first, I don't want him to feel blindsided. What about the boys, asked Joy. They should be involved too, all our kids, at least those that traveled here with us. Also, I think our vet doc could float between the two locations, looking after all the livestock as needed. I was up early the next morning with Joy. I was excited to see what the end of the day would look like. We vowed to speak with everyone in our travel group today, get hard yeses or nos, and then Corey would be next tomorrow. Mac told Joy and me to take a few days off, so it worked out for us. And Lord knows neither of us wanted to sit around nursing our wounds. We each had a follow-up today with Dr. Melton, but that would prove to be quick and routine. 
By mid-afternoon, we had spoken with everyone, and to my surprise, not one person thought it was a bad idea or chose not to participate. Vlad was excited, as was Anna, and they both told Joy and me to talk with Corey today so they wouldn't have to wonder another night if it was possible. We gathered our boys and told them of the possibility. They were all excited and asked a million questions, most having to be answered hypothetically. I know what we can do to make the kids down there happy, said Hudson. What's that, son? We can give them Ringo so they can have a pet like we do. Plus, we still have Minnie, added Hendricks. That's not possible, I replied. They don't allow pets there. It's a policy. They don't hear either. I asked the other kids, said Hudson, but we brought two. Joy looked at me with a, how are you going to answer that questioning gaze? Here's the deal, guys, I continued. The camp doesn't allow it because if everyone had a pet, they would be running wild all over the place. They don't all have to have a pet. They all could have just one to share, Jax argued. I thought you guys loved Ringo. We do, Daddy, said Hudson. That's why we should let him live down the road. We could still see him during the day. Ugh, I said, putting my hands to my face. You're killing me, Smalls. You know that, right? But you're not wrong. No guarantees. And it probably can't happen. But I'll talk to Corey about it. Vlad and Anna gratefully took watch of our boys, and Javi loved having his stepbrothers, as we called them, around. The four-wheelers we brought were passed around between our group, with Mac knowing he could borrow one or both of them at any time if needed for ranch security. Joy and I took one today and headed down to hopefully get a meeting, unannounced, with Corey. Hey guys, said Cameron. I wasn't expecting you today. I know, replied Joy. Are you doing all right? Oh, sure. I kind of miss everyone up the road, but I've made a few friends my age down here, so it's not so bad. Any girls you have your eye on, I asked, as only another guy would do. Maybe one or two, he replied, turning red before Joy shushed me. Other than that, you like it, asked Joy. Yes, other than that. I miss my dog. He ran off when everything started. We looked for a few days but couldn't find him. It doesn't matter. I guess residents here can't have pets on the order of the colonel himself. I guess it just gets too crazy, I'm told. Besides that, I really like it here, except for what happened to you two. That's water under the bridge, Cameron, said Joy. Is your dad around? Oh, sure, I'll go find him, he said. Hang tight. Chapter 14. Corey Camp, Loveland, Colorado. I scanned the camp from my vantage point, making a point not to veer far from joy and packing the same as last time. I forgave those who would harm us for their actions, but I have a long memory and it would be a while, I thought, before I felt comfortable here again. Most milled about camp aimlessly from what I could tell, but a few, I guessed, kept an eye out, not just as a few men talking, but scheming more likely. They pointed at people passing by, sometimes laughing and other times catcalling the women. They caught me staring, and two of them raised their arms in a come-here-challenge-type pose. I stayed put, but didn't avert their gaze. You don't scare me, boys, I said aloud, but too far away for them to hear. I recognized one of them as an instigator the other day, and was pretty sure I could attribute my orbital bone fracture to his hand. Let's not try this today, said Corey, walking up behind me, giving me a start. The men pointed to us, laughing and hollering. You want to shoot them, don't you? asked Corey. No, I do not. Well, maybe that one that sucker punched me in the eye. Can I? I asked, joking. Not today, he replied. I Corey invited us to a private trailer to talk over afternoon coffee. Did you know our government has been buying up survival food and gear of all kinds, including coffee for the past 20 years? asked Corey. Yes, I heard. Those plus bullets, I replied. Nah. Well, I don't have much use for bullets down here, but the coffee is a game changer. Everyone, adults that is, get some every day if they want. So, what brings you two down this afternoon? I'll start, said Joy, giving me some sense of relief. After all, it was her vision and I was more of a network guy at this point, putting this person with that one and filling in the gaps to make her goal a reality, however long it took. I'd never been more proud of her than right now, watching her in her element, presenting an idea larger than life itself, along with the nuts and bolts to hold it all together. This is from a woman savagely attacked by the same people only days earlier. This is what it's all about. It hit me like turning a light switch on and my mind wandered to before the day going to church. I remember our pastor saying this is where we gather once a week but the serving is done outside of this building. 
The serving is what you do Monday through Saturday that God himself wants to see, and she was doing it. She was aiming to give her life in service to people who had betrayed her, not years ago or even months ago, but mere days ago. So fresh are the wounds that we still change out the bandage on the back of her head several times a day. No, she wasn't Jesus Christ himself, but it was clear to me she was working for him, with him, and in his name. Forgive those who have trespassed against you and bring them to me, I thought, realizing I didn't know the verse or verses as I should, but the idea, the principle, was here right now. I saw it in her face, heard it in her tone, as I snapped back into the conversation, hoping neither of them noticed I was gone for a minute or two. Corey was as happy and excited as she was by the end of it. I've been praying, both Cameron and me, that something like this could happen here. We just didn't know how. Mysterious ways, he added, before getting down to a few of the particulars and the hierarchy of command. We proposed that we would be volunteers, at least to start, and see how it went. Corey was in charge and nothing would change there, but the rest of us would act as the council on the ranch does, supporting John with ideas and possible solutions. We would be that for Corey and work together to turn things around. When it was time to bring the idea to John, Bill, Samuel, Mac, and the council, we met several times prior and ironed out a plan in our roles moving forward. The idea we were presenting started with the problem, the mechanics of getting it done, and the why now part. I didn't say more than a couple of sentences, which felt odd since I had been giving speeches at work before this whole thing started, and a bunch more after. Corey and Joy had it down like a finely polished speech, ending with the why now part. They are here, in our valley, and not going anywhere else anytime soon. Why not have them take charge of their futures? And maybe, just maybe, there could be assimilation down the road, Corey suggested. John asked for 30 minutes to discuss it as we all waited outside, nervously. What do you think? I asked Joy and Corey. You start, said Joy. Okay, thanks, replied Corey. I think if they can spare you all from here, then it's kind of a no-brainer. I mean, back before, if you had hundreds of new people move into your neighborhood all at once and you didn't know anything about them, would you be concerned? Of course, I said. I would want to know what the future held, especially since we have children growing up here. They need what we all have here, chimed in Joy. Purpose, faith, family, direction, protection, and a path to a better future. Not just temporary holding like farm animals. Sorry, Corey, I didn't mean that. No worries, I get it, and you are not wrong. Hopefully we can change that, he added. They are ready, called out Lonnie. And we all filed back into the large meeting room, as if we were waiting for a jury to decide our fate. John started. We think it's a good idea to try, and Max says he can spare you all, with the understanding that we may need you in different capacities down the road, as circumstances here and there continue to evolve and change. It may be that someday we can merge as one within this valley, but we agree that it's a matter to discuss in the future, and not one we should spend time on today. There is a lot of work to be done before a merge can be considered. And even then, it's complicated. There is also the matter of a few... Let's call them troublemakers, for lack of a better word. Do you have plans for them, Corey? I'm working on it, sir. I'll let you all know when I have it figured out. Okay, that works until then. Good luck to you all, and we are praying for a smooth operation. Let's have you announce it to the residents there in the next day or two and start up in a few days. I'll inform our residents here of the plan, as I'm sure Samuel will also. I'll do that, Samuel replied, and I think we would all like a progress report, maybe monthly, Unless, of course, something needs discussion in between. Sounds like a plan, replied Bill, with John and the council seeming to all agree. Joy, with a few other women in our group, spent the afternoon at the camp talking with many women and children there. Although there would not be an official announcement for at least another two days, they could gauge where help might be best targeted without giving away the farm. Lonnie, Vlad, and I stood watch casually but got the eyes of a few men, including the ones I'd seen last time. These guys, said Vlad, are like the ones in the movies, prison guards, not the ones employed there, but the ones on the inside that scheme to become powerful and then maintain leadership over others with the same ideals or those too scared to say no. These men are going to fight us at every turn, or worse. I know, I said. They are the bad apples that spoil the cart. It's important that we be careful with our firearms, and it's the reason our wives and girlfriends are in there now unarmed. These men have no access to weapons beyond maybe brooms or what they can find laying around camp. Except maybe a kitchen knife, 
like Stretch got hold of. But he worked in the kitchen and had easy access. These guys don't do anything around here, so access is restricted, hopefully, to what they may take from one of us. I'd rather not let them get near us if we can help it. The men were louder and more brazen as the day went on. I kept a close eye. There were five in all. Either there are a few more sick today, or these guys are the ones, I said mid-afternoon, pointing towards them. It seemed strange pointing a group out, but they'd pointed our direction most of the day, and I was pretty sure they were doing some catcalling to our better halves, although I couldn't make out any words clearly. We would find out later that it indeed was the case, and we vowed tomorrow would be different. The women are scared to death, and most of the kids as well, Joy told me once back at home. Are there good men there, I asked. Good men? Yes, there are some who are too scared of being separated from their families, like before, to speak up. So they don't. And after dark, she whispered quietly, with the boys in the other room, there are also issues. What issues, I asked, feeling a pit grow in my stomach. I didn't want to hear the answer, but needed to. I imagined the other dads were just now being told this as well. Tell me everything, I demanded. I'm not sure you want to know everything, she replied, tears rolling down her cheeks, which I hadn't seen in a long time. That's why I need to hear it all, I said, softening my tone. I listened, blocking out everything else. Joy whispered most of what she had to say and spoke the rest quietly, not leaving out any detail she had heard. A hundred questions went through my mind, but I waited until she was through. They had all been answered, confirming my biggest fears. I'm, I, uh, need some air is all I said, nearly running towards the front door. Walking out into the cool night air, I wandered about for several minutes before hearing a screen door open and close, then another and two more after that. Lonnie, stoic as always, stood silent. Vlad, on crutches, cursed. I assumed in Russian. Aiden and Shane spoke quietly across the lawn. So, you all know? I asked when we all gathered a few minutes later. Yes. And what we now know, we can't unknow, said Vlad in a thickened accent. This preying on women and children cannot continue. Are we agreed? Not one more night, I added, confusing more than one. Meaning what exactly, asked Shane. Meaning we head down there now, right now. Talk to Corey and provide security until morning. Arm security, gentlemen, so no women or children will be harmed there again. Then what, asked Aiden. What about tomorrow? We will figure it out then, I replied soberly. Meet back here in 15 minutes, gentlemen, I announced. We will be gone for the night, but I'm quite sure your wives and girlfriends won't mind this time. I used five of my minutes to say goodnight to my boys and Joy, and the other ten to talk to Mac. Oh, I'm sorry, I said when Dr. Melton opened the door to Mac's cottage. I wasn't expecting you to answer the door. Not everyone knows yet, but I live here now. Except when I'm on an overnight shift at the hospital, she replied. Yeah, that makes sense, I said, wondering why I hadn't heard it before. Anyway, is it possible to talk to Mac real quick? It's pretty important. Sure, he said, walking up, giving his new bride a kiss on the head and stepping outside. I gave him the Cliff's notes and that we were going to stay the night. I'll grab my jacket, said Mac. We got it, Mac. It's just guard duty until tomorrow. So maybe you should just pop down in the morning. Yeah, okay, if you're sure you guys don't need an extra body. Yeah. We'll be fine, just wanted you to know before anyone else, I replied. I appreciate that. What did Corey say? He doesn't know yet, I replied. See you in the morning, Mac. I turned to walk down the road. Whoa, whoa, hold on a minute, Lance. Yeah? Just a minute, he said, getting on the radio. I couldn't hear his muffled voice, but figured it was a call down the valley. Okay, Lance, now you're good. I radioed down to Corey so you guys wouldn't get shot showing up unannounced after dark. He needs to hear the story from you. All of it. Every word. I also would like a full briefing in the morning when I see you. Yes, sir, I said, walking briskly down the road to the apartment building nearly four minutes late. Sorry, guys. I was talking with Mac. Lonnie, do you have the truck keys so we can all go together? Right here, he said, holding them up. Oh, I forgot to tell you. If you're not armed, you should be. All good, ready to go, and a few more responses in kind told me they were prepared to roll. Chapter 15. Corey Camp, Loveland, Colorado It's dark, I said, from the truck bed into the back cab window, not meaning to state the obvious, but instilling that there was only a sliver of the moon shining this night. 
We need to get into position fast so nothing happens tonight. I'll talk to Corey as quickly as possible, I continued. No sudden movements if you can help it. It's going to be scary for the residents, but I'll let them know as soon as possible why we are there. What about the children? asked Vlad. Unfortunately, they already know, replied Lonnie, adding, any man not trying to hurt them will be a welcome sight. Lonnie flashed his lights three times as we approached the camp, a quarter of a mile out, getting three in return from Corey's flashlight. We all talked for a few minutes, as people from camp took notice. While he never saw it or heard it from a resident, Corey had feared there might be things he didn't know about going on. He was expecting an extramarital affair or maybe two teenage lovebirds sneaking off for some quiet time, but not this, not anything like this. It's not anybody's fault, said Lonnie. I'm trained just like you. And until my wife said something, I didn't see anything either. Sure, the women and some children look despondent, shallow maybe, but that's par for the course in camps filled with strangers on top of each other. It's nobody's fault but the men responsible, I added. But now that we know and are committed to being here, Lonnie said, it is our fault if it continues. A quick meeting with Corey was enough to get his limited security group and ours together with a plan. There were five men and one woman to watch out for, and everyone in camp knew them. We all spread out, walking through camp with no fewer than two of us in a group. Corey offered whistles to anyone wanting them. Last time I would have taken you up on that, but now you'll know if we're in any trouble when you hear the shot, I added, patting my right hip. Cold lights lit up the camp, making night look like day. Every eye in camp was on us, some looking as if we shouldn't be there, but even more seeming relieved that we were. I was paired with Vlad, the guy with a missing leg who could maneuver better on crutches than I could walk on two legs. I asked, how would you shoot if you had to? Not wanting to be insensitive, but genuinely curious, Vlad looked around, waiting for a moment when nobody was looking before dropping to the ground in an instant and taking a sniper's position in perfect form. Oh, that's how, I said, feeling uneasy that I had questioned him in the first place. I did own a gun store, you know, he added. Yeah, I remember. I'm going to practice that move, I added. Mister, said a little blonde-headed girl, probably not any older than my boys. She tugged my shirt and said it again. Mister, will you help? Help with what, I said, getting down on one knee at eye level. A man, a man. She said, tears welling in her eyes. A man, she started again. I think he's hurting my mommy. Okay, sweetie, I said as calmly as possible. When did it happen? Last week, yesterday, now. But, wait, no, right now as we're talking, I asked, growing flush. Where? Instinctively, I checked for my holstered pistol as if it had suddenly disappeared. There! She pointed across the camp to a trailer separated from the rest by at least 50 yards. I started walking quickly in the direction without thinking. Hold on there, said Vlad, keeping up. We don't know that it's not consensual, he said quietly. What a child perceives can be way off the facts. I'm just saying, let's be careful. I get it, I responded, not slowing down. Where's he going, asked Lonnie to his partner, Corey, pointing across the camp at us. It looks like he's headed to the storage trailer. Nothing in there but toilet paper and extra blankets. Aw, oh, hell, Corey added, looking through his binoculars. What? asked Lonnie. He's with Vlad and being led there by a young girl, and she's pointing to the trailer. Something's going down. Let's go. He called into the radio. I need all available security to the storage trailer. Cover me, I called to Vlad. What's your name? I asked her quietly. Mia, she replied, now crying openly. Right. Okay, Mia, you get under the trailer and don't come out until I say so, okay? She shimmied under the trailer before responding. I looked quickly under, needing to know her position. All right, stay right there and don't move an inch, I added. Making a mental note of her relationship to the trailer's front door, I didn't want any accidents happening on my watch. For a second, I forgot all about my cracked ribs until I hit the stairs. Then, stifling an ouch, I crept up as quietly as I could, slowly checking the handle. It went all the way down, and all that was left was to swing it open, as the SWAT team does in those reality shows on TV. I didn't think he would be armed, but I couldn't be 100% sure either. It's unlocked, I said quietly to Vlad. The muffled sound escaping the thin trailer walls was louder now, and it was clear that she was in trouble. No, don't stop, were used in two sentences, followed by, help me someone, please, and sobbing. 
Cover me, Vlad. I'm going in, I said, pistol now drawn. Three, two, one. I turned the handle, using my arm on the broken rib side, and yanked the door swiftly to gain the advantage. Pop! I heard loud as a gunshot in my head, followed by a loud groan and deep breaths. It was me as I realized the door didn't budge. Later, when it didn't matter, I would learn that each trailer also had a deadbolt separate, of course, from the front door handle. The pain in my side was intense and far worse than when it happened the first time. I looked back at Vlad from the top of the stairs, holding my ribs. I don't think I can. The door swung open from the inside, hard and fast, hitting me square in the side and knocking me clear off the stairs, landing hard on the dirt. He was on me right after I hit the ground, lying on my back trying to catch my breath. His fists were swinging wildly. It took everything I had to cover, with more than a few slipping in. I tried turning the nearly 300-pound man over, but it wasn't happening. I felt like one of those MMA fighters on his back, covering, just hoping to make it to the next bell so at least he could start the next round standing up. Where's my pistol? I yelled at Vlad, who was trying for a clear shot just five feet from where we wrestled. Hold on, Lance. I need a shot. I, said, I frantically looked on the ground, somehow holding him off but not wanting him to find it first. Others in the camp gathered around the chaotic scene of two men wrestling and another hopping around on one leg with a pistol, trying to get a clear shot. It seemed comical for a second, and thankfully my rib pain was nearly gone. Gotta love adrenaline, I thought, trying to free my other pistol from my ankle case and covering from blows at the same time. The woman in the trailer stepped outside yelling, that's him, pointing towards both of us. He did this. I looked up to see her blouse and skirt torn and blood running down her cheek. Freeing my ankle pistol, I dropped both hands to rack the slide, letting a punch through, hitting me in the forehead. The man winced with pain, shaking his hand, and it gave the seconds needed to rack the slide. Flipping off the safety, I put my hand on the trigger, ready to fire two shots or more if I had to. That's not good. I said aloud as tens of people, men, women, and even a few teenagers swarmed us. I couldn't see anything but bodies, but this time didn't see any blows, no hits or kicks, only pushing and pulling. I clicked my safety back on and put my pistol under my back. I didn't want to hit anyone else. Catching a glimpse of Corey and Lonnie through a sea of bodies had me wondering why they were not doing anything. No shots in the air, nothing. Then, as if the clouds opened up after a hard rain, the sun shone in my eyes. I realized they weren't after me, but him. This deviant's new neighbors had had enough. They caught him red-handed and did something about it. The crowd pulled him off of me and had him restrained on the ground until Corey could put handcuffs on him. Here, mister, a young girl's voice said. The same one that started this whole thing. Yes, I asked. Here, mister, she said again, pointing to my pistol on the ground. Oh, that. Thank you, I replied rolling over to grab it only feet from where we had been wrestling. I felt bad that she even had to see a weapon like mine and realized that before the day, it could have been many more years before she likely would. A medical team was checking her mother, and Corey helped me up. Ow, I said, groaning. Now it hurts, I added, holding my side. You really need to stop doing this, said Lonnie. You mean getting my butt kicked? I winced. Yes, I'm not sure your ribs can handle another one. You're like Rambo, minus all the badass stuff he does. That's not a compliment, I said. It is to him, replied Lonnie. I get to be the smartass every once in a while. Seriously, though, you did well, my brother. Any longer, and she may not have made it out of that trailer at all. Fair enough. And thanks, I guess, I said, not letting myself laugh or even smile. Yelling was heard across the camp on both sides, getting louder as they came into view. What's going on? I asked, reaching for my recently holstered pistol. Hold on, said Corey, using his binoculars for a better look. Everyone relax, he called out. It's street justice. What? asked Vlad. Street justice. They are dragging out two of the other men like that one, he said, pointing to the man handcuffed on the ground. The group held them to be cuffed just as before, one by Lonnie and the second zip-tied before dispersing. Just a few more to go, boss said one man to Corey. Then it's up to you. Back in the day, I never would have stood by and watched something like this. But they need it, all of them, stepping up and doing what's right. And so far, the guys they have brought were the same ones on my radar, said Corey to Vlad, Lonnie, and me. Lonnie, you're trained like me. What would you do? The same. Nothing more and nothing less.
Within half an hour, three men and one woman were sitting on the ground, hands bound behind their backs, surrounded by nearly everyone in camp. These are the ones with two missing, said a man Corey had always thought could be in a leadership position in the camp, with his wife, a teenage girl, and a young boy by his side. These are the ones to start. I'll testify to it, and so will many of us, his wife spoke up. We've had enough of this and will not allow it to continue, the man added. There's one more thing, boss. What's that? replied Corey, proud of what they had all done. We would ask that you consider letting him go. Let him go, let him go, started somewhere in the back of the group, but built as more joined the simple chant. I looked at Lonnie and Vlad, confused. I think I know what this is about, said Corey, smiling. Let him go, let him go, they continued, with most now pointing a few trailers down. The one with the 24-hour security detail. It's Stretch. They want him freed, said Corey. He was like a father figure around here, even to the adults. A sweet old man, they say, who sacrificed his freedom to bring down the ringleader, Ralph. Okay, everyone, said Corey, raising his hands. Please, everyone, listen for a minute. Once they realized nothing was happening immediately, they quieted and strained to hear his voice. There is a process for everyone here, and it needs to be followed. Those citizens with direct first-hand knowledge and eyewitnesses will be interviewed, and all information will be presented to the judge for a fair evaluation and determination of the next steps. Many of you will have a say in the process, but the decision will be made alone by the man skilled in the law and a former practicing judge for those who are not aware. The two missing men will be added to the accused cells if they return or are found on the property. I guess we get to try out the cells, said Corey to us. What cells, I asked. The colonel brought in one double-wide trailer at the start. It's reinforced with 10 individual cells and a temporary outhouse for each. We put it up the road a bit, not thinking it would need to be used. Stretch didn't need to be there in my opinion. But these ones do, he said. We could bring the trailer closer to the camp, said Vlad. Nah, replied Corey. I'll put a guard on it. I don't want that trailer right here and give an excuse for vigilante justice. Things around here are moving in a positive direction finally, and I'd like it to continue. The men and one woman being captured with hands bound had everyone in camp together at once. A rarity, Corey pointed out. Let's get on the same page, he announced. No better time than now. Cameron ran back up to the security trailer to fetch the megaphone, needed to make sure everyone heard what was coming next. Since we're all here, called Corey over the megaphone, as the accused were slowly led away. First, I want to thank you for your help today. We are still a constitutional republic in this country, same as the last 240 years. That means anyone accused of any crime is entitled to a fair trial. The methods will need to be a bit different, and our judge will have the final say but we will do our best to adhere to the ways of old as much as possible. I want a lawyer, the little girl's mom screamed from the trailer stairs, still being cared for by medical personnel. Me too, screamed one of the men just captured. I didn't see that coming, I whispered to Lonnie and Vlad. Nope, I don't think any of us did, replied Lonnie, and the look on Corey's face for a split second said he hadn't thought of it either. There's the twist, said Vlad quietly, before the questions came rapid fire. Please, everyone, one at a time, and I've already heard the first one three times in as many seconds, announced Corey. Any of you guys want a CEO position? He whispered to us, turning the megaphone off for a second. We all three shook our heads no. It reminded me of before when a newscaster, sports announcer, or politician would not realize the mic was still hot. They went on to voice their true feelings about a situation, often with hilarious outcomes or just did an unplanned live shot gone crazy wrong. The one that always made me laugh out loud was the newscaster. I could never remember where, but he was covering a drug bust and law enforcement was burning hundreds of pounds at once on the open ground. As the smoke rose behind him, it was a wait for it, wait for it, before it wafted his way kind of moment. And then the giggling started, a little at first, and then so much that he couldn't finish the broadcast. I bet you don't do that again, I would always say out loud. Will those in custody have a lawyer like before the day? Corey said, repeating the first question. I don't have the answer, but I think it's fair to consider it, if it's even possible to find one. Out of curiosity, do we have any former attorneys in the camp? Besides the judge, of course. Two women and one man gingerly raised their hands. 
Corey pointed to the first man, asking, What was your specialty? Tax law, sir. Okay, next you, ma'am. Divorce, sir. I specialized in soft divorce. Soft divorce? asked Corey. I think we were all curious as to the apparent oxymoron the title suggested. Yes, essentially when both parties agree to make the divorce smooth and amicable, treating each other fairly and with dignity, she explained. Well, she's out of the running, said a man in the audience. Sorry, just a joke, he said before trying to hide his face when no laughs were forthcoming. And you, sir? inquired Corey. Criminal is all he said. Really? asked Corey, not believing his luck with a criminal attorney and a judge in the same camp. That's right, but I'm telling you up front, I'm not representing those guys or the girl, not after what I've seen, but I would represent her, he said, pointing to the still sobbing mother on the trailer steps. That's him, she screamed back. He's my lawyer, that's him, she screamed again. I was taken aback as we all were expecting a conversational talk about making things better. We all envisioned some talk about schools, maybe some construction, a nice gardening talk, anything but this. It would have been interesting to stay for all of it, but the bulge in my side, my already bad side, was new and now hurt worse than ever before. Chapter 16, Loveland, Colorado. I followed the medics as they walked the mother to their tent and waited patiently for my turn. Thirty minutes later, I was in Lonnie's truck, heading to see Dr. Melton again. What happened? I asked him, barely able to get out the words over my pain. Nothing after that, he replied. Corey got caught off guard, like we all did, and pushed the other agenda off until tomorrow so everyone could calm down a bit. Oh, that's good, I replied. I mean, I kind of wanted to be there is all. Yeah, Mac, Lonnie said into the radio when the call came through. Hey, Lonnie, is Lance with you? Right here, Mac. Lance, first of all, you sound like crap. Second, he added without waiting for a response. I got a call from the medics down there. You need to go straight to the hospital. Sarah, uh, Dr. Melton, I mean, is headed there now? Oh, crap, I replied. Was this her day off? Yep, and mine too, but she insisted. And you know what they say about happy wives? Yeah, sorry about that. I said, you're a bit like Rambo, but getting your butt kicked a little more. That's a joke, but we need you down there and at 100%, or at least over 50. That's what I said about the Rambo thing, Lonnie made a point of saying. That's funny, replied Mac. We will get you to the meeting Corey told me about tomorrow. Then you're off for a few days. No boxing, no roughhousing, and no shooting, deal? I didn't fire a shot and barely got a punch in either time, I replied. But I get it. Deal. Great, Mac replied. And Lonnie, come fill me in when you drop Lance off at the hospital. I'll buy the first round. A few people I answer to are asking questions about today. Sure thing, Mac. Meet you at the pavilion in, say, 30. That works. And Lance, you better do what my wife tells you or I'm going to get crap about it. Yes, I can do that. I've been married a while. Some things are universal. All right, hang in there. I'll check up on you in the morning. Well, that was fun, I told Lonnie. Ah, he cares about you is all. If he didn't, he would have pointed out that you do all of your fighting lately on your back. Told you I'd get you back, he added, pretending to punch me in the side. All right, even? Not even close, he said, smiling. Okay, postponed then, I asked. Deal, but only until you heal up a little. Lonnie dropped me off at the waiting room with both Joy and Dr. Melton waiting in the lobby. In the movies... The adoring wife would greet the hurt man at the door, hugging him carefully and telling him to put his feet up and relax. Maybe those were just the really old ones. Today I got, hey honey, Doc will get you fixed up. Then you're on kid duty for a few hours. We're waiting for a few more of the ladies to show up for book club. Fifty Shades of, I read across the cover. I thought they banned that book. Nope, that's Catcher in the Rye you're thinking of. You are okay, right? She asked. Yeah, I'll be fine. Mac gave me a three-day suspension, though. I know. Love you. Now go back and get fixed up. Another x-ray, some pain meds, a lecture to stop getting hurt, and I was going to be on my way. This time I was taped and had to breathe slowly and deliberately. Resetting my rib was enough to slow me down for the considerable future. All done, Lance, said Dr. Melton when the first bang shook the front door, followed quickly by a second and a third, sounding different as if an army stormed the castle gates with a battering ram and finally broke through. 
I locked the hospital door, since it's just us three in here, said Sarah. Joy, are you okay? I shouted down the hall, hobbling down the corridor towards the sound and my wife of ten years. Joy, I called. Are you okay? I called out again with my pistol drawn. There was no answer. A door I couldn't see opened, followed by a scream belonging to my companion of over fifteen years. It was unmistakable, and I wasn't sure why the delay. She was in the bathroom, I think, whispered Sarah. And now she's not, I replied, but only to myself. Get your weapon, I instructed Sarah. I don't have one, not on me. She doesn't either, she added. We don't do that when we meet. Okay, I sighed. Stay here and get low, I cautioned her quietly, making my way toward the front. Call for help if you can, I added. Joy, I called out again, hoping just maybe she had fallen or tripped over a lobby chair. The realist in me knew better. I wasn't sure what was happening, but I knew it wasn't going to be simple. Joy, I whispered as I got closer to the front, with one more corner to round. Joy, can you hear me? I whispered again, with a whimpered response I had never heard before. I got on my hands and knees before quickly realizing it wouldn't work. My groans would have surely given me away, but it didn't matter. Come on out and join the party, said a male voice from the lobby. Yeah, like he said, voiced another. I slowly rounded the corner with every fiber of my being screaming not to do it. Don't go in there, I heard in my head, with a flash of every horror movie we watched as teens, all hollering the same thing at the two-foot-thick, rabbit-eared television. Don't go in there, we would shout, but they always did, never listened. Seeing a gun pointed at my wife's head was the single most gut-wrenching thing I'd ever seen. Even watching my best friend Jake die in my arms couldn't compare. The man holding onto my wife from behind had his pistol trained on her. His heavily bearded face was in sharp contrast to his smooth, bald head. The other man, pointing a rifle towards me, was much younger and could have been the other man's twenty-something son. Both were shaking, with beads of sweat coming off the bearded one. I waited for them to tell me to drop my weapon, but so far I didn't have to make a choice and traded lines of fire with the younger one, not willing to point my pistol towards Joy. Okay, gentlemen, I said as calmly as I could. What are we doing here? Who else is here? Asked the older man. Just us, I said, not having heard anything from the back. Don't lie to me. You two are civil, civili, chiel. It's civilians, said his counterpart. Sivy, shut up, the older man commanded. I know that everybody does. Think I'm stupid or something? I ain't, and that there is a fact. Bonafide. Yeah. Had the situation been different, I would have intervened telling them both it was a pointless argument. But any additional seconds they bickered gave Sarah more time to slip out the back door if she hadn't already and find some backup. So I didn't say a word. As I was saying before being interrupted, the bearded man said, is I remember you both from the other day. You can thank me for that boot stop on your hand. Oh, I will, I started to say, holding back before the first word escaped my mouth. So you expect us right here to believe that you twos are all alone in a hospital, alone without any upfront girls or them doctors? We were waiting for a few others for their book club, I started, not wanting to lie to him yet directly. Them doors were locked on account of the hospital being closed, I continued. I had read somewhere that in a hostage negotiation, the negotiator would try to mirror the assailant's body language and dialect. I hoped I wasn't going too far, as the last thing I wanted was to insult my two new acquaintances. Shh, said the one holding joy. I did it. I went too far with the language thing, I thought, wondering if my next step was a sincere apology or a speed round to the next step of negotiations. Listen, we don't have to, I started to say. I said, shh, he barked, squeezing my joy tighter and pressing his gun to her head flush. Okay, I replied, holding my hand up with my still-trained weapon at his companion. Please, Sarah, if you're here, don't make a sound. Not one sound, I thought, catching Joy's gaze. Seconds turned to a minute, maybe more, with only the sound of Joy's breathing and the younger man scratching at his recently shaven face. Ain't nobody here, Bruce, he finally spoke. Don't call me that, you idiot, he responded, telling me they were most likely not father and son. What do you want to resolve this, I asked the older gentleman. Them meds, of course. Why else would we be here? You ain't too smart, fella. I can tell that right here. Okay, that's good, I said, as calmly as I could, not addressing the insult. It's just us, so if you let her go, 
We can walk out the front door and you guys can grab anything you want before someone else knows what's happening. It's that easy, I replied, with joy saying the same. Shut up, woman, the lead man said, boiling my blood. We had trained for this, she and I, not before the day, but a few of us in the core group had discussed it before leaving our home in McKinney. Mike taught us, and I doubted it was standard police procedure. He taught that if someone has you from behind in a hostage situation, the code phrase of the one being held was, I don't feel so good, just before they would drop like a sack of apples towards the floor. This only had a chance of working if there was one hostage taker and one defender. Now there were two, and a sudden drop would only work if I could take them both out before they fired on one or both of us. The odds were bad, maybe not for a special forces guy trained in muscle memory of combat, but for someone like me, they were, and she and I both knew it. I nodded my head no as subtly as possible. A flash outside the window caught my eye. For a moment I was thankful. I was the only one facing that way. It was only a split second, but the younger man noticed, turning that way for a millisecond before he yelled, Get down! There's someone outside the window! Both men instinctively ducked low, with the bearded one I was sure named Bruce not loosening his grip on joy. Listen to me, Bruce, I said. We can figure this out still. Nothing's changed. Call me that name again, and I'll shoot her, I swear. Okay, I said as calmly as possible. I won't call you that, but I need something from you. It felt dumb, saying it like I was quoting a hostage situation from a B-list movie, or maybe even a C-list if there is such a thing, except I skipped over the hours of phone call stallings and headed straight for the, I'll give you this if you give me that. Now what are you going to offer me, a helicopter and one of them duffel things full of cash, he spat. No, it's not like that, I responded, almost calling him Bruce again before catching myself. It's not like that at all, sir. You see, you have my wife, and I care about her very much. That's what I want. You want the Drew? I mean, you want the medications that can help you and your friend here. Andy, he spat. The idiot with me is Andy, A-N-D-Y. Okay, I'm Lance, and this is Joy you have, and you're scaring her. Can you see that? I know who you both are, and I don't care how either of you feels. I want my meds and safe passage out of here. There ain't no negotiations beyond that there. More flashes came through the front window with the sun dancing, moving shadows onto the lobby floor. How do you know our name, sir? And how did you end up here? They're from down the road, Joy spoke up without being shushed this time. I've seen them both before, she added. I froze for a split second. Joy was repeating the information we had already discussed. I hoped that wasn't a sign she would try the drop and roll maneuver Mike had told us about. I paused, waiting for one of them to point out the obvious, but when they didn't, I had no choice but to continue. Stretching my neck first right and then left, I hoped she saw it. How did you get up here? I asked, trying to keep them talking and also wondering how our security didn't see two men walking down the road for more than two miles. We came across them rim rocks, said Andy, pointing and getting another warning from his accomplice. Who cares? It don't matter now, Andy said in defiance. I'm in charge here, boy, said Bruce, standing up with Joy and getting red in the face. Joy and I traded a look quick and thankfully not noticed this time. You're always treating me like a kid like your kid, and you ain't my dad, said Andy now standing. I could see two trucks out front, parked front to back, like a barricade, not more than 20 yards from the front door. The two dimwits were so distracted by their squabbling that they hadn't noticed each vehicle slowly backing into place. We had discussed another hostage scenario, this one taught by Lonnie and still probably not the official protocol of the McKinney Police Department, although I wasn't sure. We discussed it once but never practiced it, and it didn't fit this situation exactly. Still, it ran through my mind in seconds like wildfire. The idea was essentially the same as the previous drop and roll with the I'm not feeling so well routine, followed by a quick drop, but only if someone had other shooters at the ready. I think it was called the drop and roll deal, but it was a while back. I remembered how it worked though. The code phrase to start the plan in motion was, we're ready to make a deal. Lonnie's plan echoed in my head from way back in McKinney, and I wasn't sure if Joy remembered it. It didn't matter. I was by myself, and hospital windows are reinforced, of course, for situations just as this, with junkies looking for pills and willing to do anything to get them. The front doors were jammed in from whatever they used to force them open and had made a one-foot gap, but not enough for someone to get in or out quickly. That left the trucks. 
They could come through the front doors or the front wall if they wanted to, but then what? Plow us all over and save the drugs? It wouldn't work, couldn't work. Andy and Bruce were about as smart as I thought from the beginning, both hotheads and bickering more than surveying their surroundings. I gave my wife a look. I hoped she understood a yes nod, with one hand gesturing, wait for it, whatever that thing was. My back was still to the back hallway and at a 90 degree angle. I fought the instinct to look back down the hall and see if Sarah was in sight. I hoped she was out of the building but couldn't be sure. Something poked my calf and it took everything in me not to turn around. One minute, I heard the whisper behind me. No, wait, I wanted to say it was too soon. I wanted more time to think it through, but it was time. The two men were sloppy and trading insults like they hated each other. Oh, that's a good one, idiot, said the older one, with the younger responding, takes one to know one, old man. Boy, I should have left you back at camp. You ain't done nothing to help anyways. Joy's eyes never left my face. She must have known something was coming. Thirty seconds, I heard, recognizing the voice and giving her a subtle nod that it was happening. Lonnie held the bullhorn, asking everyone if they were ready. Two of my best friends in the world are directly in your line of fire, he stated. There will be no mistakes today. Ready when you are, said the ranch shooters. On my cue, you fire at the front windows only, not at the door. I repeat, not at or near the front door, Lonnie directed. Chapter 17, Loveland, Colorado. Lonnie turned on the bullhorn from behind the lead truck, hoping it was on loud enough, not having time to test it. His stopwatch counted down. 14, he said, so his men could hear, counting down each second. Five, four, three, two. We're ready to make a deal, Lonnie called out loud enough to clearly hear inside. Now that's what I'm talking about, the lead man said, right before Joy uttered her line perfectly. I don't feel so, she started, dropping in a split second before finishing. Then, nothing. She fell to the floor, rolling away, but nothing more. Oh no, I thought. And then it started before I had another thought. The gunfire came from behind the trucks in front, pelting the front windows. Crack! Crack! I heard from right behind me as the old man fell, trying to reach Joy again. I rolled, if one could call it that, more like a crawl, smooth as gator skin, to get into position, as Andy ducked down. Don't do it! I yelled at Andy, repositioning his pistol and turning towards me. I didn't wait for another warning from me or anyone else, firing mid-chest. He stumbled up from a crouched position before taking another three rounds from somewhere behind me, falling back against the wall, blood staining the floor. I turned to get up when I saw Mac over him. We're done here, Mac said, firing a single shot into the man's forehead. Get off me, I heard Joy yelling, slowly dragging her captor across the floor to my right with both his hands on her left ankle. I didn't see his pistol, figuring he had dropped it somehow during the commotion. The bright red stain mixed into the dirt and sweat of his once white t-shirt spread out across his right midsection. A quick look at Mac said he was going to let me handle this. Let her go, I yelled training my weapon on his bad side. Let her! Was all I got out when he grabbed her other leg to pull her to the ground. I steadied and fired twice, aiming for his red-stained side, the same as I would a dartboard if I hit the bullseye on the first throw. He groaned as the two rounds hit nearly dead on. Joy kicked loose, ran into the bathroom, and locked the door as Mac fired the final shot. All clear, he called into his radio a minute later as our men came running through the front door with Sarah following close behind. Making my way to my wife, I tried the locked handle and had to call out that it was all right and it was over. I heard the lock click and entered, closing it behind me, and hugged her, neither of us saying a word. Let's go home, said Sarah, knocking on the door. Anna has your boys, said Vlad as we walked outside, getting into Lonnie's truck for a ride home. Joy was silent, not saying a word since it ended, and I didn't ask her to. Thanks, brother, I said to Lonnie as we arrived home with him nodding. No jokes today, no banter or one-ups, just friends doing what it takes to help each other in a time of need. Joy walked straight into our apartment and into our room, shutting the door behind her. I don't know what to do, I told Vlad after checking on our boys. I mean, things, bad things, keep happening to her, and at some point she's going to have enough of it. And then what, asked Vlad. What do you mean? Just that, and then what? Things are better, have been better until maybe a week ago. 
You promised me a life of leisure when I got to the mountains, Lance, and the first thing I get is the great battle. I was shooting again today, although it was more for show. That Mac is smart. Anyway, it's not perfect, but we would both have been done a long time ago if we had stayed home. You get to keep loving your family, and I have found love again. You and Anna? Yes. Congratulations, I'm truly happy for you. Thanks, replied Vlad. I'm happy for you too, understand? Yeah, I do. It's just easy to forget sometimes when you're getting your butt kicked every few days. Thanks, Vlad. I needed this talk. And so does she, said a familiar voice from behind us. Sarah, you heard all that, I asked. I did, and Vlad is right. She's inside? Yes, but in our room, not talking. Can you give me a few to talk to her before coming back inside? Sure, of course. Take your time if you think it could help, I replied. You all right? Asked Mac, coming around the corner. Yeah, I mean, we're alive, thanks to you guys. I have a question, though, I said. Shoot, replied Mac. I'm guessing Sarah was able to sneak out the back and get you on the radio. In front of the hospital, you had guys start shooting towards us when the signal was called, when you were already in the back. Yes, that's right. What if the bullets from the front struck one or both of us? You're right about Sarah. She wasn't going to leave the hospital without you both, but I wouldn't let her stay inside. As to the shooting, that's a fair question, he acknowledged. Did they fire at the partially open door? I don't think so. I only heard them hitting the windows. Wait a minute. The rounds didn't come through, not one. Bulletproof glass. You can thank Samuel for that. He's kind of a prepper, if you didn't already know. And you knew this? I asked, looking at both Mac and Vlad. Of course. It was a distraction and very effective, if you ask me, replied Mac. That they were, I replied. That they were. Thanks to you and Sarah, I said, shaking his hand. Oh, hey, one more thing, I asked. Do you think Samuel is going to be upset about replacing the glass? His daughter was directly involved in the mother of, well, you know, so no. He has no regrets about what we did today. Gotta run, he added, walking around the corner of the apartment building. Did I hear that right? asked Vlad. Yes, but it's still a secret until he says it's not. Got it. It happens, he added, trying to hide a smile. Really, I asked, a Russian who can't hide a smile? It happens, he said, putting on a thick accent. We're not sure yet, and we were going to talk to Dr. Melton about it today, but another time. So you see, this is all part of it, the living out my life in the mountains. Sounds lonely, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You gave me a new life, a brand new life, and it just happens to be in the mountains. Does anyone else know? I asked. No, but I want Javi to be the first, well, the second, I guess, once we know for sure. I had a look that is nearly universal in the U.S., Russia, and across the world, I assumed. He saw it straight away. Okay, but only joy. I don't want anyone else to know, okay? He said quietly. Understood, and congrats, I hope. She's waiting for you, said Sarah a minute later. Anna is fine to keep your boys for a sleepover, she added. Oh, that's okay. We don't really need that. Yes, you do. We'll talk tomorrow. Wait, any suggestions, I asked. You don't need any. She needs to know you still love her and think she's beautiful. That's all. Oh, I said, putting my hands to my face. I didn't even see it, I told her. Thank you, I can do that. <laughs> How are you feeling, my love, I said, hoping it didn't sound insincere. Tired, scared, and unattractive, I guess, she said with tears in her eyes. I lightly brushed her hair from her three-inch scar above her right eye. I only see the most beautiful woman in this world and the one before, I said, kissing her softly on the newly forming scar. My love for you grows every day, and I'm thankful that you picked me to go through this crazy life with. Nothing can or would change that. Thank you. I needed that, she said, putting her head on my shoulder. And I'll always fight for you, I added. You kind of suck at fighting, she said, smiling and pretending to elbow me in the ribs. Lately, I argued. Lately, and a couple of those were sucker punches. And you know this, girl. I'm coming back, like Muhammad Ali. Ringo and Minnie woofed from the next room. See, they know it. Just like him, huh? Gonna sting like a bee? You know it, babe, I replied. It was a running joke because we were one of the few couples we knew who didn't call each other babe. She leaned her head on my shoulder. Ow, I called out, not meaning to. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. No, it's okay, I replied, gritting my teeth and speaking softly. We both smiled, shared I love yous, and held each other until morning.
Get up, get up. An eager joy announced at first light. What's wrong? I responded, turning too fast with a grunt. Nothing's wrong. Everything is right. Huh? Thank you for last night. I needed Sarah to talk me through things and you to be here for me. I got both. And now I'm ready to get to work. I'll get the kids over to daycare and we can head down the road for the day. What about Mac? I asked. What about him? He wanted me to take a few days off work, but I guess I can hang out and make suggestions. It's just meetings today and probably tomorrow, she said. And I know you will want to be a part of it. The first thing is, they need a name, not the FEMA place or the camp or the others, but a real name, one they can be proud of, one they decide on. Then every child from kindergarten to high school needs to be in school, learning, including ours. And not last or least, each adult needs to have a job, something they're passionate about and some that just need to get done. So a mix, are you saying? I asked. It sounded like David and James's idea, only better. Being assigned a job you don't mind and getting trained to do one you are truly passionate about is the difference. Not that everyone is going to be in that boat, but the ones who are would have real life transformation. Yes, take for example, she continued, a man or woman that loves to cook and has a passion for learning how to do it better. They should work in the kitchen and pull their share of latrine, laundry, or security duty, she continued, or someone who loves to draw. They can make signs. We need all kinds of signs around camp. Let's see who has a green thumb and, well, you get the point. It makes sense, I agreed. Nobody gets stuck with just the crap jobs, pun partially intended, I proudly proclaimed. Chapter 18, Cory Camp, Loveland, Colorado. The trial of the others would be started and complete within hours, or a day or two at most. The three men were accused of crimes that most in camp didn't want to hear about, and the woman was accused of facilitation and helping lure unsuspecting victims. I told Joy that she sounds like one of Epstein's alleged accomplices, Max, something was her last name. And I can tell you, replied Joy, the women hate her worse than they hate the men. They trusted her, and she sold them out. What could she possibly gain from that, I asked. Money. Not in the traditional sense, but the same way prisoners bargain with snacks and other items, either items purchased or with limited quantities. Either way, if she is found guilty, as I assume she will be, she deserves a just punishment in my book. We learned from Corey that there would be no jury as finding an impartial set of peers was impossible and nobody from the ranch or the West wanted to get involved at this point. Insofar as the four accused, Corey said, each wants to represent themselves, which is their right, I guess. The woman you found, Lance, and a few of the others hired the criminal lawyer, figuratively speaking, I mean, since his legal fee would be paid in thank yous and accolades, assuming he wins, of course. Both sides will have a fair opportunity to tell their side and can call witnesses if they choose. Then the judge alone will decide their fates. Four separate trials, I asked. How long will that take? As long as it has to, I guess, replied Corey. We could lump them all together, but the accusers are different, as are the witnesses to each case. The judge says probably two to three hours per case, and he will do two tomorrow and two the following day, with a verdict the day after that. So, three days, and then we can get back to the business of getting new things started around here. I know you're eager to get started helping get things moving, Joy, said Corey, but this needs to happen first, or it cheapens the process, if that makes sense. It does, Joy replied. I know the tone for these set the tone for any others down the road. Guess you have your few days off after all, Lance, unless you want to watch the trials. No, I don't, I replied. I can already guess what I'm about to hear, and I'd rather not listen. But I need to know what they have done so we can make sure it doesn't happen again. Plus, I'm pretty sure I'll be called as a witness, at least regarding the little girl's mother in the trailer. Me too, said Joy. I want to be there. I need to hear it firsthand and make up my own mind. Those women and children need to see we are supporting them. So let's make sure the rest of our group, the adults, of course, are present as well. The trials were set from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, with a break for lunch and 1.30 to 4.30 each day. They were to be held in the only double-wide trailer in the camp, used for administrative offices before the day. But the number of people that attended quickly forced the hearings into the large mess hall tent. Several of the women and children shared the criminal attorney with the accused asking to represent themselves at trial. In fairness of the judicial process, if you choose to have a lawyer present, 
I'll either have to find one or we will skip them on both sides, announced the judge. However, if you still want to represent yourself, then the plaintiff is also entitled to seek representation. The accused men all opted to represent themselves at trial. The woman demanded a lawyer, with only the tax attorney agreeing to represent her. The judge asked that all minors under age 15 be cared for by two older women not involved in any case and in a separate camp area. Any man or woman over the age of 15 would decide for themselves if they wished to attend one or all of the trials. Nearly everyone attended the first one. One may expect the accusations in a deviant's dungeon, far from any town or other people, but to hear them talked about happening right here in our valley was hard to hear. I glanced at Corey a few times, who seemed to take it even harder, as it was all going on under his roof. How did everyone let this happen? Joy whispered to me mid-trial on the first day. I don't know, but I have an idea. A hunch, maybe. Let's talk at lunch. At the end of the first trial, I wasn't hungry, not even a little. Joy, either. I wanted to go home immediately, skipping the afternoon and the next two days altogether, and just hug our boys. They'd been through a lot getting here and when we first arrived. But nothing like this. These kids, boys and girls, women and their husbands and fathers, would be forever scarred emotionally, and some physically. I had to find out if I had the how figured out. It took some convincing, but Joy and I got Corey to agree to let us speak with Stretch alone. He would be handcuffed to a chair inside the trailer, and we were instructed to stay 10 feet from him at all times. Security would remain outside. We weren't eating anyway, so we started right away between trails. You have 30 minutes, said Corey after asking Stretch if he would agree to talk with us. How are you holding up, Stretch? I asked as the trailer door closed. Better than a few of those guys out there, I suppose. You know about that? Asked Joy. About the trials, yes. I get information in various ways, let's just say. So I do know about them, and that I'll have mine probably not long after. Anything you say in here is confidential, I said. It won't even go back to Corey. You have my word on that, man to man. I believe you both, he replied. And to be honest, I would have done the same thing if I had to do it again. Like a grisly Groundhog Day movie, he said with a little chuckle. I'm kind of surprised they never made one of those, I said, trying to ease the tension of the meeting. Yeah, well, what can I do for you two? I had explained my theory to Joy before stepping inside the trailer and asked if she would lead. I didn't want to come off like I was threatening him or putting words in his mouth. Ralph, she started. He's been, or was, I should say, a troublemaker for a lot of folks around these parts. Her subtle down-home country folk style of talking wasn't lost on me, and Stretch seemed comfortable with it. He's had issues with Mac from up the road, she continued. Mac's the football guy, right? Asked Stretch. I thought he might just take Ralphie boy out right on the field with those hits, he added, answering his own question. Ralph, she continued, kidnapped his own son led a hostile invasion on the house of a young girl's grandparents and tried to attack several men, including Lance's dad, when he first got here. We believe he forced other men, women, and children to perform drug-fueled rituals that God himself would find shocking. This is the man you allegedly killed, she stated, and then paused. I wasn't sure what I was expecting, but was still surprised by the answer. No, sweetie. I didn't allegedly kill that son of a bitch, Ralph. I did kill him in front of everyone to make my point. I'd say it worked because you all are now trying all those who worked with him. Except, of course, the two you done scuffled with in the hospital yesterday. They are already in hell, right where they belong. Sorry you had to go through that, by the way. I started to ask how he knew about that and had to smile. You hear a lot for a confined man. That I do. That I surely do, he replied, relaxing a bit. So, what's your question, ma'am, he said casually, not hurried or wanting us to leave, I thought. My question is, was Ralph the reason nobody spoke up in camp about what was going on? Yes, is the first part of my answer, and the second is, it's complicated. They did speak up, many of them did, to the man they thought was their leader, protector, confidant even. Far as I know, he didn't do any of it, but the ones that did answered to him. Every one of them bastards answered right back to him. Then why would he let it happen, Stretch continued. Control, just that simple. He controlled people through fear and deception. They were confessing to the very man that ordered them attacked, and nobody figured it out. But I did, and I fixed it. That's about all of it. 
And if rotting away in a place like this, or a cell, wherever they house the long-term bad guys nowadays, is my fate, so be it. The next trial was similar to the first. The official charges were the same, ones I thought we would never hear of here in this valley. The kind that would make page two of the local paper before the day, only because they were too disturbing to feature on page one. Folks now, like before, wanted the Cliff's Notes version of bad news, not the gritty cop view that eventually would spill over to a juror squirming in their seat. Everyone wants to eat the burger, but nobody wants to kill the cow, I would tell Joy. Except for the improbable or impossible burger, whatever they call it, she would say, sparking a rehashed debate from me. Okay, hear me out, I would say. I get it if someone doesn't eat meat. I understand and guess they probably aren't comfortable eating an animal and the process that goes with the harvesting. But if you don't eat meat, how does taking vegetables and making them look like meat appeal to them? Especially when they use beet juice to resemble the pink juice of a rare burger. It's like if I hate carrots but love steak. Should I get steak made to look like a carrot? The impossible carrot looks like a carrot but tastes like meat, I would announce, as if it were a mind-blowing Super Bowl commercial. Corey took the trials hard, citing they were all his responsibility to protect, and he had not held up his end of the deal. Lonnie told him that we're fixing it now, trying to ease his guilty conscience just a bit. The judge announced at the end of the first day of trial that after the conclusions tomorrow, they would have a break for a day. Then the verdicts would be handed down on each of the accused to be immediately sentenced after. The following day would be Stretch's trial, and both the criminal attorney and the soft divorce one asked to be his counsel. The judge read the final verdicts two days later. All four men were convicted of charges ranging from false imprisonment to indecent acts that most in attendance didn't ever want to hear of again. The women's charges, including false imprisonment and aiding and abetting, were known criminal acts, and she was convicted on three of five charges. The judge had a meeting alone with Corey prior to sentencing. What are the choices here? asked the judge. They have all been found guilty after as fair a trial as we could work up, given the circumstances. What were you thinking? asked Corey. Well, back before, a conviction like these men received would have put them away for at least 20 years, maybe even life. The woman is probably three to 10 years, depending on the judge. Or, asked Corey, or we banish them from the valley, never to return. Of course, it's on our conscience, knowing there will be more victims outside this valley in that scenario. We would quite literally be setting monsters free in other communities they could end up in. I think you already tried that with Ralph. Or, asked Corey again, that's it. The only thing left is a death sentence, and I'm not comfortable handing down that one. I see your point, replied Corey. I don't want lifers in our backyard, and for sure not one or two valleys over. Let me talk with the leaders up the road and see if we have any other ideas. He made a trip up the road, with Mac waiting for him. The ranch and the West leaders met later in the afternoon, with Samuel stating he would call the colonel on this special matter. I don't think he will mind, he said. These people need more options than we can give them. The call happened quickly as the colonel said he always takes Samuel's calls as soon as he can. Good news, Corey, he said, getting him on the radio. The colonel has a setup near Denver, Colorado Springs to be exact. Used to be the supermax for really bad guys. Still is, I guess, but in my book, these gentlemen you have down there fit the bill. He will send a chopper up in a few days to pick them up, and they will serve out their sentence handed down by the judge. That's great news, Corey replied, relieved to have an option that didn't put more people in harm's way or result in a firing squad execution. What about stretch? It's up to the judge, replied Samuel. We have a strict policy on violence up here on our end, but it's not my call down there. They will pick him up if that's the sentence or not. The verdicts of all the men were the same, 25 years. The woman's conviction was not as straightforward as much of her wrongdoings were hearsay, and a few of the women spoke of her remorse, with more than one believing it was genuine. The judge gave her four years, all of them straight time, not aware if early parole was even an option now. The trial of Stretch took longer than the others, although he pled guilty from the start which before the day would likely have ended up by skipping the trial altogether. The judge was presented with a list of witnesses eager to come forward, not scared or embarrassed to talk about what they knew about him. I'll allow it, he told Stretch's lawyers. It's highly unorthodox, but then again, what isn't nowadays? He had the best lawyers in camp, 
and the judge had made up his mind about the sentencing halfway through, for the first time since he was voted to the bench, nearly 45 years ago. Stretch was guilty and of a serious crime, even admitted it. The entire camp came to his side with no exceptions. Many considered him the father or grandfather figure they never had or lost when things changed. When the judge announced the guilty verdict with lifetime community service to replace jail time, everyone in camp cheered. The community service was made up of teaching kids how to fish, hunt, and grow a garden. He was known now as Grandpa Stretch to all of them. The colonel's men picked up the trash, as promised, leaving Corey with a few things he wasn't expecting. More food, a full storage unit, medical supplies, an entire greenhouse with solar panels, parts only, but with setup instructions and tools included, and various planting seeds were delivered and eagerly accepted. One soldier said, the colonel says to keep an ear out for the president's message in the next few days. We'll do just that, replied Corey, thanking him for stopping by, as promised. Joy and I, with the rest of our party, settled into a routine building teams in each section of the camp. With the bad apples fallen off the tree, the camp ran smoothly, like a well-oiled machine. The rest voted on leaders in each section of the group for a six-month run. None would be allowed to serve more than two consecutive six-month terms within two years. Corey made up his own council. With him, it consisted of the Judge Joy and me, as well as Lonnie and Vlad, who were asked to join. We all accepted the invitation. Several residents were invited and eagerly accepted as well. Stretch was the only member invited who declined the offer. Y'all don't need a convict on the board. It just looks funny, he said. Besides, I am helping out just fine where you put me. Corey accepted his decline of the offer and moved forward with the rest of us. The president's speech came two days later. Our ham guys already had it scheduled. Every day it seemed that the radio stations were advertising the speech as the first one in nearly four months. I was sure that everyone with access would be listening, regardless of their affiliations before the day. Mike had never been a fan of the current administration, yet I was told he would be on the front lines to protect them. We had a talk about it before he left and I joked that he was hired to protect the men he never voted for and probably would never invite over for dinner. You're right, he replied, but it's bigger than men and women. It's the office, the head people tasked with leading us, and I have a job to do. Whether or not I agree with their policies is not my concern. They run the country you and I live in, and my job is to see them live to see another day. I'll die doing just that and smile at the end. I know, I said having learned some basic fundamentals from him. I'm going to write one heck of a book about you someday. I don't care what you say about me. Just spell my name right, Mike replied. Levin. What? I asked. Levin, Mike, L-E-V-I-N, Levin. I laughed aloud, realizing I had never asked. So Slavic, right? Close, Russian, like Vlad? Yeah, just like him, minus the heavy accent. What does it mean? I asked. Lion. Of course, I exclaimed. I always just assumed you were of European descent. Yeah, I am. Technically, Russia is part of both Europe and Asia, but my town is on the European side. I need to brush up on my geography, I admitted. I only met two Russians in my whole life. And you're both nuts, I said. But you are both like brothers now, and I owe each of you a debt I can never repay. Does Vlad know about this? Of course, Mike said. I grew up here, but was born maybe two hours drive from where he grew up. He's always known. It's part of why I left Javi with him. We're brothers or maybe cousins in a way, and he always does right by me. I would too, you know, have taken in your son. I do, but you and Joy have three perfect boys, and Vlad and Anna have none. They are the right choice, and I always knew if anything happened to Sheila, that's where he should be. The president's speech was short and, well, presidential. My fellow Americans, this is your president. I realize communications have been sporadic as we work to rebuild our great country once again. I can assure you that your government is intact and working hard every day to bring back our status as a world leader. We have some trials just ahead of us, but I'm confident we will come through the other side a stronger nation, and we shall work together, hand in hand, to rebuild this once great land. Listen, we are doing our part, and ask that you help us by doing yours. Take care of your neighbors, friends, and communities, and together we will build back stronger, stay vigilant, and may God bless the new United States of America. That was quick, I said to Vlad, getting a nod in agreement. 
There's not much to tell, I suppose, without giving up secrets, he replied. I'm sure there are a lot of others listening to these broadcasts across the country and the world. The radio static balanced out, and the DJ came back on briefly. This is JJ from Radio Free America. No commercials, no propaganda, just information and music. Stay sharp, my fellow Americans. We have word that farmers are on the sea. I repeat, farmers are on the sea with an ETA of less than a month. Now here's an oldie from Huey Lewis. Why would they come here? asked Vlad. The one-child policy has been revoked. Has it? I asked. Yes, in 2015, officially. It sounds diplomatic, but unless you're in the thick of it, there's no way to tell it's not the same old behind the scenes, I added. Okay, then let's say it's them, the people, the outcasts like those here in the 1700s. How would they get ships to take them here? I mean, I doubt they built one, and the government for sure wouldn't give them any. I think they will, I replied. I think they will lend them as many ships as they want to bring them here. It's a long-term play. They send in their people regardless of their beliefs, unarmed and ready to work. Later on, an occupation is soft. Just switch out families with military disguised as farmers. And eventually the wolves are in the hen house. It may be a 10-year plan or longer, but it could work. By then the land is being worked, the timber harvested and minerals dug. Plus, a billion Chinese, as they say, need more resources. I think that's what Mike and Sergio are a part of, plus Jessup in some way, preventing this from happening in the first place. I mean, these ships must dock if they are going to unload thousands of would-be Chinese farmers on our soil. There is no place to dock that's not heavily guarded, I'll bet, and they have to decide quickly when to turn back or risk running out of fuel, water, and food mid-journey. A ship that size with no sail and out of fuel is at the mercy of the sea, and they know it. Plus, it wouldn't take long for modern-day pirates to take control of the vessels and sell to the highest bidder. I see your point, said Vlad, but taking over a Chinese ship that size would take a massive attack, don't you think? What I think is a bunch of would-be farmers and their families are on a large ship with minimal security forces. They get stranded midway home, out of fuel and low on food and water. The hijackers offer food, water, and board in their country, likely closest to the hijack spot. They gain ships and workers for the cost of room and board. Or they could just intercept them on the way and literally have thousands of Chinese farmers in Libya or Algeria working the soil and parking billions of dollars of ships in their ports awaiting sale. And if the terrorist groups around the globe don't get involved quickly, they will miss out on a huge opportunity. They can be vicious and godless, but they are not stupid. Chapter 19, Tennessee. Mike woke up or more accurately was awakened by the bright light shone in his face. He instinctively swatted the flashlight out of the holder's hand. Sorry, man, the stranger spoke as he came into focus. I was just following orders. You two follow me, he added, pointing to Mike and Sergio. What time is it? Sergio asked, yawning. Early, is all the man said. Mike glanced over his shoulder as the others slept undisturbed. The early rising seemed to bother Sergio a little, Mike thought, but he himself hadn't had a good night's sleep since his sister Lily was killed, and he was pretty sure he never would. It was just another day. Get up early, late, whatever, he mumbled, holding out his hands in a who-cares pose to no one. At least the cook's up, too, said Sergio, as they were led into the cafeteria for the last time. Bacon or sausage, gentlemen? asked the chef. Never mind. You're the only ones up. Want both? Sure, replied Mike, rounding out his tray with the classics he was sure they wouldn't see again anytime soon. He was reminded of the first time he ate at a FEMA camp, surprised by all the choices he thought he would never see again. Hamburgers, spaghetti, desserts, french fries, and those ketchup packets that kept popping up in government-run facilities. More of those damn ketchup packets, he said aloud, getting a, so what, out of Sergio. Never mind, I'll tell you the story later, replied Mike. Breakfast was good and Mike tipped the chef slash server slash dishwasher slash host one silver coin, realizing he hadn't spent one in months. Thanks, mister, came the reply, as the food guy turned it over in his fingers and commented on the wait. Come back any time, fellas, he said, as Mike and Sergio brought near-empty trays up and walked out the door. Glad that's over, said Sergio, out of earshot of the cafeteria. What's over? asked Mike. The endless supply of food would make us fat and lazy. If I spent two months here, they would have to roll my fat a... 
Gentlemen, came the call from behind them. A higher pitch than the guys they hung around with the most. Both turned on a dime and saw her. The name tag said Carter, but they both assumed it was a last name. Mike did an initial three-second assessment and figured Sergio was doing the same. You know, the first three seconds to say if she's maybe a possibility or not. The first glance is the face, of course, then a quick body scan, and finally a subtle peek at the left-hand ring finger. Yep, yep, nope, they both mumbled before Mike patted his newish friend on the shoulder. It's all you, he whispered. Gentlemen, she said again, slightly blushing at the silent shakedown, even if it were only a gaze. Gentlemen, my name is Carter, but most around here call me Amanda. I'm, well, let's just call me your transitional coordinator. That means I am responsible for your next move and the one after that. So before you ask any questions, let me run over a few things. I work for the Colonel Rana and no one else. If I tell you to jump, you can assume there is a rattlesnake next to your foot. Duck means drop everything and get out. Run is full retreat. No superhero BS here. I'm tasked with keeping you two alive. Anything else? Asked Sergio flirtatiously. Yes, this, she said, pointing to herself and waving her hand from top to bottom, is off limits. She felt funny saying that, as she had never before had the chance. There were no homecoming dances, no long-term relationships, and very few first dates in her life thus far. She wasn't a bombshell, but thought herself cute and maybe a strong six, or even a low seven, if she was made up and a guy got her humor. Are you sure? said Sergio. I can be pretty charming when I want something, he replied with a smile. Do your job, all of it with no mistakes, and maybe I'll let you buy me a coffee, she said with a half smile. Guess we're on the clock, big guy, said Mike, grabbing Sergio's shoulder. Let's get this done. They walked to the end of the hall, with Amanda following close behind. Wait there, she pointed at two double steel doors at the end of the long corridor. As her pin said, Amanda or Carter talked into the radio, with both the outgoing and incoming conversation muffled. My two are in place, awaiting mission transport. Over. Stand clear of the doors, she called out just before they opened like a garage door. But instead of a driveway, there was only open space as far as Mike could see. I know we're not out of the country, Sergio said aloud. The helicopter flight wasn't near long enough. You're right, she replied from behind. And there's your next transportation, she added, pointing to two ATVs parked side by side in desert camo with side gun racks loaded. I thought we were flying in, said Sergio. Nope replied Amanda. You're close as we can get you safely in the air. Three, maybe four days max, and you will be at ground zero. You're loaded up with food, water, and ammo, and we'll keep an eye on you, she added, pointing to the biggest drone Mike had ever seen. What is that thing? asked Mike. It looks like a spaceship. More on that later, she replied. So, to be clear, asked Sergio, following behind Mike, when I make it back, I can buy you a coffee. She smiled, saying, Good luck, soldiers, and turning as the doors closed behind them. Am I in? Sergio asked Mike. I mean, she's hot, right? She didn't answer, though. I wonder what that means. She did smile, so that's something, right? Are you going to answer me or what? I figured I would let you finish all your questions first, Mike replied. She probably is totally into you, and she had to get you out the door before she did something unprofessional, and she most likely will have trouble functioning at a basic level until you return. Unless, of course, she hooks up with the chef at the buffet. The man with the food? I thought it was only guys that responded to that. But remember, the saying goes, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Yeah, I remember hearing that, replied Mike, now only messing with Sergio for the fun of it. But now every meal that doesn't suck is a top priority for both men and women. All I'm saying is, if he makes her chicken cacciatore with heirloom tomatoes and feta cheese salad and baklava for dessert, you are out of the running, my friend. That's as good as being Vince Neal from Motley Crue in his dressing room back in the mid-80s. Screw that guy, replied Sergio, laughing with Mike. That chef is no Vince Neal or that other guy, the drummer, Tom something. But I do see your point. Let's just hope there is a fire in the kitchen and she has to live on MREs until I get back, he added, pointing to the drone now flying no more than 20 feet over their heads. What do you bet that thing has audio and listens to everything we say? Probably, replied Mike, adding. Don't embarrass yourself. I never do, brother. I never do. 
They headed out side by side like Ponch and John from that old L.A. motorcycle cop show, one of Mike's favorite shows growing up. But now they were on four-wheelers, and the bad guys could be anywhere. Good job, guys. You're on your way, came the sound from each bike. Mike and Sergio simultaneously reached to the right compartment near the handlebars, following the voice command. Eyes open, follow the map, and I'll check in as needed. Time to see what's cooking in the kitchen, she said, holding her hand over her mouth so as not to giggle. Mmm, smells like chicken. I guess we're being chaperoned, called out Mike over the hum of the motors and pointing to the radio and the biggest drone either of them had ever seen, hovering above them. Mike thought that at eight feet wide, roughly 16 feet long, and a thick belly. It looked a lot like a tiny version of the ship from Star Trek. He couldn't help but laugh aloud at the nearby two-foot by four-foot sticker on the bottom, reading, Made in China. I hope that's a joke, he added, pointing up. It is, replied Sergio. Arona special. He's around too. We haven't seen him here, but he is. I can feel it. And that sticker is a reminder. I never took him for a joking kind of guy, said Mike. I assure you he is. You know that whole coffee barista long-haired guy act? Wait, that was an act? Asked Mike. I almost shot the guy. It wasn't only an act, but started as a bet with the colonel that he could amass a large following of people posing as a former coffee server. It was like $1.50 he won. Of course, it's not worth anything now, but that's his personality. Is that a good thing that he's here, I mean? Asked Mike. Oh, yeah. The looker, uh, Amanda. I mean, maybe our eyes and ears with that machine up there. But Rana is calling the shots. I guarantee it. I believe you, replied Mike, adding. I remember watching him through binoculars on our trek to Colorado, and he and his men took out helos with rockets. Of course, then I thought he was on the wrong side of things and just a coffee barista. Ha, he had you fooled, huh? All of us, replied Mike, remembering back to the day he first met him, sitting in a tent like some Buddhist monk on a mountain. The trail, or farm road more accurately, turned to blacktop, and they wove around vehicles that nobody thought to move since the day. Keep an eye out, gentlemen. Any of these vehicles could be hiding someone or something, came her voice from each radio. We have heat sensors on EXO, but the distance is not great, so we need your eyes also. What's EXO mean? asked Sergio. Kind of a gamer name, meaning exoskeleton or strength-enhancing motorized frame, worn by a person. But ours lives above, somewhere between the heavens and our earthly selves. The two men exchanged confused looks without saying a word. For nearly 30 minutes, they could have been on a leisurely Sunday ride before the day. Like old times, called out Sergio when they heard the first crack. Down, came her voice from the radio. On the ground now. Both men hit the brakes hard, skidding to a stop like bad guys in those action movies when they are full throttle, coming up on a police roadblock. Jumping off their machines and crawling across the ground, each tried to figure out the direction of the fire. Shots came one after another some high and others low, but more coordinated with every second. Stay down, guys. We've got this, an excited Amanda yelled into the radio. Got what? Mike yelled, looking over at Sergio, who already had his rifle at the ready. Whoosh, came the sound over their heads, only ten feet up. What the? asked Mike, as the small rocket went into the trees, exploding with a boom. Two more followed in short succession, along with an onslaught of gunfire from the drone hovering above. Wait, what? asked Mike aloud. The drone did that? More shots flew towards them, with several pings off the drone just overhead, followed by another flurry from the hovering machine, and all was quiet. Did we get them? Sergio asked on the radio. Hold your position, was all she said in response. <laughs> The unmistakable sound of a machine or swarm of bees filled their ears. Look at that! Mike pointed upward as three small drones flew out of the large one, all on different trajectories. Like those forward observer soldiers back in Vietnam, said Sergio. Except these are machines. They dipped and turned, scouring the area as far as Mike could see before returning to home base. All clear, boys, let's go, said an excited Amanda, followed by, I love this job. Did you do that? asked Sergio. Or some gamer turned military assassin? Both, I guess, she replied, adding, I'm the gamer. That's enough questions for now, chimed in a deep voice that needed no introduction. Yes, sir, Rona, they both replied. But what about the drone, asked Sergio. 
I heard it get hit. 30 more seconds, said Rona, and the internal audit will be complete. These things are made to handle return fire. 10 seconds, she stated, and you're good. Head out. They did as instructed, with the drone rising to maybe 100 feet to clear the tall pines, Mike guessed. At least we're getting out of the open, said Sergio. Adding an extra cover is always a plus. A hundred yards up the road, they saw the aftermath of the encounter they had no part of. Mike counted 13, and Sergio argued it was 14. Men down, with two vehicles on fire, and thick black smoke billowing into the sky. Well, if the bad guys weren't sure where we were before, they are now, said Sergio. Glad I'm not afraid to die. They made their way southeast, both contemplating the fact that they had been involved in a skirmish where neither had participated or even fired a single shot, and they came out victorious. Why not just drone the president over to Gitmo, Mike thought, but didn't say aloud. Passing through farmland on back roads, the few people they saw just stared up in the sky, and only one small group fired on Exo, quickly wishing they hadn't. There's a house a few miles up this road, came her voice on the radio late afternoon. It's secure in one of ours. I'll let you know when you get there, and you won't leave until dawn. It's up on your right, she said 15 minutes later, the blue one with the tile roof. Looks like something out of California, not Tennessee, said Mike. That's where we are, right? It looks like it, and I guess that's the point, replied Sergio. Welcome was crudely scratched out on a piece of paper taped to the front door. Something tells me it's unlocked, said Sergio, trying the front door and finding it so. Settle in, gentlemen, the note started as the two men heard the massive drone settle on the roof with a thud. There is food in the cooler, a barbecue out back, and drinks. Sorry, no more booze until your mission is complete. Colonel's orders. Just leave it as you found it. That's easy, said Mike, walking around the main floor. Did you catch the Wi-Fi code or where the remote is? He said with a grin. Nope, my phone has had crap for service lately anyway, but... Wait a minute, just one minute he added, picking up a remote control, the only thing on top of the 70-inch TV. Wait for it, Sergio announced. Yep, solar-powered TV, baby, he added, checking the drawers on the curio cabinet. Crap, he said, tossing one disc case over his shoulder. Nope, he said, with the same gesture, followed up six more times before announcing, I found it. Mike, without thinking, picked up the CDs strewn across the floor. Pretty woman. Sleepless in Seattle, Beaches, The Breakfast Club. Well, maybe, but the rest are, I mean, who's been staying here, really? It does not matter, said Sergio, because I happen to have found two that make up for all. The rest of that is crap, including The Breakfast Club, although Emilio Estevez did a pretty good job. I present to you two classics, The Deer Hunter and Apocalypse Now, proudly holding each up in the air. What's in the cooler? Stuff, but looks good, Mike replied. I'll get the grill going if you'll check those discs to see if they work. The unmistakable sound of the front door deadbolts engaging stopped the mid-conversation, followed by the commands, Halt! Turn around! Now booming from somewhere overhead, followed by two ammunition rounds fired. Ne Both men grabbed for their rifles that they never ventured far from. I've got the front, shouted Sergio. You cover the back! The robotic sound from the roof was silenced, followed by the radio chirp. Hey guys, all good, she said. Just had some nosy neighbors is all. Don't worry, I've got you. Bye for now. What in the world is going on? Asked Mike with a grin that was edging towards a laugh he wouldn't be able to subdue. What? Asked Sergio, looking at the movies again as if nothing had happened. The way I see it, your hot gamer girlfriend is protecting you. It's a good thing you have her around, he added, now not trying to hide his own laughter. You joke, but I don't even mind it. Let her stay up all night while I get my sleep. I'm sure we will get shot at tomorrow anyway. For now, we got some original badasses played by Brando, Sheen, the dad, I mean Fishburne, Duvall, Hopper, and Ford. And who could forget the crazy hot Cynthia Wood? It's the whole package right here. The movies didn't disappoint and only skipped twice briefly. Neither man cared, constantly reminded day in and day out of what lay just outside the front door. It's that time. Mike called upstairs from the kitchen the following morning. Breakfast and back to work. That's probably how she got the job with the colonel. Huh? Asked Mike. Did I miss the first part of this conversation? No, replied Sergio. I was just thinking. 
I bet she got in some trouble hacking into a government website or files, got busted, and then was offered a job doing the exact same thing. Those gamer types are always getting into cyber trouble. I think it happens a lot. Well, before at least. Chapter 20. Headed to Florida. It Departure in 20 minutes, gentlemen. Less chat and more eats, she called over the radio, as if she heard their entire conversation. I hope you got some rest. It's going to be a hell of a day, I think. We have a couple of our machines scouting the trek ahead. We will clear it out, best we can, but keep on your toes today. It will be a full 10-hour ride to the next safe house, with a gas stop in between, like yesterday. Why didn't they just drop us off? Asked Sergio into the radio. It would have taken a few hours at most. I'm sorry I can't answer that officially, but I think they don't want any big equipment marking any potential locations you may be headed to. And it's always a good idea to let our citizens know we still hold some power here. Just my opinion, though, she clarified. Where's our next stop? Asked Mike, having an idea already of the answer. Classified, she replied immediately, adding, but I'm sure you're not surprised. Does she have a sister? He asked Sergio jokingly. No, she responded quickly, getting a busted look out of both men. The ride today was harder than Mike or his riding partner thought it would be, and halfway through, it looked as if God himself were putting on a show. There were clouds mixed with rain off and on throughout the morning. No lightning, though, he announced to Sergio two hours into the trek. Mike thought that each side road they took looked like the one headed to Jesse's place in Plano, way back when this first started, but it was different now somehow. The farmers and whoever else wandering about were still there, but they didn't engage in any way, none hostile, blocking the passage or looking for help. It was as if they were part of the plan, as if a week ago, part of the deal had been forged as they moved through occupied territories. Had some peace ambassadors paved the way? Hey, we have some badass soldiers coming through here next week. Don't do anything stupid, Mike thought. Mike always considered himself a simple man, violent when called for, but tried to get along with anyone not treating him or a friend badly. He liked that about Jessup back in Plano and couldn't help thinking of Kelly. She had moved on, he heard straight from the horse's mouth, as they say, and still he wondered. So you're saying there's a chance, he heard in his head, followed by the preceding line of one of his favorite movies before the day, Dumb and Dumber. That preceding line is more like one in a million. What do you think, big guy? he asked aloud, looking up at a cloudy sky. He was met by the first lightning of the day, clear across the sky as he counted. One, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand. Boom! The thunder sounded like an explosion, even turning the drone off the path for a second or two. What the hell was that? called out Sergio. My answer, replied Mike. Just my answer. Clear as day, he added, shaking his head side to side. I wish you the best, Kelly. Really, I do, he said under his breath at the same time, wondering if he was getting soft. The rain came down slowly at first, but five minutes in was like a dam breaking high in the sky. Crack, crack. The sound from up ahead was unmistakable. This is you, boys, said Rona on the radio. We've lost visibility and our machine needs to land until this storm passes. So hold your position and don't mess with my machine. Got it? Yes, sir. They both replied, ducking behind two large pine trees. Voices heard in the distance came closer as the shooting stopped. What are those backwoods boys doing? asked Sergio. I see now, he added, looking through his rifle scope at nearly 20 men, most in overalls or mismatched clothing, and all sporting some type of hunting rifle. Only a few shotguns were visible 50 yards ahead, and they all walked straight up the road. Mike, what do you think? he said, calling over to his friend. I wouldn't mind a good brawl, but that's a few more than I could probably handle myself unless you're in, he replied. I mean, they know we're here, obviously. No, I'm not in with a 20 to 2 ratio. On three, let's put a couple of rounds over their heads and see if we can turn them down the road. One, two, and both men fired two rounds into the air, just above the advancing group's heads, with at least one round ricocheting off a nearby tree. It was enough to stop them in their tracks and get on the ground. Mike scanned the terrain with his scope, finding four or five headshots if he was steady, and they didn't move. I can take out four, maybe five from here, the ones in front, called Mike to Sergio. Can you get any of the ones in the back? Uh, I've got three behind the first row I can hit if they stay down, 
but that still leaves a dozen or more if they scatter. It looks like you're outnumbered, came a yell from down the road. Mike and Sergio stayed quiet. Maybe they ran off, Sergio heard one man say. Nope, said the first man. They're here. Just got scared is all. Here's the way it's going to go, the man continued. We want your bikes, weapons, and that there flying contraption you got following you. You give that up, and you can walk on out of here back the way you came, and then you're someone else's problem. Straight back, boys, said Amanda over their radios. Straight back, behind the machine. Why? asked Sergio. They still have to come through us. Plus, they want your drone, sounds like. We can take them. Fall back, soldiers, behind the machine at least 30 yards, and take your four-wheeler keys with you came Rona's voice over the same radio. Yes, sir, said Sergio, as both men retrieved their keys and fell back one tree at a time. I don't like this one bit, Sergio whispered to Mike. I mean, retreating is not in my DNA. Mine either, brother, but we have to trust they know what's going on, I guess. The rain was now only a trickle. Sorry, Exo, said Sergio as they passed the machine, with a steady buzz and light circling as they hadn't seen before. Something's happening with that thing, said Mike, resisting the urge to touch it. All right, soldiers, get low and hold that position, said Rana, once they were clear. They saw the men rifling through the gear on the four-wheelers, thankfully just some extra clothes and water. After attempting to start one, more than one man searched the ground for a key. The rest walked slowly and steadily up the road towards EXO. Hold your fire. They have more than you can see, looks like, instructed Rona. How would they know? Mike started to ask before hearing the buzz high overhead. Oh, eyes in the sky, he said, answering his own question. Look at Exo, said Sergio, looking through his rifle scope in disbelief. What is that thing? Asked Mike, seeing it too. Exo glowed on and off, one, two, or three seconds each time, changing color in a rainbow effect. A low whoosh, whoosh sound was emitted from the machine, so powerful it echoed through the trees. Sergio thought it was like something out of the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie. He had heard of these types of things, which most thought were from another world, but had never seen one up close. Look, whispered Mike, you can see right through it. Wait for it in five, four, three. Exo became clear for two seconds at the one countdown, and it was like looking through a piece of glass. A computer dashboard, similar to a plane's cockpit, lit inside and illuminated objects that Mike and Sergio couldn't make out at first. They both rose slowly from the ground. Soldiers, stay put, barked Rana over the radio. Mike was in a trance-like state with an overwhelming sense to walk straight out and to the machine. He only half noticed the men walking slowly up the road in a zombie-like state, weapons pointed toward the ground or in the air. Hold your position, soldiers, and look away from our machine. Mike barely heard the command, and it was Sergio grabbing him by the shoulder that startled him, firing a single shot into the trees. What's going on? asked Mike, confused. Don't look, said Sergio, only training his sights on the men advancing. It's the machine. It's drawing them in. I don't know how, but if we're not careful, we will be the same, and something tells me it won't end up good. So we just sit here and wait? asked Mike. Yes, I think that's it, replied Sergio. Whoosh, whoosh got louder, and the trees moved around them as if in a steady wind. Nearly half of the men they had seen at the beginning were stopped in front of Exo, staring robotically at the lights. Sergio trained his scope on their faces and deliberately not on the machine. Don't do it, said Sergio. Don't touch it. A buzzing sound, followed by sickening screams and smoke, rose above the trees. The man shook violently, as if in an electric chair past the last second that the governor's pardon could have saved him. Thirty seconds, long after the screams were no more, he dropped to the ground. He won't do that again, said Sergio, still not believing what he saw. Okay, boys, who next? He whispered. The rest of the men stared, wide-eyed, as Exo dialed down like an airplane, cutting its engines, arriving at the gate. They talked amongst themselves with only a few words Sergio could make out, like spaceship, alien craft, and what now? Sergio and Mike watched as one man, apparently not the smartest one in the bunch, picked up a large stick from the ground and reached out to touch the now metallic-looking machine. I ain't sure that's a good idea, Earl, said another. I think he's right, Earl, whispered Sergio aloud. But I'm not going to stop you, he added, feeling like it was the last play in a Super Bowl that could win it or lose. 
the kind where they toss the ball back to each other four or five times as they run down the field, hoping for a miracle. Both he and Mike were mesmerized as the man lightly poked the machine, jumping back instinctively. See, said Earl, it didn't do nothing, just scared me is all. Do it again, Earl, said Sergio, now fully engaged in the happenings. Go ahead, Earl, slap that bear on the A. Earl poked it a second time, harder, engaging the lights once more in a high-pitched siren that had Sergio and Mike both covering their ears, but still watching in their scopes. Mike felt the ground swell, like the only earthquake he had ever experienced in Nevada. Not the biggest anyone ever experienced, but a 5.1 when visiting Reno in 2008 gave him a feeling he didn't like, that of not being in control. This was similar, except the shakes came in waves, pushing him and Sergio back a foot or more with each pulse. Stay down, came Amanda's voice from the radio. The men around XO opened fire all at once. Each shot pinged off the machine, ricocheting upwards in all directions. Men hollered out a few more screams. When they paused, five were on the ground. Zzzz. The sound reminded Mike of the steady buzz of humming bees around their hive. Exo's top spun like a jar lid, with its robotic arm turning counterclockwise to the side. The men stood there dumbfounded, watching the metal contraption rise up from the belly of the machine. Face down on the ground, Amanda called into the radio when the shooting started. One by one, only seconds apart, the announcement target acquired followed the red light on each man followed immediately by two rounds, hitting the mark. Target acquired, they heard, one after another. The terrified men started scattering as the tempo increased. Target acquired, crack, crack, target acquired, crack, crack. Two minutes later, which felt like 30 to Mike, the barrel retracted and the lid buzzed back into place. Hold in place, said Amanda, as the small drone, already in the air, zigzagged back and forth across the immediate area and out a quarter mile in each direction. Five minutes later, she gave the all clear command. Back to your rides, boys, she said, and watch out for a few wounded. N Mike wanted to ask if they should gather the weapons. It was now as ingrained in him as brushing his teeth. He reached down to grab a rifle. They don't want these, said Sergio. Leave them. What about ammo? Asked Mike. Not that either. They bought up more than a billion rounds before it happened. Leave it. Maybe it will help someone down the road. Only a few men, out of the 16 or so Mike saw, showed any signs of life. Crack, lit up the woods as one took his life. Two left, said Mike, drawing his pistol. Leave them, said Rana over the radio. If they survive, then we have someone to tell the story, and it's one we want to be told. Got it, said Mike holstering his pistol but keeping an eye on the two men in case they got any ideas of continuing the fight. You okay, Exo? Asked Mike aloud, half expecting an answer or full-on conversation about it. The strong, silent type, he added, after not getting a response. Reaching their bikes again, they were instructed to wait for the internal audit, the same as before. Ten seconds left, she said. Wait, wait, stay put for a few, guys. We have some internal damage to EXO. I'm accessing the data now. Stay vigilant and hold on. We're about 10 minutes delayed. Both men looked back towards the machine, which was emitting noises and colors they hadn't seen before. What's it doing? Asked Mike. Repairing itself, I think, said Sergio. What? Well, I heard, speculation only, of course, that the crafts they do or don't officially have out at Roswell were mostly intact and functional. So? So they may have been too damaged to fly, but we possibly reverse-engineered the technology we understood and tried to learn from the rest. We can do that, asked Mike, and... Sure, replied Sergio, we already do. Like when a drone like EXO over there, or an airplane, helicopter, or any piece of military equipment gets caught behind enemy lines, the government studies it to see if they can learn anything from the technology. Even allies that find they are in possession of something new will take the time to test the technology if it's different from their own before handing it back over to wherever it came from. It can make for an awkward exchange, for sure, when one ally is spying on another and gets caught red-handed. But every country does it, and it's why power countries stay mostly even, in technology and weaponry, at least. I'd never heard that, admitted Mike, but it makes sense. It's the elephant in the room at those international conferences. That's why I never watch much TV, but I watched those when they were televised especially when the big dogs were all there, like us, China, 
Russia, England, and then you throw Iran or North Korea into the mix just to ramp up the pressure. When you know what you're looking for, no movie or courtroom in the country can equal that kind of tension. It's my version of high-stakes reality TV, I guess. Ask me about a Kardashian and I couldn't tell you a thing, but ask me who pissed off Putin in the last summit and I can name four leaders off the top of my head. All right, boys, we are fixed up and ready to go. Wait, Exo fixed himself, asked Mike. I'll let Serge explain it off the air and I never said Exo was a he, Amanda said. Let's head out, boys, she added as Exo lifted off the ground and hovered just above the treetops. Did you catch that? asked Sergio, turning his radio all the way down. About Exo? No, she called me Serge, not Sergio or Soldier or Guy. Like a pet name. Like Smoochy Face or Sweetie Pie Honey Bunch or... That's all I got, said Mike, joking with a serious look on his face. No, like, I really want to get a coffee with that stud down there. Once he finishes all his macho man stuff and walks into camp, I'll like, Hey, I'm here. It's no big deal. Just fought off a hundred men and a couple of tigers, but... Whatever, replied Sergio, cracking Mike's facade. You crack me up, Serge, said Mike, and not a lot of people can do that. I can't, I can't even, said Amanda over the radio. Signing off now. Hit the road. The skies opened up slowly at first, but more and more over the next two hours, with the sun shining through. We have a gas stop five miles up the road, said Amanda. You'll have an additional ten minutes to take a, well, a fifteen-minute break. So, how did EXO get fixed? asked Mike, wanting to ask the question for a few hours now. He didn't exactly, Amanda replied. You see, there were duplicate systems likely. For example, let's say you have a light bulb that burns out in your house and you don't have a replacement. That light can't be fixed until you do, but you can turn on another light in the vicinity and you're still able to see. It's not perfect, but it works. Same with EXO. Part of the system got damaged, so they bypassed it and turned on a backup system. There's even more than one backup, and unless the whole thing is destroyed, it's usually enough to hold off until an actual person can repair it. That's crazy, said Mike. We went back 100 years in an instant, but we still have technology that should be 100 years in the future. Exactly, replied Sergio. And if people before or now knew that, it would have scared the hell out of them. That kind of knowledge was dripped out slowly over many years. People can handle a lot if it's a slow build, but all at once, knowledge can be disastrous to the average person. Even then, it's not foolproof. News outlets, government reports, and even mainstream superhero movies have been talking about EMPs for years. Most people have heard the term a dozen or more times, and it was still a shock when it actually happened. Time to go, boys. Okay, Amy, replied Sergio, testing out a theory. You can call me Amanda or Carter. Got that, Serge? He shook his head, whispering, I'm confused. They are not to be understood, just appreciated, Mike replied. And we're back! Mike shouted to Sergio, passing a 40-something-year-old woman carrying a water container on her head. As a young boy, he remembered seeing that, sneaking a peek at National Geographic magazines with his friends, up to no good, of course. But some of the women carried baskets of water on their heads in lands far away. Now it was here, right here. Like turning the clock back 100 years in an instant, he thought. Boom. The rest of the day was uneventful, boring by both men's standards. Mike thought the new house was the same as the last, give or take. Plenty of food, a TV, and a few videos. Tonight was Rambo 3, the 1988 third edition of the popular series. Fitting for tomorrow's journey, it would turn out. I beat him, said Sergio, walking down the stairs the following morning into an empty kitchen. Nah, called out Mike from the living room. I'm just getting caught up on a book I started years ago and found it here, he said, pointing to a wall of books, some classics and others only a few years old. That's about right, said Sergio, looking at the title Mike held in his hands, Lord of the Flies. I'm only partway through, but it's getting good. These kids are brutal. I think it's great, replied Sergio. I didn't even know you could read, he added with a chuckle. Didn't you ever watch that series called Dexter? It's the smart ones you have to look out for. I'll bet you just watched the movie, Mike retorted. Guilty, replied Sergio. But it was good, I remember. Anyway, I've got breakfast this morning, he added, scouting through the cooler and creating a hodgepodge of cereal, smoked sausage, and half-stale bread. 
You've outdone yourself, Serge, as Mike liked to call him now. If I don't chip a tooth on this bread, it will be a good day, he added, tapping it on the counter with a clink. They both ate like campers a week into a two-week trip, not leaving a scrap. Chapter 21 Headed to Florida Good morning, guys, they heard Amanda's voice over Sergio's radio. We're out in 15, so eat quick. Don't you want to know how we slept? Sergio asked sarcastically. Nope. My job is to keep you two alive. Whatever you lovebirds do on your own time is none of my business. Ouch, said Mike aloud, adding, she may be a harder catch than you thought. But seriously, boys, time to go, she said. We have a schedule, believe it or not, and I'm never late. A cool dew hung from the trees, wrapped in a blanket of thick fog. Easy, boys, she said soothingly, as a mother might speak to a child on the first day of kindergarten. Visibility is 20 feet, maybe 30 if you're lucky. Bad things can happen on a day like this. I believe it, Sergio responded into his radio. I've seen every psycho movie ever made, and one thing most have in common is dense fog at some point in the flick, and someone always ends up dead. Exactly my point, she responded, as if they were only casually discussing scary movies in general. Plus, there's the bounty, she added. What bounty, asked Sergio. You guys don't listen to the radio much, I guess. No, said Sergio. Same for me, remarked Mike. Well, it seems that you two have made a bit of a name for yourselves over the past year. They are calling you the New World Hope, and you each have a bounty on your head. How much? asked Sergio excitedly. Oh, I don't know, a bit, she replied. How much, Amanda? he insisted. Oh, all right, Sergio, but you asked. You have a bounty of $1.10K in gold and or silver, pre-EMP value, of course. And Mike? Sergio asked before she could continue. The same, right? About that, she said, pausing. It seems Mike has quite a following from numerous eyewitnesses on his trip to Colorado from Texas. Some have been on the radio telling stories about saving kids from kidnappers and pit fights to save women from abuse. Then there was something about rattlesnakes and motorcycles. But that last part is just hearsay, I'm told. Kind of a modern-day, old-school, post-apocalyptic superhero. Mike. Your bounty is $100,000 in gold and or silver, dead or alive. And before you ask, I don't know who's paying it. Ten times, argued Sergio. His is ten times more than mine. I don't see this as a contest you want to win, said Amanda. Just saying. Now let's get focused and eyes and ears open, gentlemen. It's as foggy as I've ever seen it, said Sergio, dropping the previous conversation for now. Well, Mike chimed in. If we can't see them, they can't see... The shooting started, seeming to come from every direction. Mike had never been a bona fide hunter, Sergio either, but both trained men knew the general rule. If you have something in your sights, you don't shoot from every direction toward it. But here they were, rounds from every angle, but all overhead. What's going on? Mike yelled. Look, said Sergio. Both men crouched low. Their drone was being attacked simultaneously by ten others, only a fraction of its size. They each grabbed their machine-mounted rifles. I love the AKs, announced Sergio. You don't see these every day, he added casually, as if there were no gunfire headed in their direction and it was the first time he had seen the weapon this trip. They're not shooting at us, Mike announced, looking to see the drone bobbing and weaving. Take out the eyes and you cripple the army, said Sergio. Crack, crack, crack. The fire was aimed at the dodging drone, followed by two booms in the opposite direction. Did those come from down the road? Asked Mike. Yeah, I think so replied Sergio, watching two small rockets plow into the trees with a boom, with fire rising at the end. Mike thought they were random yet coordinated, and its shield held up well, but some rounds seemed to be getting through. EXO fired back, but only in a singular direction. Mike raised his rifle before Sergio could tell him not to. Wait, wait, Mike. Don't shoot, he called out, grabbing the stock. We're outgunned right now. At least they're not firing on us, and we can't hit all of them at those speeds. What about EXO? asked Mike. EXO is a machine, that's it, replied Sergio. He or she, he said in case Amanda was listening, is a fighting butt-kicking for sure crazy versatile machine. A tool, same as our rifles and four-wheelers. It's not us, not one of us, just metal and wires. Yeah, I understand. I'm just used to protecting people or things, I guess, that do right by me first. You had better get your machine out of here, 
Sergio called into the radio, while you still have one. The large drone rose straight into the sky and disappeared without a response. Guess we're on our own. Now we can shoot, said Sergio. They're gone, announced Mike, as they both strained to hear the humming that filled the long valley only a minute ago. Hold your position, gentlemen, she called into the radios. Ixo is leading them into the kill zone. The what? asked Mike, curious and intrigued at the same time. The valley too over where we handle things like this in the area. They shouldn't be back, but I'll give you guys a heads up if they are headed your way. So a drone fight is all, of course, said Sergio. Never mind. We've got guns, highly competent men, and the biggest mission in the last century at least. No, let the drones fight and I'll just watch. Now I've seen everything. Now you know why they need a gamer to watch you guys, she said back in a few minutes. Do you really think she's a gamer, like she says? asked Mike in a whisper. Definitely, replied Sergio. She talks to us like a frat girl and not any military trained personnel I've ever heard of, and I have been here a long time. Ha, huh? replied Mike. But I wouldn't say that to her face if you ever want to talk to her again when this whole thing is over. I'll talk to her any way I want, he replied soberly. Of course, I'm just joking, he said, cracking a smile. The last thing I need is her chasing me around with her toys. Plus, I think the gaming thing is kind of hot, like a kindergarten school teacher, complete with the glasses. You know Van Halen had a song about that, right? asked Mike. Hot for teacher, replied Sergio, belting out a line or two of David's iconic lyrics. Of course, it's where I got the idea in the first place. Are you boys about done acting like 12-year-olds? came her voice over the radio, rendering them both tongue-tied and starting to blush. You heard that? asked Sergio. Never mind. Stupid question. I'm sorry he said, putting on a little accent. We didn't mean anything by it, right, Mike? Yep. Are you looking for a mother or a girlfriend, she asked. Uh, who are you asking, said Sergio, caught off guard and nervous for an answer more than he could ever remember since his father died. You silly, and if you haven't figured it out yet, I can hear everything, whether you have your finger on the call button, talking, yelling, whispering, or not. Yeah, kind of got that part now. Gunfire erupted, but sounded far off. Something's going down, said Mike. The threat has been neutralized, she announced over the radio two minutes later. You heard that line in a movie, right? Asked Sergio in a playful way. No, of course not. Okay, maybe. It sounded legit, right? So anyway, you're good to go. No more drones, at least for now. And we're almost fog free, so let's make up some time. Chapter 22, Jacksonville FEMA Camp. The third night had the guys outside Jacksonville, pulling into a FEMA camp just before dark. No movies tonight, gentlemen. You will start in the mess hall and have a little chat after dinner, she said over the radios. Chat? asked Sergio. Chat about what? It beats me, but I'm hungry, and that breakfast you made isn't cutting it, if I'm honest, replied Mike. Oh, that you are, Mike. Honest to a fault, Sergio stated, grabbing him on the shoulder. The chow line was out the door and they took their place at the end, soon becoming part of the middle as more people added on. This place is packed, Mike said. Yes, it's one of the country's largest camps, said Sergio. I think there's only one more in the state, Orlando, if I'm correct. Each man got a little extra put on their plate. Maybe they were the newcomers, just looked famished, or someone knew they were about to do something important. Neither man complained about it looking for an open seat in the packed cafeteria. Gentlemen, came the familiar voice from their right. Wait a minute, asked Mike. Is that Rona? Yeah, it's him all right. My boss, said Sergio. Yours too now. I've got one seat open, he said, pointing to Mike. Join me, Mike. And Sergio, there's a spot for you over there in the far corner. We will talk after dinner. Sure thing, boss, replied Sergio, wondering what Rona was doing here and where he would be sitting. Sergio walked towards the end of the cafeteria, seeing the back of a woman's head, light brown hair with a hint of curl, and just below shoulder length. He smiled, seeing two cups of coffee on the tabletop. Amanda, he said, smiling. You look like you've seen a ghost, Serge. There you go with the Serge's thing, he replied. But I like it. I wasn't expecting you or Rana here is all. To be honest, it was the very last thing I expected. I told you if you made it alive, I would have coffee with you. It's nothing fancy, but... It is hot water over beans, and that's still pretty good, she added. Are you okay? Yeah, I just have so many questions about how you are here 
and I am here and why we didn't all come together. Why we're having coffee yet if this is not the final destination. I'm guessing Mike is asking Rana the same, minus the coffee part. We will talk about it, the four of us, after dinner. Rana's orders, she added, followed by a zipper gesture across her lips, ending with a flirtatious smile. Until then, I'll watch you eat, and I'll drink my coffee, and no, I'm not a bird. I ate a little while ago, waiting for you guys. So now is your chance to ask me anything, she concluded. Sergio looked around the crowded room, thankful that it was filled with chatter, and not deathly quiet for his first question. Okay, do you have a boyfriend? Right to the kill shot she said, smiling. Well, no, we serious gamers tend to not be great at that sort of thing. But there's a difference now. How so? Before the day when the power went out, the EMP or whatever you want to call it, but before then, I was a late 20-something college dropout. Not because I couldn't hack it, no pun intended. Well, maybe a little, she said with a snort that he found anything but annoying. So, I dropped out of Stanford my senior year, much to my father's displeasure, and went to work for a video game company called Mind Blown. Want your mind blown? We'll blow your mind, she sang the tune he had heard on the radio a hundred times. So you're responsible for that annoying tune I can't get out of my head. I don't even play games, and I can't stop. Want your mind blown? We'll blow your mind, he sang a bit off-key. No, not me, actually, but it was catchy in a nerdy, simplistic way, I guess. So to be clear... No boyfriend, right? Affirmative, soldier, she stated. Next question. Don't you want to ask me that same question? Asked Sergio. I know you don't have a boyfriend, she replied. I already asked Rana. Sorry, she snorted. I'm just messing with you. I'm a smartass, I know. But I do know a lot more about you than you know about me. So, unless you met a girl on your way here, I know you don't have a current girlfriend. There were some cute ones in Georgia. I'm not going to lie he said, not keeping a straight face. Oh, I bet those southern girls have all the charm and those legs long as the horizon, she added. Maybe Mike was right. I'm not sure I could handle you. I think you can, she smiled. Next question, Serge. <laughs> okay, where are you from and how did you end up here attacking shooters with drones? I'm the girl next door, I guess, but the kind that never comes outside, from a tiny resort town in California, Lake Arrowhead. For the record, I don't shoot anyone even the bad guys. I'm not cleared to, nor would I want to. I just drive and make sure we get our property back. Your boss does the hard part. As for the part of ending up here, it was part fate and part arrogance. While I was working for Mind Blown, a few of my friends, the nerdiest of them, I mean, told me they had joined a contest to hack into a government site. The contest was military-sponsored and dubbed unhackable after nearly three years of their personnel trying to do it. Anyway, it was almost a joke to put it out to the public, and the prize was $500K in cash for anyone successful enough to get in and leave their calling card. I was on a deadline for a new gaming system and didn't have time to mess with it, but my friends were consumed by it. Fast forward a month and nobody had done it. Even though the contest was only open to U.S. residents, I heard people from all over the world were trying to break the code. Six weeks into it, my friends started working together, vowing they would split the money three ways. Two weeks after that, I finished my project and committed to giving them one week of my time for 10% of the prize if we could do it. Am I boring you? No, not at all. I think it's really interesting. Not what I was expecting to hear, but interesting. Please continue. And thanks for the coffee, I forgot to say. Sure, well, I got sucked into feeling my friends were getting closer than anyone else I had heard of at the time. They were burned out and took a weekend holiday to California, Newport Beach. Long story short, I didn't go. And on the third day, with three hours of sleep and 72 hours, I did it. I got in around 3.30 in the morning, totally delirious from sleep deprivation, and the sleeping med I had taken an hour before, which just made me loopy. So I hacked in, left my calling card, and passed out for like 12 hours. I was living with my parents at age 28 still, not ideal by any means. So, I was awakened by my dad around dinner time the following day, who said some people needed to talk to me at the front door. There stood, they were official, I guess you could say, the frigging FBI, just like the guys in the movies. They were tall, boring, all in black suits, except for the one token woman who never says anything, and absolutely zero sense of humor in any of them. Anyway, we had a talk. Apparently, she continued. Her snorting turned into a laugh she couldn't hold back. 
Apparently, I had broken in successfully but didn't leave just my card. What did you leave? asked Sergio, sitting straighter in his chair and fully engrossed in the story. I left a litany of conspiracy theories, all implicating the government and the FBI, ranging from UFOs to the JFK assassination being an inside job, to those pet rocks they made millions on in the 80s as a government operation to see how stupid consumers could be. Plus, maybe some poop emojis and a half-naked picture of Brad Pitt. You certainly are. Quirky, she said. That's what you were searching for, right? Absolutely, and mind-blowing, just like your... Well, yeah. Thank you. Anyway, I also hacked into a few other straightforward sites and upset some more people. In my defense, I don't even remember those. I bet you can't wait to run from the table, right? Not a chance. I found a girl, a woman, I mean, who is cute, sassy, completely unpredictable, and doesn't have a boyfriend. Wild horses couldn't pull me away. So? So what? Who else did you piss off? Well, let's see. The number one largest animal rights group in our country, and probably the world. I hacked into their main site and created a banner on the main page saying, I eat the food that eats their food. I added a picture of a cute pink bunny munching on the grass, side by side with one of those rabbit foot keychains. I'm horrible, I know, she added, and they weren't too happy about it. Next, we have the San Diego Chargers. Not too close to me, but the team we grew up watching. And my dad even took me to a few games growing up. We didn't have much in common, he and I. Only one thing, in fact, the Chargers. I always believed he wanted a son instead of a daughter, so I became interested in the one thing he talked about. So, the Chargers were talking about moving back to Los Angeles. Can you believe that crap? They only played one year there in 1960. Then every other season in San Diego except the one game they played in Arizona in 2003 because of fires. My point is, they are a San Diego team, and my dad was heartbroken to hear of the proposed move to Los Angeles. So, long story short, I may have changed their website logo to the San Diego PU. I mean, pansies, she said with a wink. I guess, though, the one I got the most grief from was the Mind Blown site my employer that I apparently trashed on their website and accused of stealing my ideas. Did they? No. Yes, maybe. I don't know. But I got a pink slip by email the next day. In the end, I got fired from a job I loved, a stern warning from the FBI, and a new job offer with the Army as a civilian, all in the same day. Oh, and 10% of dollar five hundred k minus taxes, of course. And here I am, she added, standing up and curtsying. Sergey told her a few things about himself that she didn't already know about his childhood and his hero dad. Mike tried to focus on what Rana was saying, but something caught his eye across the room. Not a wink, a flip of her hair, or anything glaringly obvious, but enough for Rana to understand there was a distraction. And since they were only small talking anyway, he didn't mind. Do you know her, boss? asked Mike. No, I don't. I've only been here a couple of days, but I could ask around if you'd like. I'm curious is all. It just seems like she gave me a look. But hey, I could be wrong. No, I get it, Rana replied. And I'm sorry to hear about Sheila. Thanks. It was bad, replied Mike. But sometimes when something ends, something new begins. And I guess that's why I'm here. Because I probably never would have come on my own. I'm not even sure why I'm looking, said Mike. It seems wrong, disrespectful to Sheila. I guess that is what I'm saying. Plus, we're neck deep into a delicate mission. And I don't know if I'm coming back. I don't know either, replied Rona. All I do know is you were meant for this. You are meant for something bigger than you were doing, even before the day. Now you have that opportunity to show everyone, all of us, what you're capable of, and you can use your strengths for the good of this country. I couldn't be prouder of both you and Sergio for how far you've come. It's been a long time since the day we were in the tent together, right in the thick of the Texas grasslands, but we had to come full circle. We had to start from nothing and build to what we have today, and that's just the beginning. We know you and Sergio are tasked with nothing less than an all-or-nothing scenario. There are no two men I would rather have on the front line than you guys. Do a good job, and I'll bring you back here for a bit if that's what you want. So, go talk to her. You're not disrespecting Sheila's memory, just trying to move forward in life. Mike walked across the room towards her, careful not to go too fast or too slow. Her gaze never left him, and as he got closer, he was struck by her beauty. Not the kind of pretty a woman may have after a makeover at a high-end department store, 
but striking beauty. The one that's hard to pull off. That first thing in the morning look with jet back hair, straight as an arrow hanging to her mid-back, high cheekbones, and a yellow and green summer dress stopping just above her knees, which seemed out of place here. Have a seat, soldier, she said in the sweetest voice he had ever heard. Thank you, ma'am, but I'm not a soldier. Just a civilian playing one, I guess. Okay, fair enough. Then I am not a FEMA camp inhabitant, but a strong, independent woman that just happens to be hanging out here for a short time, I hope. Uh, my name is Mike, he said, fumbling. I know, she replied, getting a questioning look out of him. It's right here, your handsome face and strong chin. She pointed to the cover of a magazine. That's the reason I've been staring at you for the last 15 minutes, or ever since you walked in here, I guess. I've had this magazine on my cot since it came out last month, and while most people trashed their copy, I didn't. Something told me to hang on to it. Do you believe in fate, Mike? Uh, I don't know, you? Maybe. I like reading stories about you, though, and I never thought you would walk through this door, but here you are. Well? Well, what? He replied, not following. Aren't you going to ask my name or anything else? Oh, sorry, ma'am. I was caught off guard, is all. I'm good at a lot of things, but this is not one of them. Then you're fortunate because I hate a player. You know, the good-looking guy, chiseled like you, with the corny pickup lines he read out of a men's magazine. You don't have to worry about that with me, Mike replied. I don't have any lines at all. That's clear, she said, smiling. My name is Soyala. Sala, is that right? I haven't heard that before. Close. Soy, like soybean and Allah on the end. Soy Allah. It's Hopi from my tribe and means time of the winter solstice. Soyala, Soyala, he repeated. Right? She nodded yes. It's a pretty name for a pretty face, he blurted out, immediately feeling corny. Oh, she said, pointing to him. You do have a pickup line, at least one. Not bad, though, and thank you. Not bad? Really? No, but not great either. There's been talk around camp that you may stop in here on your way to something important. You heard about what I'm doing? No, not that part. Just that you might poke your head in camp for a day or two. I've sat by myself every meal for the last two weeks waiting to see if you would show up. And here you are, my good fortune. Or maybe mine, he replied, starting to feel more comfortable with her. Where is your tribe, or reservation, or home? I am not sure what I mean. Fort Lauderdale, she replied, getting a look from him. I'm a Hopi Indian, full blood, and spent the first ten years of my life on the res in Arizona. Then at age ten, my parents moved us to Fort Lauderdale when my dad got a good job offer, and I've been there ever since. Now I'm here. Are your parents here with you? Asked Mike, looking around the cafeteria. No, my mom died of cancer. It will be five years next month. And my dad passed two months later of a broken heart. My two older brothers were old enough to make decisions when we moved, and they stayed on the reservation. I had a younger sister for only a year. Sids, they called it. So it's just me here, she said, raising both arms in a victory stance. Same for me, kind of, replied Mike. My mom died at the end of a bottle. I never knew my dad. My brother Arthur and sister Lily both died young. I'm sorry to hear that, Soyala said genuinely. Yeah, me too. About your parents, of course. Meet us in the back in five, soldier, said Rana, putting a hand on Mike's shoulder. Ma'am, he added, walking past. Ooh, the five-minute buzzer, she said, rubbing her hands together. So, what do you want to know? And Mike had seen a similar question in a book he read years ago called Talking to Women. How Not to Screw Up. Of course, he didn't remember everything, but the author agreed with Solana about skipping the cheesy pickup lines and instead learning more about her by asking simple questions. Okay, why isn't every single guy in this place trying to talk to you right now? I don't allow it, she replied without thinking. This chair you're sitting in has been leaning against the table just as you found it for weeks. After a few guys tried to sit here and got turned down, eventually the rest stopped trying. So... You were saving the chair all this time, but not for them? That's right. I knew you would be here eventually, and I am a patient woman. Not to be confused with passionate and persistent, of which I am both as well. Sounds fair. What else should I know about you? He asked, seeing the question clear as day in Chapter 3 of the book he read so long ago. Hmm. Let's see. My family is fiercely loyal and mates like rabbits. How about you, Mike? Mike was mid-sip of his coffee before choking on it and taking a second to regain his composure. 
uh, he fumbled, losing his train of thought for a second. That wasn't in the book, he thought. You're almost making me blush, he replied. And if you ask any of my friends, they might swear that's never happened. To answer one of your questions, I've been called a lot of things in my life, but never unloyal. As to the second one, Chapter 23, Jacksonville FEMA Camp Time to go, Mike, said Sergio, pointing to a waiting Rona. Save that answer for next time, Soyala said. I love suspense. Bye for now. Bye, ma'am. It was really nice talking with you. Her gaze followed him across the cafeteria as he walked, taking one last look into her big brown eyes before turning the corner. Whoa, did you see that woman? asked Amanda. What woman? replied Sergio on cue. You both better make it back alive is all I'm saying, replied Amanda, adding, hubba hubba. She's got legs for days. Hit the showers, men, down that hall, said Rona. Get changed and meet Amanda and me back here in 20, as he shook his head at her remarks. Follow me and we'll all have a talk, said Rona when they returned on time. The four walked from the tent down a rocky path and into a trailer, sectioned off into cubicles. It looks like a modern-day office, Mike thought like in his old squad house in McKinney. Phones were replaced with radios, but computer screens were still at each station. Do those still work, he asked. Some of them, Rona replied. We've been getting some shipments of electronics from our allies across the globe, but they have been light so far, and distribution is across the camps, so we are slowly building back. All the way to the back, everyone, he said, pointing to the very end of the trailer. Mike realized he was in an office complex of trailers, six or seven long, attached like train cars with doors in between. The last room had double oak doors and a conference table surrounded by 12 chairs. Please have a seat, everyone, and we will get started, said Rona. It goes without saying, but still worth a mention, that anything discussed tonight and all before today relating to this mission is strictly confidential. You soldiers had one hell of a ride, but you made it here. Amanda worked day and night, keeping an eye out for you and scanning ahead at every chance. I'm sure you two have some questions. Grab a drink if you like, he said, pointing to the small bar adjacent to the table. You will have a full day here tomorrow and head out early the following day. You want one? Mike asked Sergio, half standing. Uh, sure. Whiskey. Rocks or no? You have ice? Questioned Sergio. Yep, right here. Ice is good, Sergio replied. Boss, can I get you something? Sure, Mike. Same as good. Thanks. Amanda, how about you? Oh, why not? She said. When in Rome or a FEMA camp in the middle of Florida, I just want to fit in. I'll have a white Russian, please, and thank you. I don't think we have that, but I do have vodka. And it looks like cranberry juice. Serve it up, soldier. Mike started with the first question. I thought you were both back where we started from. Now you're here. Yes, we followed you from there and relocated here halfway through, replied Rona. Then why not just fly us here when you came, assuming you flew? We did fly, and it would have been easy to take you two with us. Too easy. What's your favorite football team, Mike? He asked. I never lived in Pittsburgh, but I like the Steelers. Okay, said Rona. Remember the combo of Lynn Swan, Lyle Alzado, and Terry Bradshaw back in the 70s? Yeah, numbers 88, 77, and 12. And don't forget about number 75, Mean Joe. They were a powerhouse. All right, let's say they are conference champions, just like the Dallas Cowboys in that 75 season, and they are given two weeks off to do whatever they want before the big game. Lay on the couch, go out clubbing, whatever. Then they have to come back and win the Super Bowl. Do you think it would be harder to take the break as opposed to playing right up to the week before the big game, assuming all are healthy, of course? They did take the win. But I see your point, said Mike. So we brought you through hostile territory for a few reasons. One being shaking off ring rust. You guys haven't been involved in anything combat-wise since the great battle. If I could have brought you right from that battle to this one, I would have. But the timing wasn't right. Sergio, he said, sensing a question was coming. Uh, sorry. It just seemed like people knew we were coming this way. I mean, they either went out of their way to avoid us completely or we're lying in wait. That's true. And yes, we sent a group in there a couple of weeks back to let them know you would be through. One, it told us who we could leave alone to survive for their families. Two, it would flush out hostile groups in the area, 
and give us a chance to test XO in an actual combat scenario. We had two men who weren't afraid to die, and I think it was a success all the way around, don't you? Yes, sir. I guess it was, replied Sergio. Now it's go time. No take backs, no I quit. Just get it done. I couldn't agree more, replied Rana. Mike, how about you? Same for me, sir. That works. You will have one more day here and then off you go. We'll have one more briefing tomorrow, about this same time. Any questions, gentlemen? No and no. Okay, good night. Amanda will show you to your sleeping areas. You're free to wander the camp, but lights out at 10.30 p.m. Amanda walked out, followed closely by Sergio, with Mike tagging along at the end. She showed them the rooms, or cots, really, that they would have for the next two nights. I'll catch up with you guys in a bit, said Mike, checking his watch. It read 8.33, with the light blue hue from the solar-charged battery. It looks like it's just you and me, Serge, said Amanda, grasping his hand lightly. Just so we're clear, this is a first date, not the third or anyone after. Meaning if I give you a kiss in the next two hours, it's a lot for me. There are no lines about going off to war, so I need more. No sneaking behind the bleachers for whatever they do. I've never been... Got it? Yes, ma'am, I surely do, he replied. Now, Sergio hadn't been this close to a woman in quite some time, and if the hand-holding was all there was, it was more than he expected. He had known his share of faster women in days gone by, but none of those made him feel like this, not one. He could wait, and if he died trying to get back to her, then it was meant to be, Sergio told Mike after lights out. How about you, he asked. Did you find anything interesting on your walk? Yes, she was waiting for me in the very place I saw her last, as if she had never even gotten up. Hey there, stranger, she said as he poked his head into the cafeteria. Hey, you, he replied, not sure what to say. I've been saving the seat for you for a bit now, she replied, gesturing for him to sit. And you smell great. I showered, he stated proudly. I don't always get to, is all, he added. So, she asked. So, what, he replied, not sure what to say. So you're loyal, I've heard, and what else? I'm a serial monogamist, I guess. A serial what? She asked, bursting into laughter. You know, I am in one relationship at a time, however long it lasts. He paused, having a flashback, or maybe just a memory of the headlines back in New York. Serial Mike, the local media dubbed him. I understand, she said. Me too. I just tend to stick with the wrong guy longer than I should. My last boyfriend was overseas when the lights went out, and... Well, let's just say it saved me a breakup speech. Do you miss him? Mike asked. I don't miss him, but I do wish him the best. Honestly, I was hoping he would break up with me. Now it doesn't matter much anyway. What do you want, Mike? She asked. You mean like the big picture? What do I want? Yes, precisely. I want to do my part to get our country back on track, whatever that entails. Then if I'm still alive, a slower life, maybe, a family. I have a son, Javi. I adopted him with my last girlfriend, Sheila, who died in an auto shop accident. Anyway, I left him in good hands with a friend of mine. And the girl before that, she asked? Kelly was or is her name. She got scared or bored. I'm not sure which. Anyway, she left one night when we were en route from Texas to Colorado. I heard she has moved on with her life, and it's good. What about the one before that, she asked? The rest of them are not worth mentioning. Don't take it wrong if I skip asking about yours. I would rather not know. As far as after this thing I need to do, I'm not sure. Guys like me have never been great around large groups, I'm told, so I'm thinking either a slower family-type life or a military one. It depends. On what, she asked. Maybe it depends on you for one. Of course, we only met today, so that's probably unlikely. Anything is possible. You remember the Tesla guy? Yeah. Elon something. I know who you're talking about, though. I read, Soyala continued, that Elon not only wants to, but sincerely believes that he will figure out how to colonize Mars one day. Ridiculous, right? I mean, we haven't even been there yet, people, I mean, and building a giant shopping mall, pods, or whatever it would look like seems utterly impossible. However, the difference between him and most of the rest of us, besides the money, is that he believes he will do it. Even now, I'll bet he's holed up in some lab trying to figure it out. My point is that when you believe something can happen and you have the resources to back it up, whether financial or even a gut feeling and persistence, it's not impossible to hope and expect that it will happen. Probably unlikely. Oh, but it's not, 
she replied. I know more about you than most people, I bet. I don't see how, he replied. Fair enough. Let's see if any of these names ring a bell. Father Carasso, Kelly, Jessup, Baker, Sheila, Javi. Of course, you already mentioned the two girlfriends and your son. How about Lance and Joy, Vlad, Lonnie, the Colonel? Should I continue? I think you nailed almost everyone I know, answered Mike. I've been busy and I do my homework. But just because things have changed doesn't mean we can't find information if we know where to look. So, what now? He asked. Well, you can take me out back for a makeout session or, or what? You can kiss me now, say goodnight, and we talk more in the morning. That's more my speed for sure, Mike admitted, leaning in to kiss her. They don't seem to mind, he said after, nodding towards one of the guards. Nope, she replied. As long as it's nothing too crazy, they mind their own business. Lights out in 15 minutes, came the command over the loudspeaker. I guess that's me, said Mike sneaking in one more kiss before they headed their separate ways. Breakfast, he called out after her. 7 a.m. sharp, I'll save you a seat, she added before blowing him a kiss. Sergio beat Mike to the sleeping quarters by only a few minutes. It's crazy, he said. Yesterday we were both swinging bachelors, and today it looks like we both have girlfriends. Then in two days there's a gambler's chance we'll both be killed. You're right about that, replied Mike, drifting off to sleep with thoughts of his new friend and little boy. Good night, Javi, he whispered before nodding off. It wasn't hard to make the 7 a.m. breakfast when the lights all over camp turned on at 6.30. Both men spent the morning and early afternoon learning more about their potential partners. At 4 p.m., they were called into a meeting with Rona and a surprise visit from the colonel. This is it, soldiers, said the colonel, shaking each man's hand. The next few days will determine our advancement or the beginning of a steep decline in our great country. We are counting on you and others you have met before to execute the plan concisely and adapt as needed. Two days ago, he continued, I briefed both the president and vice president with clear instructions to let you do your job. They understand your role and theirs. As for the others, Congress, Senate members, judges and the like, they are not your concern. Over the past week, I have spent time with everyone you will be working alongside. So we will look at the parts of the plan you two will be involved in and go over plan B and C, should the need arise. He pulled out a U.S. map with detailed ports highlighted. We're here, he pointed. You're headed there, he added, tapping the map near Miami. You will pick up your cargo here, and over five, six days, or however long it takes, transport them here. He ended with his index finger on a spot both men recognized. He said proudly, one of the most secure locations on the planet, and we still control it. It's ironic that the worst terrorists are swapped out for our highest in government. Mike resisted the urge to voice a comparison or similarity between them, instead nodding his head in agreement. Most of our military across the globe are back in securing our ports, including the northern border with Canada and the Mexican border to the south. Of course, our Navy is in every port, the Atlantic and Pacific sides, as well as the Gulf. Sir, asked Sergio, what are these? pointing to circles outside of most highlighted ports. Ships, not ours, but the Chinese, Iranians, Russians, and any small country with one or two ships that think they can roll in here, like looting after a hurricane. They are lining up 30 miles off our shores. The relief shipments of food and supplies from our allies are here, he pointed farther out, and have been blocked. So we essentially have a standoff. I hate to say it, but once our men and women are secure, we will either have a long standoff until the occupiers run out of food, water, or fuel, or a full-scale invasion from multiple sides. Like I said before, many of the ships are carrying farmers, and I don't want a bloodbath on my conscience. With that being said, not one of them will step foot on this soil. That's been made clear from the beginning. So we just sneak them across the water? Asked Mike. Not exactly, Rana replied, getting a nod from the colonel to answer. The next three hours were the step-by-step -step plans, A through C, with dinner brought in by several cooks in the camp. Any questions, gentlemen? He asked as the meeting concluded. No, sir, they both replied. Good. How about you, Amanda? None for me, sir. I'm just playing a video game, really. I can get through it as long as I keep thinking that. Lights out at 1030, gentlemen and lady, the colonel said. And you head out at 0500 hours. We're counting on you, all of you. God himself will be with you, I'm sure of that, he added, 
as he shook each hand before exiting the room. I need a minute, said Amanda, taking in some breaths. Whoa, was that intense or what? She said with that nervous giggle some people get attending a funeral. She added, I need a drink, but not for at least a week. I know, Rana. I know. All right, said Rana. You heard the colonel. Meet right here at 0500. We'll get a quick bite and head straight out after that. Mike spent a couple of hours talking with his new lady friend, and Sergio did the same, with neither trying to round any bases before leaving. Both men promised to make it back at least half alive. Of course, promises now were mere hopes and prayers that one might be fortunate enough to be able to keep. I'll be right here, Michael, when you return, however long it takes, said Soyala. Do you know what they call a 28-year-old gamer who lives with their parents, asked Amanda. No, I don't, replied Sergio. A virgin. Thank you for taking it slow with me, she added, and said good night. Chapter 24. Headed to Miami. The road to Miami was secured with Humvees every few miles, it seemed, reminding Mike of videos he had seen of checkpoints in Middle Eastern war-torn countries. They sailed through with a wave and the flag on the front truck of their eight-vehicle caravan, signaling they were important and didn't have time to stop. I know you are not afraid to die, Mike, whispered Sergio. Me neither, but, uh, you know, I hope we don't. There could be something great waiting for both of us when we get back. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I do need a good fight, though. It's been a while and I'm getting restless. Oh, I'm sure you'll get plenty of that, replied Sergio. I'll throw a few bad guys your way if you don't get enough on your own. I appreciate that, Mike replied with a straight face. Guess I'm going to meet the vice president. That's kind of cool, he added. Three hours later, they were at ground zero. Mike expected some holding compound deep underground, but then remembered something an old cop buddy told him years ago. He couldn't remember the conversation in detail or even what it was about, but the phrase stuck in his mind years later. There are no basements in the coastal parts of Florida, his friend said. The compound was nothing like the one they just left. Residents dressed to the nines with 100 times the security, outside and in. Okay, soldiers, said Rana. We check in over there, he pointed. It's a thorough search for all of us, so I hope none of you get embarrassed. It's procedure is all. Only a few people get to skip it, and none of us are on that list. Amanda, you will have a female, of course. Hmm, a female body inspector, she said, giggling at her joke. Want to trade, Serge? You're a feisty one, he replied, smiling. Don't forget it, she replied. Let's get serious now, said Rona. Once inside, we will be assigned a guard for the official tour and a meet and greet with your cargo. Wait, said Sergio. They're both in the same place at the same time? I'm afraid so. It's not standard protocol and hasn't gone unnoticed, but it's the best we can do for now. It's also why we have a short window to get them off site. One fourth of our Navy is 10 miles offshore right here and our Air Force is not far. We're expecting something, but not sure exactly what. The four waited to be checked in. No weapons, right guys, like we discussed? No, sir, both Mike and Sergio responded. Good to hear. It's hard to explain that sort of thing at check-in. You, of course, will have everything you need once underway. You weren't kidding about the search procedure, said Mike once they were all inside, adding, and I've been a cop for a lot of years. It I feel like I should buy her dinner. And does anyone have a cigarette, said Amanda? lightly punching Sergio on the arm. The most important thing inside, said Rona, pulling them to the side of the main tent, is don't lose your badge. This particular one gets you pretty much anywhere around here, and not even the Senate or Congress members have one. Rona gave further instructions on expected behavior, interrupted every minute or so by someone saying hi to him or thank you for being here. How do you know all these people? asked Amanda. And who are they? They are your government, the ones you voted for or maybe didn't vote for. They are all here. I've been around a long time, so they know me. That brings me to my next point, as we discussed previously. Politics didn't stop at the door. I fully expect each of you to be approached by several key players, asking for favors or information. It will be 10x that for me, I'm sure. That means you have orders from the colonel, and any changes need to be approved by him. If you are wondering, no changes are expected at this point. Sergio and Mike, you will briefly meet your cargo, both in the same place for now, an almost unheard of scenario before. Are you ready? 
Sure, yes, they responded. T.S. Clearance, Rana announced to the guard, approaching a building with cement walls and no windows. Give us a few, the main guard said. We expected you a little later. Sure, replied Rana. Just let them know we're here. Ten minutes later, the main door to the building or compound opened from the inside out. Gentlemen and lady, the guard said, pointing to the stairs leading to the front door. Rana went first, followed by Sergio and Mike not far behind, dropping Amanda off at her quarters before continuing. Mike expected a lot of people, dozens maybe to be inside, but it was just the two. After the introductions, they learned they had a 15-minute time slot to say hello and whatever else should be covered. Mr. President, said Sergio, followed by Mike's introduction to the vice president. We appreciate you two coming down here, said the president. We've been briefed on the operation, and you two are billed as the best to get us across the pond. I can assure you that we both will let you do your jobs. And if you haven't already heard, this is a big deal. This is literally the new start of the most powerful country this world has ever seen. And we intend to take our rightful place back on top in due time. Will you die for your country, soldier? asked the vice president, looking over at Mike. Sure, replied Mike. For the record, I would die for a lot of other things as well. How about you, Sergio? asked the president. Yes, that's why I'm here. But for the record, I'd like us both to come out of this alive, all four of us, he added with a slight smile. How long will you all be over there, sir? asked Mike. Until we're told it's safe to come back, responded the president. It's the last thing I ever expected to consider, and I fought it as long as I could. The ship's captain never leaves a sinking vessel, and a plane's pilot sits in until the end. But we were told by top military, men and women we trust, that it's time to go. We will come back when it's time to rebuild. Listen, we're fully set up in the meantime, and communicating with our allies abroad. Do either of you have children? asked the president. Me, responded Mike, a young son named Javi. Okay, so you're a father and you're here. Where is he? Safe in Colorado, Mike responded briefly. Okay, we both, Joe and I, have children, and it's hard being away from them. But we are. We all are. So your commanders tell us it's a done deal, smooth and routine. I would like to hear from you. Sergio, you are a soldier. Have been for many years, I'm told. Yes, sir, I am. And Mike, you have, let's say, a more unusual past, added the president. That's fair, replied Mike. You saved some people. I've been briefed on the ones in New Mexico, Raton Pass. He read off a piece of paper he held in his right hand. Yes, sir. I helped out some. Some more in Colorado at a Lake Trinidad, I believe, after some fights underground? In a pit, sir. And yes, technically underground. Well, it's clear you both have impressive backgrounds, and we can't go together, we all know. But Joe and I won't be far apart. I've just spoken to the colonel, and all is a go as planned. But you, Mike, will be with me, and Sergio with Joe. I hadn't heard that, sir, said Mike, looking at Rana on the radio and wondering if he was already being played. Ten seconds later, Rana concluded and confirmed the switch. We're good, asked the vice president to Sergio. Yes, sir. I'll get you across. It's my biggest mission to date. Okay, soldiers, we will see you when it's time, said the president, shaking hands with both men. Are you okay with the switch? asked Mike as they were heading away from the building. Yeah, it's not what I had in my head, but it's pretty much the same thing anyway. Exactly. They both need watching out for. Let's just get it done. The rest of the day was uneventful. Mike and Sergio played a name that politician game as men and women walked around the camp. I don't recognize a one, said Mike, although I'm not up to speed on that world. I've seen that guy before, though, he added, pointing to a man across the tent. Of course you have chimed in Rona, walking up behind them. That's Tucker. Tucker who? asked Sergio. Tucker from the mainstream right. The guy who asks the questions nobody wants to answer and when they don't, he asks an even tougher one. I'm not sure how he got here. But mark my word, he's keeping a diary of everything that happens in this camp and beyond. Rona, he said, coming over to shake hands. Hey, Tucker, how are you? We're good. Can I ask you a few questions? Off the record, asked Rona, lowering his voice. Nope, on the record like always. Not today, my friend, replied Rona. Sorry, not today. Don't say a word to him or any others, guys, said Rona as they walked away out of earshot. They all know something is coming up, but that's where it ends. The last thing we need is more civilians getting wind of the mission. Once it's done, everyone will know, but not until then. 
Yes, sir, both men replied, choosing not to add any dialogue to the already open and shut matter. <sighs> okay, guys, here are your quarters, said Rona. Better than the last digs, but minus the girls. You will be quarantined for the next 24 hours. There's a guard out front at all times, and only those needing to brief you will be let in. Meals will be delivered at 7 a.m., 12 noon, and 6 p.m. porta pot is in the back, and an indoor-outdoor shower is just behind it. So we can't leave? asked Mike. I know you could. The way you both snuck around Baker's camp was a lot harder than tricking one guard here, but I'm asking that you don't. We will have 10 minutes notice when it's go time, and I can't have a search party out looking around camp for you guys. Do I have your word you guys will stay put? Both replied, yes. Rana headed toward the door, turning at the last second. Oh, I almost forgot, he added, tossing a small duffel bag to Sergio before exiting and speaking to the guard out front. What do we have? asked Mike, curious. Let's see. A deck of playing cards, poker chips, two cigars, one lighter, and a couple of flashlights. No scotch, huh? asked Mike. Not even one beer, replied Sergio. It's strange, he added. Us both protecting our government officials. Hell, I didn't even vote for them. Of course, I may not be committed to the man, the office, or any other others in government, minus the colonel and Rona, but I am committed to this country, and the president and vice are the best ones to get it going. Otherwise, you have everyone scattered with no direction, and we already know how that turns out said Mike. Lunch was piled high on a single serving tray, all finger food and enough to put them both into a midday coma. Nap time, said Sergio, laying on his cot. The wail of the siren had both men jumping up an hour later. Shouting could be heard in all directions, followed by explosions far off in the distance. I think it's go time, said Sergio, quickly putting on his boots and stuffing half a hamburger into his mouth while tying his laces. Time to go, said an out-of-breath Rona, busting through the front of the tent in full combat gear. This is not a drill, not as planned, and we were out of time. Grab your packs, he added, pointing to the ones just outside the tent's front door. In there is everything the colonel promised you would have. Where's Amanda? asked Sergio. She's in place, ready to fly. Your weapons are waiting for you out front. Follow me. Mike noted that the whole place, tent after tent with trailers attached, was in chaos. I'm pretty sure this is not something they were expecting, he said to Sergio, as they ran through the encampment. The explosions were still far off in the distance. They could not see where they were coming from, but the explosions increased, with mere seconds between them now. The sounds of helicopters and other aircraft filled the air, and Mike hadn't realized the sheer amount of them until he came out at the front of the camp. The skies were filled with all types of machinery, as was the ground. Chapter 25, Leaving Jacksonville FEMA Camp Mike, this way, said the colonel, with Rana leading Sergio in another direction. See you soon, brother, Mike called over his shoulder. I hope so, replied Sergio as he was whisked away towards the back of the camp. I didn't realize you would be here, colonel, said Mike. I know, that part we kept under wraps, but I wouldn't miss it for anything. We're doing this together, you and me so I trust you to have my back and our president trusts me to have his. This is no different from when you knocked out our reigning champion, Rodriguez. Whatever happens, we'll do what it takes to get back on top. A helo overhead shot round after round to the north of camp, taking return fire. Move, 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 the colonel yelled out to a man covered head to toe in civilian clothes, jeans, and a sweatshirt with the hood over his head and white tennis shoes. Is that him? asked Mike. Yes, it is. His family was evacuated a week ago and are awaiting his arrival across the water. Same with the vice president. The families are a hell of a lot easier to move than the guys on top. Trust me on that. <sighs> the three ran into the back of an unmarked car Mike recognized as one of five scattered in a line of vehicles of various makes and models. This is it, he pointed to a car Mike knew well. That's a 1970 Pontiac GTO, said Mike, looking at the partially restored vehicle that could be a beauty half rusted and half yellow, with orange flames melding into a liquid green tail across the doors and side panels. No more presidential motorcades, stated the colonel, as we all squeezed inside, Mike and the president jumping in the back through the front passenger door and the colonel riding shotgun next to a driver that Mike had never seen before. One by one, 
each vehicle ahead of them left in a different direction. Can I take off my hood? asked the president. I'm not one to hide. Not yet, replied the colonel. Actually, not until we arrive. It's the best advantage we have right now, and I'm willing to do what it takes to get you there safe. He gave the driver instructions on speed, noted upcoming smooth turns, and the next two roads to take. Like we're out for a Sunday drive, gentlemen. Nothing to draw attention. Mike looked out the back passenger side window at the carnage in the skies. Fire on the ground and smoke in the air caught his eye from every angle. There he is, Mike said, half smiling. There's who, asked the president, staying low. The drone, he, she, or it, EXO, they call it. It helped me and Sergio get here on four-wheelers. It's armed with little drones inside of it, but I'm sure you already know that as commander-in-chief. We have many machines like that in our arsenal, he replied. Colonel, what's the plan now? Mr. President, it has changed. I can tell you up front. The air isn't an option. Now it has to be a boat. So the timeline just got longer. Days longer, I'm afraid. We planned a submarine originally, if the air option failed, but it looks like that's out too. Somebody knows we're on the move and I can't risk you being detected underwater. So we have to rely on Plan D, the one you haven't heard of, Mr. President, and you either, Mike. So by boat? Which ship? asked the President. Yes, sir, but not one of ours. Not our warships, I mean. Excuse me, sir, he said, talking into his radio with one earpiece. Make a left 100 yards up, he called to the driver, then straight for four miles. Keep EXO at a distance. We don't need it drawing attention to us, he called into the radio. On the line with Rana and Amanda, Mike guessed. He stayed on the radio for nearly 10 more minutes, seemingly with multiple people. Mike and the president rode in silence, both trying to piece together the one side of the conversation. Get down, Mr. President, all the way onto the floorboards, called out the colonel, and cover your ears. It seemed odd to see a sitting president on the floor of an old flame-covered muscle car, having been commanded by his lower-ranking officer, thought Mike. But then, this was survival, and the how could be sorted out later. On your left, Mike, said the colonel. I see them, he replied. Punch it, the colonel commanded the driver as the car's speed increased significantly. Mike looked out to see a pickup truck filled with maybe ten men in the back. He called out this info to the colonel. Got the same on my side, called back the colonel. How did they know we were here? He asked aloud. I don't know, replied Mike, as if the question had been directed towards him and not just a thought spoken out loud. Maybe it's just a coincidence, and they are looking to loot something. Is this thing bulletproof? No, replied the colonel. The one we were supposed to have was, but the whole plan went to crap at the last minute. Left, then a quick right, he said to the driver. Yes, sir the driver replied, squealing around the corner. Don't dump us, said the colonel. We're going to need EXO, he commanded into the radio. I'm not worried about being seen anymore. How do they know we're here? He asked into the radio. I don't know, sir, came a voice Mike was familiar with. It's like you're being tracked. How about Sergio and his group? The same? Asked the colonel. No, sir. They're good so far, came the reply over the radio. Sir, sir, said the driver. Uh, sir, he yelled out, pointing ahead at two figures on motorcycles, headed straight their way. Don't slow, they will move. Don't slow, commanded the colonel. A motorcycle never wins in a game of chicken with a car. The bikes came down the center of the two-lane road, only two feet apart, it looked like to Mike, neither one looking to veer off any time soon. What should I do? asked the driver. Stay the course. Don't veer off and don't slow down. Stay low, Mr. President, low as you can get, he added. The bikes were well within sight, one on the left, the other opposite, but headed straight for the car. EXO, take them out, called the colonel into his radio. On command, EXO opened fire on the two bikers in a hail of bullets. The one on the left wobbled slowly at first and then violently shook before hitting the pavement and skidding to one side. The other bike shimmied, but couldn't or wouldn't turn off. Hold on yelled the colonel just before impact. Mike ducked but didn't take his eyes off the windshield. The crash was a split second but seemed like minutes as the bike's front tire hit the car's grill with a crunch. The rider's helmet struck the windshield, spidering it for only a second before penetrating into the driver's chest with a sickening sound of bones breaking. The car swerved left, then right, before coming to a hard stop in the middle of the road. Mike, 
Grab the wheel if this thing can still drive, the colonel commanded. Mike could hear the trucks on both sides firing rounds, but none seemed to hit the car. They are firing on EXO, said the colonel as if to answer Mike's question. Mike jumped out of the back passenger door and opened the driver's. Sorry, Mr. Driver, said Mike, having never caught his name as he yanked him out of the seat. He was gone, anyone could tell, and Mike set him on the ground carefully. Clank! The small keychain-sized remote, blinking green, fell from his pocket and onto the pavement. Mike tossed it to the colonel, who swore at the dead man before stepping out and crushing the device with his boot. The bike rider squirmed with a gurgling sound, still stuck in the windshield. How did they know we were here? screamed the colonel to the man lying motionless on the ground. Never mind, he added, as several rounds from the trucks hit the back of the car. Get his other leg, said the colonel, and pull on two. One, two. Both men pulled hard, freeing the motorcycle rider from the windshield as he moaned something inaudible. Crack, crack. Several bullets hit the ground at Mike's feet, with the third making a thud sound, driving deep into his left quad. He fell back, with the motorcycle man on top of him. I'm hit, he called out, but I can still drive. Hey, sir, get back in the car, said Mike. Down, down, he called out as more bullets flew. Mike covered the president, trying to shake the motorcycle man off him, with his back to the bullets kicking up dust around them. One ricocheted off the man's helmet, and the next two finished him off, as far as Mike could tell. Son of a, he added, with the next thud hitting him in the right shoulder, with no one seeing where the shots were coming from. I can drive, said the president. We have to go. No, sir, I can't let you do that, replied the colonel, dragging the helmeted man off of Mike and to the side of the road, moving his bike just enough to drive around. I got it, said Mike, grimacing. Just help me into the driver's seat. Of course, the president spoke. You do know this car is a stick shift, right? I've still got a good right leg and left arm, and yeah, I can do it, replied Mike. Let's get you out of here, sir. He punched the gas. The colonel fired his pistol, but Mike kept his eyes on the road. What the hell was that? The colonel spat into the radio, filled with static. Common baby, let's go, said the colonel as Mike hit the gas. That driver, spat the colonel, has been working for me for 15 years and always loyal. Someone got to him. The next left up here, he instructed Mike, looking at his printed map. Sir, you okay back there? The colonel asked, getting a, can I sit up now? Sure, for a bit. All clear, came Rana's voice from the radio. XO is worth the price of admission. I repeat, there's no one behind you. All clear. Uh, sir, the temperature gauge is rising, said Mike. I think we took some damage to the radiator. Either hitting the bike or a round got in there. Keep going, don't slow. We're close, the colonel replied. They're over there, pointing to the sign that read Portside Fishing Charters. Mike kept going straight down the road as smoke began pouring from under the hood. Almost there, the colonel repeated. Turn left here, then one more right up there, he pointed. I'm losing power, said Mike as the vehicle slowed. Make sure EXO has us covered, called the colonel into the radio. We're making a run for it. The car chugged to a stop, shaking and stalling out just feet from the dock. See if she will start. Mike did as instructed, with the car sputtering and Mike coughing, not unlike a lifelong smoker taking off their oxygen mask for a quick puff. You can swim, right, Mike? asked the colonel. Of course. Okay, roll down your window and let's hope she stays running for another minute. We can't push her from here, but that classic needs to be underwater and quick. Get her in the water and swim over to that dock, okay? Yes, sir, I can do it. Time to go, Mr. President, said the colonel. Follow me. Both men ran down the dock, only looking back briefly when hearing the crash of the dock collapsing under the vehicle's weight, plunging the car headfirst into the water and disappearing seconds later. Well, that's one way to do it, said the colonel, now looking to get his mission underway. Is that it? asked the president, pointing to a large silver yacht, the largest in the marina. No, sir. That one? he asked, pointing to the next almost as impressive boat. No, not that one either. It's there. The third one from the end. Wait, does that thing even float? asked the president, not slowing down. It does. It's floating right now, and it's ours. It's the most unassuming boat out here and exactly what we want. Only a crappy old fishing boat can sail past warships, relatively unnoticed. Welcome aboard, said one of three crew members. Likely the boat's real crew, the president thought. Quick, down below, said the second. Are you sure about this, Colonel? asked the president. 
Yes, it's the only way. I'll be back in a minute. I have to get Mike. Mike was expecting to ease off the dock and into the water. He had it all planned out in his head in the few seconds he was allowed to. Dump her in, crawl out the window, and swim a few minutes. Done and done, he thought. The dock collapsing sent the vehicle headfirst and angled severely to the right passenger side when it plunged into the water. Climbing out while not wounded would have been hard, and his shoulder wound didn't help any, having to pull himself up and out the small driver's side window. By the time he was out, he had taken his last breath above the water and had to swim to the surface. His arm and leg burned, but he gave them no attention. Popping up, he heard another splash farther down on another dock, but couldn't see where it was. The colonel met a soaking wet Mike, helping him up onto the dock. Good work, soldier. I hate to see a classic like that underwater, but that's how it has to be. How are you feeling? Not bad, considering. The salt burns like hell, but the water temp is not bad. If we had the time, I might consider a longer swim. Also, I heard another big splash over here. What was that? We're not the only ones here. We may have all left in different directions, but it's the destination that matters. And it's likely that Sergio took a swim as well, the colonel replied. Chapter 26. Boat to Gitmo. The colonel introduced a wet mic to the ship's captain and crew and shared more information. These guys have been back and forth to where we're headed. They fish every day and go in between ships, ours and theirs. They stop when needed to refuel or buy bait and occasionally give away some fish. The bottom line is, Nobody messes with them, and they travel unassumingly wherever they want. Our trip to the safe zone will be roundabout and take maybe a week, if all goes as planned. What about Sergio and Joe? I mean, the vice president? asked Mike. We're planning a similar outcome. These guys operate five boats under the radar and strictly fish. Why would they help us? asked Mike once they were below deck. It's simple, replied the colonel, with both Mike and the president eager to hear. They make a good living fishing, not captains of fishing charters, who make their money whether fish are caught or not. These are actual fishermen, with livelihoods depending on whether or not they catch fish. They catch fish and want to continue doing so for the next however many generations. Helping us is their best chance of doing so, and they know it. Plus, we have agreed to update their equipment upon successful delivery. Our enemies think we are in one of those choppers, he said, pointing up into the sky. I need to lie down, said Mike, wrapping himself in a blanket lying near the main stairwell. Sorry about the blood on your blanket, a shivering Mike said through chattering teeth to a crew member, who did his best to get Mike cleaned up and started on an antibiotic. It will have to do until we land, the crewman continued. They have doctors there already. Just relax and don't get shot anymore. They didn't only pretend to fish. They took their time weaving in and around boats of all sizes before hitting open water and stopping to purchase live bait from another boat, as they did daily. And how long is this trip? asked the president, once the captain came to check on them before departure. Four days, maybe six, depending on how she does, replied the captain. She? Yes, Alejandra, named after my daughter, who only wants to be called Ali. Go figure. It's a beautiful name, acknowledged the president. A family name. Yes, and it translates to English as defender of mankind. Well, that seems appropriate, chimed in the colonel. Choppers overhead fired randomly at each other, or ships maybe, Mike thought, his shivering now controlled and whatever pain med he was given kicking in nicely. The squeaking sound caught Mike's attention, straining his eyes in the half-dark hull to see the small mice darting from one side to another. Great mice, he said aloud. Oh, it's no problem, sir, said one crew member, poking his head down the open hatch. This old girl has a few mice, but the gato will fix it. No worries. The large orange cat's growl echoed from the bowels of the boat, and the chase was on. The old fishing boat slowly churned out of the bay, creaking as a man long in years often does getting out of bed. Let's go, Alejandra, called out the captain, visible on the deck. Okay, we're off, said one crew member, coming below for a tour. Fresh water is here, he said, tapping a large metal container. As well as over there, he added, pointing to the other side. Balanced for the weight, of course. Food is here and here. Enough for three weeks for all on board. Bathroom in the back. Toilet and sink only. Sorry, no shower. We will maintain the lanterns and there are working flashlights lying around. 
We are making a quick stop for bait, the same as we always do before heading out to sea. No coming up on deck without asking, and even then, only at night. We'll have eyes on us, no different from every day for the last few months. If I say, get in back, that means quickly and all the way back behind those burlap sacks over there. That means we've been boarded. Does it happen often? Asked Mike, still lying down. We may have a different idea of what often means, but it can happen. It does sometimes, but it's usually your guys. Even then, they don't need to know who we are transporting or where. Am I right, Colonel? 110%, the Colonel replied. He checked Mike's wounds, pulling out a medical kit from Mike's pack. I'm glad we added this, he said. What you did back there, soldier, is worthy of the Congressional Medal of Honor, said the President. Thank you, sir, but I'm not a soldier, just a civilian playing one. That's a good medal, though, right? That it is. You are on a mission, and you took my fire. That makes you a soldier. Agreed, Colonel. Agreed. And as I've said before, Mike has acted like one for a long time now. The Colonel checked Mike again. Your shoulder looks through and through. But the leg, that round is still in there, best I can tell, and I'm not about to try digging it out. It feels like it, replied Mike, and I think I'd rather wait on that also. How do we know our captain and crew aren't compromised, as the driver was, he asked, not trying to sound rude, but genuinely curious. They can't be bought is the best answer, replied the colonel, holding both men's attention now. They don't want money or valuables. They only want to continue doing what they love which means helping to get all of these ships out of their fishing waters. Shh, said Mike, putting a hand to his lips and pointing towards the boat's stern. That's no mouse, he whispered, listening intently. The sound was muffled, not a scratch, as a cat might do, but a thump, repositioning something or someone. Mike got to his knees, slowly pulling his pistol, and dragged himself towards the back. The engine's noise and outside happenings drowned out his sliding, only moving when a loud boom could be heard in the distance. Reaching the back, he stopped abruptly, hearing a crinkling sound and heavy breathing. Pistol at the ready, he shouted, Come out now or I'll shoot. This got everyone's attention, hoping he wouldn't actually shoot around inside a boat to bounce around wildly or compromise the old boat's integrity. The shifting was again heard, more prominent this time, and Mike gave a warning. Final chance to come out, he said, pulling back a large blue tarp with his good arm, grunting as he did it, and doing his best not to drop his pistol. Don't shoot, mister, please don't shoot, we were hungry is all. The voice was unmistakable to all, not a man or even an adult, but a young female voice. Her head popped up from behind several boxes. Who else is here? commanded Mike. Who's the rest of we? My little brother, and he's scared. If you hurt him, mister, why, I'll... Tell him to come out. It's okay, we won't hurt him. Ollie, you can come out now, she said and there was some rustling further back. Ollie, it's okay, I think. Just come out, please. The rustling revealed a small head peeking over the supply bags. Come on out, Ollie. We're not going to hurt you, called the president from across the boat. You have my word on that. The children showed themselves walking gingerly across the floor. What's your name? asked Mike, limping behind them. Cindy with an S. I'm ten and Ollie is six. What are you going to do with us? she asked nervously as the president took off his hood. Wait a minute, she said, confused. I've seen you before. I know you, but it can't be true. It is, he replied. My name is Barack, and it's good to meet you. These are my friends, Mike and the Colonel. They are soldiers, and we won't hurt you or your brother. That's a promise. Well, okay, I guess, she said, easing her tension just a bit. How did you get in here? Is one of the crew your dad? he asked, wondering why they wouldn't tell him their kids were on board. We came aboard yesterday, last night before dark. We play games on the boats docked here, and sometimes, if we get hungry, we borrow some things, she added, wiping the chocolate from her mouth. I guess we fell asleep, and when we woke up, there were men loading things. We just hid until they left, but they didn't. Can we go home now? Hold on a minute, said the colonel, popping his head up on deck. He could hear that a conversation was taking place, but not the words specifically. You're along for the ride, he said, coming back down a few minutes later. We have an important mission to get your new friend here in a safe place. Any deviation from the normal path is likely to draw attention we can't afford. So we will get you home, I promise you that, but it will likely be a couple of weeks. That's okay, she replied. Things were getting boring at home anyway. 
We'll try and get word to your parents so they won't worry about you. Her little nose curled, and she fought back the tears. They're gone, she cried. It doesn't matter now. Gone? asked the president. What happened? Not long after the lights went dark, some men tried to hurt my mom. My dad tried to stop them, and they both got shot. My brother, he saw everything and hasn't spoken since. I'm very sorry to hear that, young lady, replied the president with the colonel and Mike nodding in agreement. So who takes care of you two? he asked. The boy pointed at his sister, who confirmed with an I do. This is a new adventure, she began, wanting anything to change the subject at hand. It's like, well, I'm not sure what it's like, but maybe like that guy who won the ticket to go on the Titanic. But let's not sink this boat, she added jokingly. Who wants candy? She asked, the way she always did when a conversation got too uncomfortable. This time she had some to show, holding her hands out from behind her back, holding several chocolate bars. Mike took one from her before answering some kid-friendly questions about why his shoulder and leg were bandaged. Does it hurt, mister? Her brother asked, finally saying the first words of the day and even months, according to Cindy, as she hugged him tightly. Only when you poke it, Ollie, and please call me Mike, he replied with a disarming smile. Not the best smile and more like the Chandler character from the popular 90s TV sitcom, but a smile nonetheless. Okay, Mike Barak, and what should I call you? Asked Cindy. Colonel, everybody just calls me Colonel. Even your mom? Asked Ollie, getting a kick out of his little joke. Even her, he replied. Okay, so you guys get into a circle, she said, as if she were talking to a group of schoolmates. You too, Ollie. We're playing cards, she announced. Okay, said Mike, adding, I like cards and feeling a little dizzy, but sitting up straight. Sure, said the president. Why not? Remarked the colonel. What's your game, Cindy with an S? Asked Mike. It's kind of new, I think. Called Go Fish. Don't worry, I'll teach you. This got a laugh out of the president. I never expected to be on a fishing boat playing go fish with you two and someone else's kids. Who knows how to play? She asked. I do, replied the president. I've got two girls a little older than you, but they taught me. I need a refresher on the rules, said the colonel. Me too, replied Mike. My mom and dad didn't vote for you, Barack. Sorry about that. It's okay, replied the president. I'm pretty sure Mike here didn't either. Mike didn't respond, only asking who deals. Chapter 27 At Sea They played, the five of them, game after game in the dim-lit hull. Outside, the conditions were less than optimal. The captain steered the boat around ships, following the second out of their five boats, all with fishing lines trolling. It's just another day out on the water, he told his two-man crew as they waved to passing ships. Night fell, and the captain came below deck. It's day one, and so far so good, he said, introducing himself to the stowaways. Now I know where all my beef jerky has been going, but it's okay. I thought it was the rats. Rats, she asked nervously. I mean the mice, he clarified. We're maintaining radio silence at your request, sir, he said to the colonel. You can all come up on deck. Watch the lines, kids. We are a fishing vessel first. MREs are on the menu. Thank you, Colonel, for arranging that. Who wants spaghetti and meat sauce? He asked, holding up one. Me. Me too, said the siblings, hands high in the air. Okay, sure. There's more than a few of everything. Plus, it all mostly tastes like spaghetti, so I hope you like it. We have chicken parmesan. Not bad, if I remember right. Chili and something Alfredo. Chicken sounds good, said the president, raising his hand. Make that too, said the colonel. Sure thing. How about you, Mike? None for me, he replied. I'm going to lie down for a bit. You all right? asked the colonel. Yeah, just tired is all. I'm going to get a nap in the back, he added, half walking, half crawling. Need a hand? asked the colonel, who mouthed the word no, just as Mike said it. Okay, just checking. I like this a lot better, said Cindy, looking at the stars. The fighting slowed down as darkness overtook the light. Ship's lights could be seen in all directions, some close and others miles away. The occasional explosion sounds far off in the distance weren't forgotten or downplayed by the two commanders on board. You know, Colonel, said the president, up until a few days ago, I would spend all day getting reports of what's happening out there, waving his arm across the sky. Now it's as if I have blinders on like horses pulling a wagon, only able to see directly in front of me. Me too, sir, replied the colonel. 
While many fellow citizens would be content with not knowing the dangers all around them and just out of sight, it's not my nature to be oblivious. When we get there, I'm going to spend a few extra days just catching up on the fight and how we're faring. My crew will switch out one man every four hours tonight, said the captain an hour after they finished eating. We will keep moving with a couple of fuel stops along our route tomorrow and the following days. These are our regular stops. They are friendly, but that does not mean come on deck. Go get some sleep, he announced, as they went back down into the bowels of the boat. I'm sleepy, declared Cindy, laying her head down on the colonel's knee with Ollie next to her. Let's get you two settled, he said, covering them both with a blanket and scooting back a few feet. Thank you, Uncle Colonel, she replied, falling fast asleep. They feel comfortable with you, the president said. I don't know how, he replied. I've never been good with kids. It's why I never wanted any. Well, I'm telling you, you're missing out, replied the president. I'll take your word for it. Now I'm going to sleep. It's been a hell of a day. Good night, Mike, he added, not getting a response. The colonel awoke to a poke on his shoulder. Uncle Colonel, Uncle Colonel, said Cindy. What? What is it? He asked, jolting up. It's Mike. Listen. Sounds from the back of the boat were that of a half-conscious man in pain. The colonel shined his flashlight, leading the way to the end of the boat. A near-unconscious Mike, covered in sweat, was writhing back and forth. He's burning up. Grab my first aid kit, he called out. I got it, replied the president, running it over. He needs pain meds, a triple dose of antibiotics, and off this ship, said the colonel. Sit up, Mike, and take these. Mike groaned, but did as instructed, swallowing them down with a small gulp of water before lying down again. What's going on? asked the captain, coming down from the deck. We heard a commotion. It's Mike. He's got an infection or something, said the president. It's pretty soon for an infection, said the captain. But who knows? He looks bad, though. We can try to unload him at the filling station. It's still maybe four hours out, though, and risky. Let's do it, said the president. No, groaned Mike. No, I'm not going. They know me. They've seen my face in the FEMA magazine. Somebody has, and I won't have my condition compromise this mission. I'd rather die. Don't take me off this boat. Don't do it until we arrive at our destination. I will not be the one to compromise the mission, he repeated. Don't do it. You will possibly die. I mean, I'm not a doctor, said the captain but it doesn't look good. I am just sick is all. Let me sleep it off, said Mike, turning over, facing away. He's right, said the captain. About what, asked the president. His face. Everyone's seen it as a modern-day Lone Ranger, only with the mask off. Even if we could sneak him off at the filling stop, how long would it be before someone saw his face? We're not the only ones refueling there, and it wouldn't take a genius to wonder why he came off of this boat, especially now. So we just let him die asked the president. Is that what you're saying? No, we just need another plan is all. We need a doctor, someone so trustworthy we don't have to vet them. They need to board from the fuel station and most of all, not look like some army doctor, but a regular civilian, maybe hitching a ride on a fishing boat. My girlfriend, said the colonel in less than a second. She's a medic and I can have her choppered to the fueling station in a few hours. You can trust her, sir, he said to the president. The colonel was on the radio no more than five minutes later, breaking his own rule of silence. He spoke with her briefly, in as much code as he could, telling her to be discreet, bring the best in medical supplies we have, and be on the next chopper. Isn't it dangerous being in a chopper right now? Asked the president. I mean, it's why we're on this boat, right? Sort of. What I mean is, the chopper ride down here is not bad. Not completely safe by any means, but it's routine to land at a refueling station. It's the ride from there to Gitmo that would draw attention. We only boarded where we did because all of us getting on at the fuel station would have given us away up front, said the colonel. Hold on, Mike, he said, checking him again. We've got a plan, but it's risky. Mike was out cold, but breathing steadily, the colonel determined. Nearly four hours later, they approached the refueling station, waiting in a short line of boats, all looking for the same. Stay down and quiet, everyone, said the captain. We'll be here maybe one, two hours, depending on the wait. Look for the woman with the bright yellow suitcase, said the colonel to his number one man on the crew. She's the one. Yes, sir, he replied, relaying the information to his crew and closing the hatch. They were fueled in 90 minutes.
Ah, sir, said the captain discreetly, peeking his head below deck. She's not here. Stall, the colonel replied. We have been for the last twenty or so minutes. They have four boats behind us, they tell me. I could probably buy another twenty minutes tinkering with the engine, but after that, short of an official command, I'm not sure what to do. She'll be here, replied the colonel, not seeming worried at all. Sir, said the captain no more than ten minutes later, we have a chopper headed this way. I hope it's her. Let me know when it lands and the door opens, said the colonel. Will do. Yellow suitcase, right, sir, he asked minutes later. And a yellow sundress looks like with a big black hat. That sounds about right. She walked down the dock in high heels, a bright yellow sundress, dark glasses, and of course her signature suitcase, as if she were boarding a billionaire's yacht for afternoon tea. Many people on the dock and in other boats stared, but no one tried to stop her or even asked where she was headed. She simply walked onto the boat and into the hull. Then she was all business. This is quite a mix we have, Mr. President. It's nice to finally meet you. Likewise, ma'am. We have children also, I see. Almost a teenager, Cindy corrected her. Of course, how silly of me. Why, I'll bet you're nine or ten. Ten. And Ollie is six, so you were right about him being a kid. I can't wait to hear the story, but first things first. Where is Mike? In the back, said the colonel. Here, I'll show you, said Cindy, grabbing hold of her hand. Cindy, what a pretty name. Would you like to be my official helper? Unless, of course, this kind of stuff bothers you. Since he was five, I've been taking care of my little brother, so this is no problem for me. Okay, sweetie, I'll give you something to hold and you keep a close eye on it. Mike, can you hear me? She asked, checking his forehead. He's 104, she announced, taking the tympanic reading. We need to get this down. Hand me that orange bottle with the white cap, sweetie. The boat began moving again, creaking more than before getting a look from their new guest. It's okay, said the colonel. She, the boat, I mean, has just got to get her sea legs every time we pull off dock, I guess. She'll be humming along in no time. Where's that drone, EXO, anyway? I thought it was supposed to stay with us. Sirs, said the captain maybe 30 minutes later. We're moving slowly to allow our other boats time to fuel and catch up. Plus, there's something following our fleet. We think it's the Chinese. A ship? Asked the colonel. How do you know whose it is? It's flying, sir, like some kind of big drone a couple of hundred feet up, and I can see through the binoculars that it says, Made in China, on the bottom. It's a joke. The machine? No, the sticker. It is a drone called EXO. It belongs to us, and the Made in China sticker is a joke. Oh, I see, he replied, embarrassed. I get it, because everything is made there, right? The colonel replied. More than I like. More than I like, Captain. We need to do something about that, Mr. President. I agree, the president replied, adding. They used to ship all their goods here. Now they want their people to come over and set up shop. That's not happening, sir. That I can promise, said the colonel, stone-faced. I'm not saying they won't try, but it will not take place. The mission will not succeed, not on my watch. I would argue, sir, that it's my watch, said the president. It is your right, but it's people like me and Mike over there that keep you in charge, especially now when every rogue country wants a piece of you and Joe. It would be horrific if they ever got their hands on either of you. You remember Gaddafi? It, of course, but that was his own people that did him in. Yes, sir, you're right. Gentlemen, you can stop the pissing match, and remember we have children present, or did you forget that? The colonel's girlfriend added. Sorry. Yeah, me too, they both admitted. It's just cabin fever, I guess, said the colonel. Well, I have a man here. I'm trying to save his life, and I bet he saved both of yours getting here. Now hush. Both men quieted, maybe for the first time ever, conceding to her truth. No one spoke for the next hour, outside her instructions to Cindy. Can I sit with you and ask you a question, Ollie asked the colonel. Sure, anything. Okay, I've been thinking about what I want to be when I get big. Should I be a colonel or a prethysent? Hmm, I'm not sure, he replied, looking to the man on his right. They are similar and different. It's hard to say. Eh. He got a look from his girlfriend, looking back over her shoulder. How about a medic? You get to help people like Mike over there and really make a difference one person at a time, the colonel commented. Maybe I will, Ollie said, or a truck driver. I'm not sure yet, but both sound fun. You have a lifetime to decide, said the president. Whatever you choose, 
Make sure you really want it. The ups and downs can test anyone, but conviction is the key. The truth is, I just want to help my sister. She takes care of me, and nobody else cares if we live or die. I'm sorry to hear that, son, replied the colonel. It never was supposed to be that way. We didn't want any of this to happen, I can assure you. Chapter 28 At Sea He's coming around, the colonel's girlfriend said. Mike is slowly but surely coming back to us. You guys did a crap poor job on his wounds and the bandages were elementary at best. He's better now and at least has a fighting chance. This is the point where the doctors or more likely the nurses would whisper in his ear, fight, fight for your freedom, recovery, or whatever else they can think of at the time. But where he's been and given everything I know of to combat this, it's up to us to make sure he pulls through. That means round the clock monitoring and regular bandage changes, regardless of whatever else is going on around here. He is fighting like always, and it's up to us, all of us, to do the same. We're ready to do whatever it takes to save him. Right, Mr. President? Of course, that's right. He covered me and took a bullet meant for me. He's the kind of man we need in this next world where we make a slow but steady comeback as the superpower, a title we held for more than 200 years. His face is on the FEMA magazine. That has to be worth something. Let's make him the face of freedom. Tough and hard fought, but also fiercely protective of those preyed upon by others looking for an easy mark. The chaos outside heated up with shots fired from every direction, some at or from helicopters, fighter jets, and ships. Chug, chug, chug. The fishing boat slowly zigzagged, unnoticed in the chaos. A day turned to a few, and for those under deck, the entire trip was becoming a blur. We are close to our destination. A few hours more, said the captain, poking his head down early one morning. We weren't accounting for the extra mouths, so we will need a restock on food and water for our trip back. Sure, of course, the colonel stated. Cindy and Ollie grew on the colonel's girlfriend, and, if he was honest, a little on him. He promised them a spot in the FEMA camp and vowed to find someone to watch over them. Mike was on the mend and getting stronger every day. Besides his wounds, she felt he would recover with few, if any, issues. They arrived at Guantanamo Bay late in the afternoon, welcomed by government officials and their families that made it safely across. The mood was somber, and there were no cheers to be heard. A warship, they soon learned, carrying the number three spot, the Speaker of the House, along with nearly one-third of both the Senate and House members, sank two days ago more than 30 miles offshore, following a fierce battle with two Chinese destroyers. This is why we had to travel as we did, the colonel whispered to the president. Hey, buddy, said Mike to Sergio, seeing him for the first time since abruptly leaving the FEMA camp. You got shot again, said Sergio as a statement. Only twice, replied Mike, still void of his strength, trying to use the crutches they fit him with upon arrival. These crutches are not bad if you have a bum leg, but it's not easy with one bad leg and a shoulder. Yeah, I bet, Sergio replied. I saw you were swimming back at the start. I got wet too. Did you realize we were in the same fishing boat fleet the whole time, just two boats between us? I'm guessing your guy made it, asked Mike. Yeah, he's over there. We didn't have near the excitement you must have. Are you still looking for a fight? No, replied Mike. Just a few days off and I'll be good. Okay, guys, said the colonel. You're now inside one of the most fortified locations in the world, next to maybe NORAD and arguably a couple of others. We will be here for a day, maybe two, then back to the camp for a debriefing and next steps. There's a radio announcement from the president in one hour on the main deck. You two should be there. An hour later, to the minute, they were awaiting the announcement with hundreds of others in the main room. My fellow Americans, he stated, this is your president. This is both a solemn day and a victory, for we have lost some friends and colleagues recently. They will be missed and remembered for their sacrifice. It sounds watered down, Mike whispered to Sergio. It is, Sergio whispered back. We can't have our enemies knowing a third of our government is at the bottom of the ocean. Myself and your vice president are safe and monitoring the situation at hand in an undisclosed command post. Solana and the rest of the nearly 2,800 camp members, as they were called, listened intently to the radio program. She was hoping to hear any news about Mike. Amanda found her in the back of the room, sitting in a chair, holding her knees. The confident woman Mike had met only a week ago was silent withdrawn, and teary-eyed. 
Amanda's hand on her shoulder gave her a start, jumping out of the chair. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Is he alive? Asked Solana before Amanda could finish the sentence. Yes, they both are. He was wounded, but they say he will recover almost like new. Let's listen. I think the president may mention them in his speech. Joe and I owe a special thank you to a few brave men and women who helped us get here safely. They were all instrumental in risking their very lives to do so. However, there is one man in particular I would like to thank personally. Mike, would you please make your way up to the podium? That's you, bro, said Sergio. Do I have to? Asked Mike, never wanting to be the star of anything, especially something this big. Yeah, it's pretty much expected. Now go, said Sergio. Mike made his way to the podium, refusing any help. This man goes by the name of Mike, said the president. You're a brave soldier. I have thousands under my command who could have and would have done what you did, but you did it. You saved my life and gave us a chance to start anew. For that, you will have my respect always. Thank you, sir, replied Mike with a microphone shoved into his face by a woman he recognized. A newscaster, he thought, maybe. He froze for a few seconds, not sure what to say. Uh, well, uh, I didn't vote for you, sir. Even had the other sticker on my truck, but over the past week, he almost said, getting a no head shake from the colonel. What I mean is, in the short time I've known you, you've earned my respect. That means something. Can I say one more thing, he asked? Sure, replied the president. When this started, I made my way from Texas to the Colorado mountains with a group of people who became my friends. One of the main guys planning the trip, named Lance, used to have everyone chant families first. Families first. I always thought it kind of ridiculous, really. But now I'm not sure. What I mean is now I get it. He was right. It's families first or die trying, he concluded. You're famous, said Joy, nudging me as we all listened to the broadcast. I'm just glad he didn't stop after the word ridiculous, I replied, kissing her on the forehead. Thank you, Mike. It is families first and country second. Of course, God is above us all, I mumbled. I've got something for you, Mike, said the colonel, as they flew back to the camp two days later. A reward of sorts. What's that? A fresh start and something I need your help with. It will be a trek, but worth it, I think you will find. Hours later, after several fuel stops, they touched down on a dusty road with nothing but desert in the distance. Where are we? asked Mike. New Mexico? Close. Arizona. The Hopi Reservation. Solana, said Mike as he walked into a trailer towards the front of the property. What are you? Wait. This is your home, right? Where you grew up? Yes, that's right. My brothers are here and I have a surprise for you. Daddy, he heard, turning around to see Javi as he jumped up into his arms. The pain came right after, but he didn't mind. Hi, buddy. How are you? Great, Daddy. I missed you. I missed you, too. I need to borrow him for a minute, said the colonel, directing Mike to a back room. I need something from you, said the colonel. Sure, replied Mike, still trying to figure out what was going on. This reservation and others like it have been targeted over the past number of months. Several women and children have gone missing, and we're pretty sure it's not accidental. I've met with the elders, by radio, of course, and they have asked you to stay a while and fix the problem. Samuel told me that Javi misses you and wants to be with you. Did something happen at the ranch? asked Mike. No, he just wants to be with you. That's it. Vlad is on board and thinks it's best as well. He and Anna are expecting, so it's okay. I think you and Solana can figure out the next steps, and when I need you for help with something, I'll know where to find you. So, I get to have a family and bust some heads? Asked Mike. Exactly, but this is not an order. It's a request. You will have to work with the elders, but your hands will not be tied from what they tell me. These good people are tired of being preyed on and looking to fight back. They are still hunters here, but the army supplements them well. You will have everything you need in terms of firepower, and men who will fight alongside you. Yes, yes, I'll do it, said Mike, and thank you, sir, for the opportunity. I have to go, but I'll send Sergio by in a month or so to check on you all. Where will he end up? With us. He will team up with Amanda to create a team of Exos and free up Rana for other things. And the ships? asked Mike. We had a hell of a battle offshore at several of our ports. We took some damage, but nothing compared to the Chinese. The boats behind their destroyers, the ones with the farmers, turned and ran, tails between their legs, 
with Russia and Iran not far behind. In another month, we should have our supply channels open with our allies, and we'll get to work on restoring the power. It's official before I forget to put this on, and everyone around here respects it, said the colonel. U.S. Marshal, said Mike, turning it over in his hands. And these, added the colonel, handing him more with the word deputy in front of the official title. Here are six to start, and I'll have Sergio bring more if you need them. What about Cindy and Ollie? asked Mike. Well, my girlfriend, fiancé, but don't tell anybody. She wants to raise them, so we'll give it a try and see how it goes. Congratulations, sir. Can you wait a few minutes? asked Mike. Sure. Just a few, though. I'm on a tight schedule today, he replied. Okay, be right back. Mike met Solana and Javi in the next room. Is this what you want? he asked her, and she smiled. Michael, this is what I've always wanted, to be home and starting a family. It just took a long time for you to come along. Will you do that with me? Yes, I will surely try. Great. Everyone here can't wait to meet you, she added, taking his hand in Javi's as they walked back outside to bid the colonel farewell. We hope you have enjoyed this story. If you have, please share this audiobook with a friend. Your friend will appreciate it, and the Gigabizzle Buppenheimers of the algorithm will like it too.